Alright, one more thing here. Like that, and then like that. There we go. Boom. <clears throat> How are we doing, guys? Yeah, I don't do the starting soon screen anymore. We just get started instantly. We just go. What's up, guys? Today is going to be a good day. We're going to do a podcast. Me, Woody, DM, and subtract him. <clears throat> Do I have any prophecies going here? All right, let's see here. <clears throat> Pretty much we just need more unique dagger prophecies. Diamond matron. Where is diamond matron? You had a pretty bad day today, burned down. Uh, LP0 red ring, that won't work because it needs to have my T7 minus cost on it. Thoughts on Swarm Blade? I like it a lot. I like the Swarm Blade a lot. It reminds me of Scyther. <clears throat> My guides help you get through a lot of the games. Hell yeah, man. Yeah, we had a massive thunderstorm last night and wouldn't you know it right after it rains i can actually breathe again so praise jeebus for that Or can you farm the best T7 rings? Uh, shit, we talked about this yesterday. What's the timeline? You want main way is with prophecies, and then the timeline. Anybody remember what timeline drops the rings? Why can't I ever remember this? You just found four LP gel cores. What corruption are you playing on? Age of Winter, thank you. What corruption were you playing on? Corruption 800, yeah, that's pretty high. You start, just started Last Epoch, you really like it? Hell yeah. It's a good game, man. Games are looking looking up. PoE is looking better. Diablo 4 is looking better. Last Epoch launched and was very strong.
So it looks like we're going to be going to Age of Winter, getting it to 160 and killing that guy. Okay, beautiful. I don't know what the Chamber of Vessels is. Oh, this is the final boss. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Okay, we're going to live in the Age of Winter. We're going to try to get more Fizz Res today. Am I running different lenses now? I'm running the lenses that cost a million dollars. I'll make a video on it tomorrow, La Capelli. I just use the two lenses that make it cost way more for way higher rewards. Okay, let's, let's just fight the Shade of Oreos. Imagine playing a bugged build. You mean this one? I mean, McFluffin posted a video yesterday saying that he thinks the build is bugged, but I've been playing this for multiple weeks, so. Is that what you're talking about? Hi, Vince. How are you? I'm new to the game. I'm trying to get corruption. Do I want to fill the bar? Yeah, if you want to build corruption, you go away from the center and then fight the Shade of Oribus, which I call the Shade of Oreos. You want, you want Oreos. Thanks, Vince. You have a great day as well. Later, we'll do a little podcast. Should be fun. Hog is here. What's up, Hog? If I ever play RuneScape, I haven't. I haven't played Rune... The two games that people can't ever believe that I've never played. I've never played RuneScape, and I've never played Diablo 1. <laughs> Wait. You, <laughs> you turned that into an... You turn that into an hour and 15 minute reaction video? Did you see that the um the original poster of the thread posted on my video and he said that he essentially said the thread did turned into what he was not really going for. I've never played Diablo 1. Yeah, I need to play Diablo 1 at least once. What in the f fuck was that? I can't even look at my items. Stand still for one millisecond and almost die. That's happened a lot, actually, over the years. Someone will make a statement like, Every, like, everyone hates ice cream. And then 
all the people who love ice cream will say, excuse me, there's nowhere, there's no way that's true at all. And here's why. Then they'll say, oh, I didn't mean it like that. It's like, uh, um, well, I mean, we can see the words. You said everybody hates ice cream, so... Yeah, the thing about it is, it didn't didn't make me upset. I don't get. It's very, very, very rare that someone can say something that actually makes me upset. Just don't care. Just don't care. But Okay. Watch the whole thing. I haven't seen Crips video, guys, because I never watch, I usually never watch other people's builds. I don't, I usually don't ever do that for any game. The only game I do that for is in Path of Exile, because I have no idea what I'm doing. Path of Exile, I watch people's builds all the time. All the other games? No. But I did hear people say that they like that build a lot. What am I league starting with? I don't know, man. I'm I'm leaning only toward three things really. I'm either gonna go bone zone or righteous fire or detonate dead. I think it's one of those three. Detonate dead is certainly the best build of the three. Do the br anything in brackets. If you're over 60% on endurance and it's in brackets, it means that you're over capped because you can only get 60% endurance. gonna go start Zion yeah wasn't detonate dead always the best it was always the best build for like 10 seasons in a row and out of all the builds that didn't get nerfed detonate dead didn't get nerfed like how did that how did that happen because softcore people don't play detonate dead because tornado shot exists is that the logic
Do you guys think Bone Zone with the nerfs can still kill the Uber bosses? Bone Zone is gutted. Well, I know it lost its war cry, but what else did it lose other than its war cry? That's such a goal to set for my first experience. Yeah. Karamon, do you realize? I don't even know what the bosses do. Like, I know uh, here, I can give you all of my all of my knowledge about the bosses. Like. Uh, one of them does fireballs. One of them does a Simon says that's Maven Sirius. I don't think I know what Sirius does. Uh, there's another one that does like a Kamehameha way, but I don't know how or when or anything. So not only I'm going to have to, not only going to have to kill them, I'm going to have to one shot them. Two hundred people in total ever have killed every Uber in hardcore SSF. God, this is sounding more exciting by the moment. Is it really that hard? Who knows? Maybe I can't kill any of them. You beat Maven the other day. So I think I've I've beat Maven before the regular one. That's the Simon says one, right? I beat her. But I think my build was just so powerful I just I just shit on her effortlessly. It wasn't much of a fight at all. Sir Linko, how you doing, buddy? Bossing on Bone Zone is bad. What about Righteous Fire? Detonate dead chain reaction is my best thing by far. Should I just go detonate dead? Should I just do that? Should I just go with the best build and try it? Everyone will play detonating dead. Yeah, but everybody else playing detonating dead is going to know what they're doing. I'm going to have no clue. No, no one's going to take me seriously unless I can start to kill some of the hard bosses on my hardcore SSF character. So I need a character that's strong against the bosses.
If I want to have the OP shit, you got to trade. I've seen I've seen Belton's videos. I get his messages all the time on YouTube about not his messages, but his uh, like community posts. I made this jewel this f jewel with uh with there were 30 mirrors. I see that all the time. I played, but I tr played trade last time, Hog. The thing is, is I'm trying, my number one goal is to become a better player. I want to get better at the game. And I think the way that I get better the fastest is when no one can help me. I'm already the I'm already a goat. I don't feel that way, Hog. A lot of it a lot of it is in a lot of it is an internal thing. I uh when we were young kids, when we would go to like Halo tournaments or I would go to like Street Fighter tournaments or whatever. A lot of times on the on the ride home, like a lot of times I would win these tournaments and on the ride home, you know, riding with my mom or dad, I would actually be very upset because in the tournament that I played in, if I thought that I could play better, I don't care if I won. I've always been like, my parents didn't tell me to be like that. I was just always like that. If I didn't like, crush them into another dimension. I never uh, felt good about it. And another thing is now I'm an old piece of shit. I'm definitely a much worse gamer now than I was in my early 20s. And I'm on a constant like self-pursuit to prove to myself that I'm not garbage anymore. Everybody is like that. Everybody is like that. I don't know hardly anybody like that. All of my teammates my whole life were just happy if we won the tournament. I don't know anybody like that. Is there a lot you can do, though, to manipulate the results of a fishing tournament? Like, obviously, a lot of my my grandpa, my uncles, I've gone fishing as well. There's certainly a lot of skill to it about, you know, knowing where to fish, your equipment, the way that you reel in the fish, the bait you use, etc. There's a lot to it, but at the end of the day, doesn't a lot of it just come down to are the fish biting today or not? Oh, you find the fish before the tourney. Oh, okay.
You wanna know what's funny is I need 11 corruption and this gives me 10. Thanks God. Ghost runner get, oh God, oh God. I missed so many subs. I forgot about subs, my bad guys. Mr. Mr. Ice Cream. Thank you for the sub. Querfro, haven't been here in a while. Started last epoch last week. Having an amazing time. Thank you, my dude. Osilis. Gazoinkspo. Did I say that right? Memes. Cold Lenny. Mediocre. Bradical. 39. Resub, man. Thank you, my dude. Lockapelli. Thanks for the sub, man. Cute Dog is here. Oh, my God. Cute Dog is here. Cute Dog. How you doing, buddy? God, if there's somebody I like, it's cute, dog. Ghost Runner gifted five. This guy, man. Oh, cute dog's not here anymore. Oh, all right. Well, cute dog. If you see cute dog, will you let him know that he's awesome? Cute dog, what are you league starting on uh, PoE, man? You refunded last epoch? Really? Why did you why didn't you like it? Quacky. Hoping to God the D4 PTR sounds or plays as good as it sounds. We'll see, man. At least, at least this is a PTR. At least it's not the launch. At least we maybe we get some changes if it's not good, right? I have no idea. I have no idea either. I guess I'm guessing that I'm guessing that um, Grinding Gear Games is gonna nerf de detonating dead, and I'm such a bad player. It's like my only chance to play detonating dead and start to learn it before they take it away. So I guess I might go detonating dead. Detonate dead. Uh, SRS Guardian is gone. Podcast in two hours. We should have a leaderboard there. The booty, you're right. I can play minions, but I don't like minions. I mean, yeah, the minion build that I played, SRS Guardian was godly for leveling up, but then in the in the end game, it was complete garbage. Since I posted that guide a few hours ago, all the things in the Merchant Guild went from 200k to 300 million. Jesus, man. People keep telling me those things happen, but I don't, I'm not narcissistic enough to think I post a video and then all the prizes change because of me. But this is like the third or fourth time people have told me that this has happened. Maybe some people literally on the Merchants Guild are waiting for my videos, and if I recommend any item, they just bank up 50 million gold, buy them all, and put them up for triple the price or something. <laughs> I guess that wouldn't, that actually wouldn't be that bad of a strategy. You can't buy and resell them. Hmm. 
Well, then how, how are they price fixing it then? Just people buy out all the cheap ones and then people realize that if they have any of those, they can put them up for way, way more money or something. Damn it. All right. This guy, in theory, should drop me a lot of daggers as long as we don't die. Yep, that's a lot of daggers. Endurance threshold, nah. We just want we just want uh, what we currently have. The podcast is in an hour forty five, guys. Hour forty five. Two LP. But I need three LP or better. I have three LPs equipped, but they're the worst rolls ever. There are three dead stats out of six rolls on my two daggers. It's dog shit. Do I have any builds for Warlocks? Uh, I've been copying Lizard's build from Max Roll. I have that build. He's almost 100. Yeah, my Bleed Warlock is super strong. I'm going to go look at the daggers after I kill everything. Do I have a poison build for Acolyte? I do not. A poison build. I don't think so. How am I getting all these dagger drops? Prophecies. I bought every prophecy for unique daggers. That's why they're raining from the sky. Dryad, thank you so much for the sub. Endotoxin gifted a sub to Barricade. Gave him a one-year sub? Did you just gift Barricade a one-year sub? Barricade sent me a very nice message the other day. What a guy. I think he saw my video on people talking shit about content creators and he essentially said get them racks and I'm like all right I'll get them barricade is here gifted a sub to en endotoxin barricade what's up man damn everybody's here hogs here barricades here cute dog is here all the content creators are here woody dm and subtractum are coming later for a podcast Chat about stuff.
Barricade, how we doing, buddy? No idea. <laughs> Got kicked in the nuts for one year. The internet is not a real place. I mean, you got a point. Can I get any, damn. What's the best monolith to farm for detonating arrow? Probably the most important thing that you need is double T7 on your rings. Game sound for YouTube, please, yes. Thank you. Am I going to show Diablo 4 ray tracing? It's a good idea. R remind me, I'll forget, but let's run let's run 3 vaults or something and let's run our vault without ray tracing and our vault with ray tracing. Let's look at the difference. Not a bad idea. Minus five on both rings is not worth. Well, if you don't have minus five on both, it's... Yeah, I, I run out of mana. So I guess play whatever way you want to play. But if you don't have minus five on both, it's going to be pretty rough, man. Twitch, Mitch, Lost Coast, Austberken, Brandon, Love from Omaha. Hell yeah, another Nebraskan. The minus five on rings isn't minus five. The minus five applies before all of your mana cost reduction multipliers or whatever. So when you put on minus five, it's not going to lower the number by five. You might put on a minus five and it lowers it by two. Did you know, Hog, you might, I'm guessing that you knew this from your comment. Did you know Nebraska is one of the Native American terms for flatland? That's what Nebraska means. It means flatland. Why should I be playing Last Epoch? Probably the number one reason is they give out cookies every Thursday. And boy, do I love cookies. <laughs> you 
You drove a semi. You saw the whole state. Yeah, like, like you enter Nebraska from Iowa and you're looking forward and a thousand miles in the distance you can see the Rockies in Colorado. Are they gluten-free? Of course not. Jesus Christ. PHG is not a bunch of devil worshippers. We need the sticky glue substance in our cookies to rip apart our, our digestive systems. There's no way they would take that out. What does legendary potential mean? That means you can slam and exalt the affixes into that unique and the number corresponding with it is how many of the affixes from that item it will absorb. Do we win? Wah. Imagine going from Paramore to Dr. Dre in the same playlist. Gazzy is doing a hot tub stream? Holy. Yo, dude. Is he preparing to become a titty streamer? His revenue is going to skyrocket. That's what we're all aspiring to do. Something skyrocketed when I turned into his stream and it wasn't his revenue. Picking up what you're putting down, man. Would have happened to me too. When's the podcast? An hour 30. I'm 
Gazzy was in a metal band when he was younger and he was the growler. Is that like an official position in a metal band? You got the lead singer, you got the drummer, you got the bassist, and then you've got the growler. I didn't realize that was an official position. Have a good one, Odin. You have bad mana issues even though you have double mana reduction rings. You have T7 on both of them. You have T5 on both. That's exactly your problem. Need double T7. Double T7 and you'll be fine. <laughs> I'm convinced EHG coded the game so my specific LP rolls are the worst possible. <laughs> uh. <laughs> They're what is Rocksteady. How long have I known DM for? About a year. Aaron told me to give you this. Aaron? Aaron? Oh, 
Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not going to watch it now because if I ever watch YouTube videos on my live stream, it instantly demonetizes my YouTube live stream. So I like, I can't watch YouTube videos on my live stream anymore. It just demonetizes it instantly every time. And then YouTube gets mad at me. YouTube, YouTube demonetizes me for watching their own platform. It's his band. Oh, cool. How does Asmongold get away from it? I don't think Asmongold streams on YouTube, does he? Let's discuss this fish short I saw of you the other day. I would love to discuss it. What do you have to say, Hawk? I've had this discussion many times. I'm a grandmaster at this topic. For context, for anybody who didn't watch it, I made a short that said fish is dog shit to eat. Tastes like shit. If it ever said blub blub ever in its life, I don't want to eat it. That's the context. Massive L take. Guys, everyone is entitled to their own wrong opinion. If you hate fish, that's fine. Or if you love fish, that's fine. Everyone is entitled to their own wrong opinion. I fucking hate sushi. I hate crab legs. It all tastes the same, man. It all tastes like that salty ocean water. I don't know why anybody likes the taste of it. It's like shit, all of it. It's just more fish for you guys, yeah. That's not fish, but then we go to real fish. Salmon, halibut, uh, lobster, bisque, all of it is fucking terrible. Oysters, terrible. Scallops, terrible. Oh, God. Shrimp is literally like the bugs of, of the ocean. How anybody puts one of those in their mouth is inconceivable. Trout, cod, bass, catfish, dog shit. It's all dog shit, man. 100% agree. It's just the way that it is, man. Yeah, but everybody is entitled to their own wrong opinion. It's fine. Do I like... Do I like fish sticks? Ah, yes, the fake imitation pieces of shit that are frozen that you heat up. Ah, yeah, that, that solves everything. No, I fucking hate fish sticks. Eat ass, not bass. I mean, they taste the same. I don't know how, how anybody could tell the difference. Sixty two instead of sixty one. Big upgrade. I would rather put Bigfoot's dick in my mouth than any fish. It just tastes like shit, man. It just tastes like shit. It's, it's Nebraska. It's all we got around here. Yeah, we had got plenty of Bigfoot dick around here, but no fish.
Caden, Walpurgis, NT, Nuclear, Sleeks. Thank you so much for the subs, guys. Incoming Reddit post about me wanting Bigfoot's dick. This is not. This is not new news, guys. This has been. This has been known for years. This is a known thing. Not a secret. Rax wants all Bigfoots to fail. You have a falconer, it's full bis. Hell yeah, man. Yeah, that dip better not be crab dip. What if the Bigfoot dick had crab on it? That would invalidate it. Bigfoot sleeping on the couch. Yeah, I've been farming hate views on my fish short. Not done. <laughs> Anonymous, thanks for gifting a sub to Bigfoot's dick. Lee, thanks for the gifted sub to Bigfoot. Now he knows how much of a fan I am of him. There's like an invisible wall here or something. I can't walk past those plants? Wah. <laughs> I hope no small children tuned into my stream today. They're going to be scarred for life. Heuristic, 8-bit villain, resubbing only because... <laughs> Better not say that. 
Thanks to the Prime, man. Heuristic. Thanks for the T1. <laughs> Guys, the Diablo 3... Diablo 3 is going to have another uh, update probably before the D4 season. Is anybody go back? going to go back and play it for two or three days? Okay, looks like about half of, half of the people. Oh my god, look how many Jim Tomes are over here. God, this is some high quality gameplay I'm treating you guys to. God, you guys are blessed. Look at this gameplay. Starts in an hour 15. We got Pumbaa dead right in front of us. We don't have the D4 patch notes yet. God, I hope they do something for Firewall Sorcerer. Man, I'm good at this game. Look at me go. <sighs> Diablo has had its time to shine. It needs to step down and let the other ARPGs step in. Hmm. Well, I just want good games, man. I do have a soft spot for Diablo because I grew up as a kid playing the Diablo games, but at this stage in my life, it's pretty much just whoever makes the best game, may whoever makes the best game win. Rax, why do I not read YouTube comments? Well, first of all, Jamie, I read a shitload of YouTube comments. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, do you want to fly to Nebraska? You can sit down in this chair. Do you know how many YouTube comments I get every day? You know, I have 1,400 different videos on my YouTube. And there's a good portion of them that get comments every single day. I'll give you a big cup of coffee. We can give you like a whole bottle of Adderall. And you can try listening to them. You mean on YouTube? You mean, do you mean, why don't I listen to YouTube people that are talking? 
I listen to YouTube people that are talking. Ka just said, why are you always sick? Am I, am I sick? Like, under the weather or? Feeling pretty fine today. I, I read the YouTube comments on stream. It's kind of the same issue. Do you see how many people are talking? It's hard to see them all, man. I'm also playing hardcore. One death and this character's gone. Yeah, sick gameplay. If there were six godly ARPGs, would I rotate or would I pick three? Hmm. There's definitely an inflection point where there's too many ARPGs. Um, I don't know if I could be a master of six games simultaneously. Maybe. Six sounds like a lot, though. Might have to cut one or two of them. I don't need... I don't need any practice in Diablo 4. I have that game pretty much figured out. It's not a super complicated game. I feel like I know quite a bit about Last Epoch now. I didn't when I first when the game launched, but now I know quite a bit about this game, so I feel pretty confident here. PoE, I have a lot to learn, man, a lot. Sean just gifted 10 memberships on YouTube. This guy is a god. Sean, thank you for that, my friend. No Rest for the Wicked is like a Souls ARPG. I'll play that. The game is very difficult. Which game is very difficult? No rest for the wicked. If you do not enjoy difficult games and getting your ass beat by bosses over and over and over, no rest for the wicked is not the correct ARPG for you. Let me put it to you this way. They gave me a demo of the game. And, you know, you only got to play like the first hour of the game and I died 10 times. It's pretty hard, man. Once I started to figure it out, I, I believe it or not, actually, when I got to the act boss, I actually one shot him without dying, but you have to be very, very tactical in how you play. You have to play very, very precisely all the time. Like if you fight one singular trash mob, it's like a it's like a fight.
I will play PoE. Yeah, we're actually going to go to PoE probably on Wednesday. I need to start warming up for PoE because I suck at that game. I need to practice. Am I excited for Necropolis? I am. I'm getting actually a bunch of whispers telling me that really my only option is detonate dead. They're saying going anything else in hardcore SSF is going to be an, an uber troll. Well, I wanted to play Bone Zone. I would have a thousand percent done that, but then they nerfed it, so... Uh. That was close. Might have to drop something. Don't play SSF, you can learn more in Trade League. Well, I played Trade League last time. I can learn more about PoE playing Trade League? How how do you figure that? Feels like I can learn three times as much when you play solo. You get access to more gear, right, but right, doesn't that make it just doesn't that just make the game easier? And therefore you learn less. I'll make you guys a deal. When we go over, we can do a poll when we switch over to the PoE category. And if you guys really don't, sounds like some of you really don't want me to play hardcore SSF. And if the poll says that you don't want me to play it, then I won't play it. But I'm definitely inclined to play that. If I go, if I go softcore, I can just go lightning arrow. And I actually know that build. And then I can farm everything way quicker than I farmed it last time. Not because the drops are going to object or are going to be a lot less than last time. I understand that. But my knowledge of the game is way higher than last time when I knew nothing. Is that it? People just don't want to watch Detonate Dead?
uh, he, let's just see, let's just see for fun here. Let me create a poll. And see, oops, let me create a poll and see what people would vote for. Just for fun. What should I play in PoE? Hardcore or softcore? I thought everyone would vote hardcore. Let's see. Okay, here's the poll, guys. What should I play in PoE? Vote if you care. Vote if you care. Let's see what people say. Sean, thanks for the sub, man. thinking about trying this video wondering if they're going to be nerfing it or anything i don't think they're going to nerf it mid-season but it might it might get some corrections next league i would be very surprised if they nerfed it uh i would be very surprised if they nerfed it um mid-season Okay, so more people want me to play hardcore than softcore. It's kind of what I, I expected it to be more lopsided than that, but. Did I see your previous message? I mean, probably, probably not, man. There's a mil there's guys, there's thousands of people talking. Can I watch the first few minutes of Zizrin's new video? They'll be in trade, so perhaps I could be fun. Maybe I could go hardcore trade. I, I'm open to anything. I don't care. I don't care um, which one we do. Be right back one second.
podcast in 55 minutes, boys. Let's get it. What's my favorite build so far? Probably this one. The, um, this marksman build. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I'm trying to hit a hundred here. Wait, what? Wait. Right. <clears throat> you were, uh, you were having trouble on your rune master switch to paladin and then you beat everybody except lagan yeah lagan is tough isn't he i look good today oh thank you i did something new with my hair i was hoping someone would notice thank you <laughs> am i gonna draw on the podcast probably not but you never know Max, if you see this, I know this question is open-ended and dependent on a million variables. If you had to choose a number to shoot for, what would you think a 65 decently built paladin spin to win should do for damage as a low average? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to answer that. Uh, um... <laughs> um like I have no idea. I I don't I guess maybe a way I could answer this that would make any kind of sense is when you're doing the beginning monoliths, when you're spinning around, I would expect like the white trash mobs to die pretty much instantly in one or two hits. And elites shouldn't take more than like I don't know five seconds of spinning around on them if you're if you're if the trash is dying instantly and the elites die in less than five seconds i'd say you've got good damage and if you don't i'd say something is wrong that's the best possible answer i could give to that question <clears throat> I'm going to do a podcast with the POE cringe lord. Who who is the cringe lord? All three of them really like POE. Who's the cringe lord? Subtract him DM or Woody? The cringe lord. It's Subtractum. What makes Subtractum the cringe lord? You guys don't like Subtractum? <laughs> Darth is the cringe lord. Okay, so so far zero votes for Woody. What's wrong with Subtractum? Jeff, thanks for the super chat. When, when's the new season? It's on Friday. It's on Friday. What's better, COF or Merchant Guild? I like COF better. Learn more about the game playing solo. You would pay to see me 
You would pay to see me make a spin to win Paladin? I mean, 20 bucks is 20 bucks, man. No, I'm just kidding. I don't think I have time. Actually, I do have a Paladin that's right at that level. He's like 65. I could just respec him. I mean, I have an Apathy's Maw. I could just slam the Apathy's Maw and respec. Rot Horse. TC Jelly Sun. Thanks to the subs, guys. No Sorcerer. I made a Sorcerer yesterday, and the Sorcerer died with everything that I did that wasn't Glacier. So I got mad. In conclusion, Sorcerer must go Glacier, and everything else sucks. Who wins a debate on any topic? Me or DM? I don't think that's for me to decide. That would be for you guys to decide. DM wins because he has nicer hair. Fair point. But I do have a question, though. How do you know he has nicer hair than me? Sayonara, buddy. 71? Mmm, God, I love 71. Back in we go. Yeah, I started with Diablo 2. I started with Diablo 2. Why am I farming Age of Winter, Lucy? Because this is the, um, this is where all of my prophecies are. They're in this timeline. Diablo 2 is goaded. I am still of the opinion that Diablo 2 is the best ARPG ever made. Yes, present day PoE versus old school Diablo 2. PoE now is the better game, but for the impact that it had on gaming and how godly it was at the time, Diablo 2 was god tier. I don't think I don't know if any ARPG will ever beat Diablo 2. I don't know. I'm not like super closed minded about it. If someone were to make such a game that was better, I would consider it, but it's going to be tough. You got the flame scepter and then you see the video and it says use the flame scepter. God, love it when that happens. But here's the real question though. How OP is that flame scepter early game?
I oh wait, can I throw it in the middle and it jumps over the walls? Oh my god, yes. Yo, dude. When is the podcast? 45 minutes. You're gonna be sad when we all go back to PoE, but you get it. I'll be back to last epoch. Don't worry. I'll be back. I'm looking forward to the pinnacle boss system. <laughs> Starforge posted their penis rocket in Gazzy's hot tub stream. God, that's the most appropriate time for that logo ever. LP slab. Hey, that's in my twink setup. <laughs> Any PoE League Start beginner suggestions? If you're playing softcore, I think by far, the best option for you is Lightning Arrow. You will be squishy like always, but your output in mapping to build currency will be better than anything in the game. They nerfed Tornado Shot, so you don't, so you're not gonna like evolve into Tornado Shot later, but. So I think your best option is Lightning Arrow. Rufio Snatch. It's the same one as in the guide. It's the Mountain Armor. I'm using the same one as in the guide. Big McLarge Huge is here. That's my favorite Twitch name. Big McLarge Huge. Here he is, guys. What's up, dude? Rufio, thanks for the sub, man. <clears throat> Big, make a large, huge. What a genius. You got timed out for saying the word twink? Twink? What? Twink is a bad word or what? Easy. 
<clears throat> Playing detonating arrow, having a blast. Hell yeah, man. This build rules. <clears throat> I'm almost 100 if I can avoid dying. Looking good. Thank you, Dom. Appreciate it. I've, uh... I've been paying a lot of attention to what I've been eating and drinking lately. I've been eating a lot healthier. It's uh, definitely paying off. It's not even a, it's not even like a diet thing. It's not even for like losing weight. It's just, I think I've finally reached the age in my life where I can't get away with just eating dog shit all the time because it actually just makes me not feel well. When you're a young kid, you can eat, you can order like a large stuffed crust pepperoni pizza and wash it down with five Red Bulls and you, you know you're putting garbage into your body, but your body just doesn't care. It's fine. Like, it goes fine, but... At a certain age, you just can't get away with that anymore. You want to know what's a good thing about me? It says I got older. I really like... I actually really like a lot of healthy things for you. One of my one of my absolute favorite foods would be to take some fresh romaine lettuce and spinach, chop it up, mix it with like sliced bell peppers, broccoli, grilled chicken, put some fat-free dressing on it. I like olives, can throw the olives in there, can throw onions and chopped up onions in there, anything. And just have a giant romaine and spinach salad with a bunch of veggies and fiber. Carrots, I like carrots. Just throw it all in there. That to me is like an S tier meal. I just love it. I could eat that every single day. So I just need to keep making grilled chicken salads and chopped bell peppers and all that stuff and then I'm gonna feel like a million dollars yeah well the only difficult thing about it is really the chicken which is very easy to solve you can be literally the laziest piece of crap and make very very nice like shredded chicken for your salad in two seconds throw all the chicken breasts in a giant boiling pot and just i don't think it's possible to over spice the pot you can you can literally throw handfuls of 10 different spices in there for flavor let the chicken boil and you can be the laziest piece of shit ever the second the chicken's done boiling you can throw it in like a ninja blender and the blender will just shred it up for you chop the lettuce while it's boiling Chop the veggies, throw it in a giant bowl. Give it a good old-fashioned toss. Done. No fish, no. Can you overboil the chicken? Hmm. I don't know. Probably. I think you can overcook anything. Now you can you can boil it easily, or you can cook it in a crock pot. Pretty simple. Get a giant pot, fill it with water, throw in an obscene amount of spices in it, throw four giant chicken breasts in there, let it boil. It will cook it pretty much perfectly. Shred it up, boom, throw it in the salad. You can over blend it. Oh. 
Yeah, I mean... Most blenders have, like, a chop setting where it just chops it. Chop, 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 chop. I mean, you can actually just wait for it to cool off and just shred it yourself, but that's that's a shitload of work, though. Chef here, boil your chicken as long as you like. There you go. The chef says he can't overboil it. Guys, when I say put it in a blender, I don't mean I don't mean literally blend it. I don't mean liquefy the chicken. Just give it a little chop. Just give it a little Austin Powers judo chop. That's it. If you have like a really powerful blender, like a ninja blender, it'll shred right through the chicken easily. But you agree on healthy stuff, but pizza tastes so good. But there's pretty easy ways to get away with eating pizza, though. Really, you really only have to do a single thing. All you have to do is order thin crust. Most of the dog shit in pizza is the carbs from the bread. That's like the worst part for you. If you just order thin crust and don't like load it with 30 stacks of pepperoni and grease, you'd be fine. Riley, thank you so much for the sub, my friend. Have I tried the $2 Asmongold steak? I haven't, but I watched the video. That steak looks pretty good, man. I, I would eat that. I would eat that 100%. Do I see YouTube chat? Yes, sir. Keep in mind, though, there there are actually are a good amount of people in YouTube right now. There's, like, I don't really know how this is happening, but my YouTube stream seems to be growing, which I'm very thankful for. Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for all the likes and the subs. But it's still going to be quite a while before the YouTube numbers are anywhere near the Twitch numbers because I've been streaming on Twitch for years. Right now there's almost four time there's almost four Twitch viewers for every one YouTube viewer right now on the live stream. So there's a huge difference there. So it seems like I'm just ignoring YouTube chat, but no, I'm not. It's all mixed together. I don't discriminate. Had to come from YouTube to Twitch to listen to the chef talk. <laughs> Guys, you, you want a simple homework assignment? Anybody can do this. It's the easiest shit ever. Try this. See if you've got a big pot in your kitchen. Big old pot, right? Okay. Go to the store. Buy chicken breasts. Okay. Pot. Fill it with water. Not doesn't have to be all the way, just enough to submerge the chicken. Okay, turn the burner up to pretty much max. Put it, put the pot on there. In the pot, throw an obscene amount of spices in there. I'm not kidding. Like you got the two spice shakers. Just go with those two. Get the next two. Get the next two. Whatever, garlic, oregano, whatever, anything, chili powder, whatever you like. Just just load it up. Let it boil for whatever 10 minutes take the chicken out shred it with two forks or throw it in a blender give it a little chop try it 
going to be great. A, a, literally zero effort. No effort whatsoever. Yeah, like a chicken bouillon, uh, like chicken stock or a bouillon cube, anything like that. Salt, pepper, anything. Just load it up. You can't possibly, you can't possibly over season it. There's it just, it's impossible. You can throw entire cloves of garlic in there as it's boiling. Holy shit. Crit multi with fire pen. God damn it, man. Crit multi. Mm, God, I love these daggers. You can put soy sauce in there. You can put vinegar. Yep. Feel free to get jiggy with it. To boil a chicken? I mean, I'm not throwing an entire chicken in the pot. I'm throwing a couple of sliced chicken breasts. If you throw an entire chicken in the pot, it'll probably take a lot longer. It, it doesn't take long. If the water is boiling, it doesn't take that long. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification, Rax. I almost made my first mistake. Yeah, don't put it in with the feathers and the beak, guys. The podcast is in 27 minutes. Yo, I put these in the wrong damn thing. Wah. Okay, I want that Jim Tomei up there. Ah. 
the whole chicken is cheaper and then if you know how to cut it up um then you get more chicken too right but then that requires us to do stuff and know stuff right You finally did it, and you made your Twitch. I don't get it, Nikki. I've seen you on Twitch for a long time. What do you mean, made, made your Twitch? Or were you on YouTube, are you saying? There's another Nikki boy. Wait. Oh, you finally started streaming? Nice, dude. What games are you going to be streaming? When's the podcast? 23 minutes at the top of the hour. Which Olsen twin is my favorite? Uh, Ashley. Mary Kate. I can't, I can't handle two, two first names. What's the podcast about? We're going to talk about everything about ARPGs. PoE, Last Epoch, Diablo 4. Any topics that we can think of about them. Okay. Here comes a big boss fight, guys. Me versus the unicorn deer man. Whatever he is. Good fight, buddy. 56? Hell no. luck guys no luck yeah I'm trying to get three LP daggers as well but they are eluding me <laughs> uh, Fabro totem fury sorrow F thank you so much for the primes guys 
The bow was 4 LP. No, it was 1 LP, and I already have a 1 LP Reign of Winter. That was 10 minutes ago, ha ha ha. That's because I check the notifications about once every 10 minutes. If I look at them every single minute, then... Well, I guess that is an option, but then... I think it would actually take away a little bit from the stream because I'd just be like this all the time. Can I enable the FPS counter? What is it like Alt Z or something? Alt R or something? Dude, in this, this is a bad example because in this, look at how much, look at how laggy this one is. Jesus, F11. F11, or as I like to call it, Flevin. Yeah. See the FPS in the top there? Your favorite number is 116. That's definitely a good one. What wizard build do I suggest to play? That's a great question because a lot of them are powerful, but a lot of them require a ton of gear to even get going. I guess the best recommendation is one of the frost claw builds, but Rune Master for me always feels very rough until you actually get all of your gear. I think for most casual players, Rune Master is a bad choice. You pretty much are forced to play Glacier until you get a ton of gear. How does one become a mathematician? Well, I don't even know what the definition of a mathematician is. By my definition of a mathematician, I am not a mathematician. It would be someone who solves complex mathematical problems for their profession. I don't solve complex mathematical problems for my profession, so I'm not a mathematician.
Okay, let's take everybody out here. Do you think the Wraith Lord build is viable without the experimental affix to move big boy? I don't have that experimental affix. You can just use Skelly Mage instead, and I'm level 100. So yeah, you definitely don't need it. It's just a nice quality of life. Have I tried this build on controller? I haven't. Your girlfriend is addicted to PoE. Are you guys going to stream the league start together? Did I just AFK the beacon? Uh, yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, stand in the middle, kill it all. Oh, she gives you a lot of shit for playing it all the time. <laughs> She's just doing her job. I guess we'll go that, go that way. <laughs> she loves math. Well, then P show her path of building. When's the podcast? 11 minutes. In fact, might be switching over here in a second. Goblin bot. Thank you so much for the sub, my friend. Do chicks dig mathematicians? I would say girls actually do really like intelligence. The good news is, is most males out there are actually just dumb as shit. So if you speak to females and you're just smarter than the average dumbass, which is not hard to do. That's definitely a quality that they will like about you. The average male is... The, the bar is set pretty low, man. The bar is pretty low. Hikaru went full get Giga Chat in the bullet brawl. First of all, what was the bullet brawl and what happened? Okay. 
save was very secure. Am, am I godly? I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means. I'm sure no matter what it means, the answer is no. Rax is a god. He is our god. Um, if by god you mean simple Nebraska boy that likes tacos, then yes. God of the Flatlands. <laughs> God of the Flatlands. <sighs> okay. I'm going to switch over to the podcast. It starts in seven minutes. I'll see you guys over there. I won't see any subs or anything like that while I'm on there. So, Smoke Father, thanks for the prime. Thanks for all the subs and the follows, guys. I'm going to actually pay attention to what they're saying. So, what I'm going to do here, I think, is I'm going to... I think the person that's going to have the best layout is probably Woody, because he actually has an overlay. So, let's open his stream like this. Okay, he hasn't brought it up yet <laughs> so let's see <sighs> when he when Woody's gonna fire this up no 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 you can stay here you can stay here. You don't have to go anywhere. I'm just going to pull up Woody's overlay when he turns it on because he has the pretty overlay that I don't have. Do you need to go to Twitch for the pot? Everybody can stay exactly where you are. Don't have to go anywhere. You don't need to go anywhere. I will set it up all right here. It'll be good. Woody's mic sucks. That is something that I cannot fix for him, my friend. What's wrong with Woody's mic, though? What kind of mic does he have? The podcast is for talking about ARPGs. Um... I can tell you the rough topics that he wanted to cover. The Path of Exile, Necropolis League, and our plans. What we thought of the PoE2 gameplay and the delay. Talk about Diablo 4's history and what the Season 4 updates look like. Our last Epoch experiences and what we think the future of the game holds. What the coexistence of Diablo 2, Diablo 4, PoE 2, and Last Epoch is like. What other games are we looking forward to? And what, if anything, could developers learn from each other? That's a high-level idea of what we might uh, be talking about there. Are we going to be talking about me? Yes. And we've also allocated at least an hour minimum to talk about Rocksteady from Twitch. That's going to be a big topic that everyone's going to want to hear about. So. Um, yeah, half of it will be about Rocksteady. I'm not I'm not going to bring that. I have no plans to bring that up unless it gets brought up somehow. I don't know. I don't know if any of them watched it or whatever.
I have a taco bet to close. Okay, let me do that. is ready he's setting up the overlay all right first thing i'm going to tell him put me in the put me in the bottom left instead of subtract him because i'm looking this way naturally see if we can do that here all right so i think this is how i'm going to do it let's make this full screen like this and then what I'm going to do on my end is I'm going to hide this and this. Okay, and I think I think that should be good. Let's see. Hey, Woody. Hello. Is it Yo, this isn't a big deal, but if you're setting it up now, can you put me in the bottom left since I'm looking to the right? People cry every uh, time I'm on the right side. I guess DM is also uh, looking to the right, so it doesn't matter anymore. I can change. What? I'll probably my camera's this way. So, I'll be looking like this. Boom. Okay, um I mean, I have my own like, you know, like setup basically that I made with the names and stuff. Okay. Edit it real quick, but nah, nah. Uh, that's way too much effort. Nah, forget about it. Just if it took okay. two seconds. <laughs> okay, so I guess. Um, okay, are you guys all streaming as well? Yes, sir. So we need the virtual camera on OBS, right? Yes. Yep. Okay, I started it, and then is that all you need? I started it, or? Uh, well, you also have to turn on the video in. Discord. Yes, sir. Okay. Turn on the video in Discord. Okay. Did that do a thing? I see <clears> a <throat> Rax. Yes. I am here. Me. Let me angle this down, maybe. Okay. I need a second now to set up the things. Okay. I also need to I'll start my own my cam. Okay. Virtual camera. Let me angle this Hello? down down a bit. Maybe. Maybe like that. Oh. Okay, something like that. There we go. We're all kind of facing opposite directions, but it works. <laughs> Actually, I think Discord... Oh, no, yeah, see? Now I'm looking off into the side, ignoring everybody. It's going to be beautiful, though. Get wrecked, everybody. It's actually pretty comfortable. I'm going to put my feet up on my Starforge PC, by the way. And oh, my. I have the chat on the other monitor. <laughs> I can just... Let me ah, just open up nice. a G Fuel and open the oh, find my Teespring T-shirt. <laughs> there you go. I got this G Fuel with Code Darth. <laughs> Dude, I haven't I haven't been plugging it like that. I never told anybody that the PC could also be a footrest. <laughs> Great sales pitch. Uh, that's a good one. All right. Anyway, how are you guys doing? I'm good, man. Big chilling. Doing good. Very busy. Busy times now. Yeah, I mean, with the leaks not coming, I guess you're like 24-7 like in POB and stuff and making guides, I imagine. Yeah. Dude, Subtractum, someone asked me earlier, is Subtractum a, a one-game Andy? And I'm like, 
I don't actually know. I assume you play a lot of stuff, but do you play anything other than PoE? Uh, IRL, I play a lot of games. Um, yeah, <laughs> in real life as opposed to on the internet. Um, right. But yeah, for content, I'm currently yeah just PoE. Uh, you know, I, I'll do other ARPGs as well. So, you know, I've, I've played the other ones, but yeah, PoE is my main focus. So no meeting in person, by the way, subtracting. Yeah, man, it was. We got to shake hands. We did just a we few days thing. ago. It was great. We were adults. Oh, you met at the LA event. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Is that a Gibson West Paul behind you? Yes, sir. Dude, would he put me in the subtractum thing? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, I wasn't looking at the name actually. Okay, it's uh, okay. One more, and then we are uh, set up. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I should find a red shirt so we have the red side versus the blue side. Yep. Oh, perfect. That would be good. Actually, I am wearing a red. Never mind. I am wearing a red shirt. All right. <laughs> ah, here we go. Yeah. <clears throat> perfect. Okay, and subtracting goes here yeah, to the bottom left. Okay, so yeah. people say that the volume needs to go up, and they said that there's a delay. You can't hear them. Um, oh. Uh, how am I going to fix that? Let me think about this for a second. Okay, so can we do a quick sound check? Oh, my, this, wait, my Discord is like flickering really weirdly. Wait, my, so, my cam is really, still flickering check. on the stream as well. Oh, I see like some flickering. Is like flickering, but it seems really fine weirdly. for me on OBS. Just, yeah, I'm watching your stream. It looks great to me. Okay, well. now because it was just on my screen when I look to the other side, it looks a bit weird, but okay, it all, seems all fine. I'll pull it up stream is fine. Okay, let's do a quick sound check. So, my voice versus Rex. Rex, can you say something? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Okay, so let me know if Rex's uh, sound is fine and subtract him. Hello, hello. Okay, and DM. One, two, one, two. Let me think about this, guys, because right. I want to present. So let me know if you have to adjust something, guys. Otherwise, I want to present I Woody's screen. I guess I could just All present good, my said. screen. Everything's looking like, good on my end. Like this. I'll just do this. All right. In that case, let's start. Is this so, good? Welcome to the podcast, everyone. So this is something that we kind of set up. I'll just go like this. But um, yeah, we thought it was a good time to like have another podcast. And today we have some really big names here. So we have Adolf, Margaret Transaction, Rex Senderex, and Subtractum, all really big ARPG content creators. And I want to just thank everyone for being here, first of all. And I would like to have like maybe a short one minute intro from everyone just, you know, to, uh, you know, show yourself to the audience that uh, on all the streams. So let's start with DM and then Rex and Subtractum. Sure. Uh, I'm DM. I am somewhat of a variety arpg andy i bounce between them as i suppose we all do uh poe is probably my home game at this point and uh that's about it try that fun i'm rex i wear a blue hoodie i play arpgs that's it <laughs> uh yeah i'm subtractum i primarily do poe stuff but i have played all the other arpgs and i do play them once in a while and yeah i'm, I'm the old guy in the chat i guess so i have a little bit different perspective than the young guys sometimes. <laughs> what was your first ARPG that you've played ever? Subtract uh, I mean, did I play anything before Diablo 1? I don't know. But I mean, I played Diablo 1 when I was in high school. So uh, if you want to frame a reference there. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. thought you were like 28 or something. When I met you in person, uh, I thought you were young. <laughs> I will be 42 this year. Yeah. No shot. Dude, yeah. you're looking good for. 40. Looking good for 42, man. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Did you stay in the basement? No sun? Heck yeah. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't beat Al Kaiser, I guess, but uh, <laughs> isn't that like this meme where Al Kaiser is like 52 or something? Like, where's that coming from, actually? <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, anyway, so thanks for the intro, guys. And myself, I'm Woody. Um, I mostly blast a lot of Diablo, especially D3, D4. I've done like at least content creation wise, but personally, I've also been enjoying a lot of Path of Exile and at least in the last epoch. So I'm very much looking forward to Path of Exile 2. And I figured it was a good time to host the podcast to talk about all of these games together, basically. 
here with some of the bigger content creators. So I have a list of topics here. We want to go through um, PoE, Necropolis League, and our plans, and so on. Then we want to talk about PoE2, and uh, also what we think about the delay, the beta, and you know whatever else. Then I want to talk a bit about D4 and also the Season 4 updates. Then about Last Epoch. So I guess everyone here has played that, right? And then we're going to talk about kind of like the, the combined topic of all of these games together, like, you know, also what is on the horizon and basic open end discussion after that. So that's kind of the, the timeline that we have here for the next two hours or so. So, yeah, starting with PoE. So I guess it's like the big topic right now. Everyone is kind of getting ready, I guess, with uh, the PoE League. Personally, I've also been doing a bit of uh, like these start practice now and stuff, kind of getting back into the game after <laughs> barely playing it really lately. So um, yeah, what do you guys think about the announcements? Maybe let's start with that. Which announcement you want to start with? Yeah, the, the Necropolis. There's a lot of them. Yeah, the Necropolis League, basically. So that's what I want to start with, first of all. This is like the most immediate topic, I guess. It struck me as a large amount of content for one league expansion. I was surprised by how many both quality of life changes we got, how cool the mechanics seemed. Um, I haven't been around for too many leagues, so maybe this is like par for the course for them. But as it like my second league launch I've been part of, it's it's way larger than I was expecting for a league. I, I, I maybe subtract them. You're probably the OG here. What did you think about the league launch? Yeah, um, I, I love that you said that. Uh, that's why... Yeah, I mean, PoE, to me, like, they spoil us. Um, in terms of the content, like, I would say, yeah, the quality of life stuff is a little out of normal for them, <laughs> if we're going to be perfectly honest, uh, dumping all that on us. But in terms of the size of the league, this is probably about average, maybe a little bit above average. Previously, actually, they used to, once a year, do an entire endgame rework. You can look up previous atlases. Like, currently, we have the Atlas Passive Tree. Back in the day, they used to be very very different where it's like okay you got shaper versus elder and you're like manipulating them around or you had to connect collect like 32 different stones and summon all these different bosses that then would summon cirrus um they used to do that like once a year once every year and a half and yeah this is just kind of par for the course where they spoil us with a very large mechanic rework that gives you something to really bite into for a few months so yeah um i'm pretty excited for it it's cool that they're doing another crafting league those are always kind of uh they don't they haven't done very many harvest was the original one and it's always potentially contentious with the complexity there and what it actually does particularly versus affliction league last uh last league the current one where it was a big uh like a big currency <laughs> big currency dump um <laughs> versus now engaging in, in crafting and all that but i i really appreciate the contrast yeah one of the yeah. things Oh, go ahead, Woody. Now, I was just going to say, like, it kind of like struck me just now that uh, I guess both DM and Rex have not really played that much PoE before, like, you know, like the most recent leagues. And, like, you know, what Subjection just tell, told us with, like, you know, the expansions of the Atlas and the new end games and stuff like that hasn't really happened in a while, right? And I guess might not even happen again. I'm not sure if they ever said anything about more of that coming in the future now that PoE 2 is coming. Do we actually know anything about it, Subtractum? Or anyone else in chat? Is there like anything they hinted at that something is coming again? But... About big endgame rework? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just talking with my chat yesterday. And we we're like, we're on, <laughs> we're like, when is 4.0 coming out? We're on 3.24 now, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's, it's uh, very interesting that they've kind of been going down this path and just kind of iterating. And the uh, like that to me, the Atlas passive tree has been like the beta, the biggest blessing and the biggest curse because it's such a dynamic, great system that they're encouraged more to always stick with it and improve on it, which is like it's a good thing. It's great. It's a great system. But I kind of miss the old. All right, we're going to throw everything away and do something crazy and, you know, a whole new game. Um, and I, I feel my instinct is that because of PoE2, they've been kind of stretched a little bit due to that. They're. Um, you know, they're kind of split resources and they're just kind of like more iteration on what they have right now yeah. instead of like big, big reworks. Yeah, Chad Language. is saying that apparently they are, develop they are developing PoE 2 first and then they're going to devote more resources to PoE 1. So maybe you're going to see like, you know, a 4.0 at some point, I guess, maybe next year or something. Rex wanted to say something. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. 
Yeah, Rex was going to talk for a while already. Sorry. <laughs> Let's okay. go, Rex. Well, I mean, it's okay. But the thing that I want to add here that I, I love about grinding gear games that, and everything that they do, they seem to do this very consistently. It's like, imagine if you were working at grinding your games and on the whiteboard they had an idea all right we're going to do a necropolis league it's like okay there might be some dead guys there might be some bear the guys that we bury but they they go seem to go all in with the idea every single time like all right you're going to kill them and then we're going to cart them away to the morgue and you're going to see all their bodies there then you're going to bury them and then you're going to dig them back up and craft with it it's like the, the level of the level of detail and ingenuity and just the creativity that they have is insane and it's consistently insane and you know even if the league doesn't go perfectly, like some people are upset that it sounded like in their discussion that they're going to like force the league mechanic on you and all the zones. It's like, ooh, I don't really know if I want that for the campaign, but I can forgive those things when I see the amount of effort that they put into making it great. That's something that I always respect out of these guys. 100%. I, I always like to say I'd rather them risk having a bad league by just going all out and being creative versus doing something safe and and kind of boring just kind of mid so yeah I, like lake of calandra most people hated it but lake of calandra gave us sentinel league right like <laughs> we had arguably one of the worst leagues and then arguably one of the best leagues and i'd rather have the highest highs and you know not that low lows it was still playable versus just everything mid mm -hmm. yeah like it reminds me of as like this like parody video from like many years ago where they, where they, like someone is like impersonating the devs and he's like dude like do you guys know that like where, where they like you know take like he's like imitating taking drugs and then like you know the creativity <laughs> part that rex was alluding to like you know, like you know like he's smoking and like dude yeah what if we do this and like skill trees have been skill trees you know like, <laughs> there's a video like that it's glorious so some people might know that but yeah, it's kind of like the, the creativity part that uh, Rax is alluding to. And uh, I really like that about PoE as well. Like they do crazy stuff and I see it again with Necropolis. And I'm really excited for the crafting myself. I think DM wanted to say something earlier. What was that? I was just going to go back because we were talking about PoE 2 and about in-game add additions to PoE 1. And I was going to say my understanding of that is the gentleman, I believe Mark Roberts, who made the PoE 1 in-game bosses, like the Uber Pinnacles, et cetera, is the one who is creating the PoE 2 bosses. And so his focus is there. And I was just going to add on to the pile and say, yeah, so I'm sure that more in-game would probably come in PoE 1 once the gentleman who's making the in-game for PoE 1 is done working on PoE 2. It kind of makes sense. Yeah, but I guess on the other hand, we you know have like you know like a small team, I guess, of people that actually like you know mostly flesh out the end game currently in PoE two. But then they also want to keep building on PoE two, I guess, right? And probably pretty rapidly. So, so will that really work out that way without really recruiting more people and you know like then also like onboarding them like you know long enough so that they actually get into the groove of making new stuff for the existing game? I think mean, that might be a bit too optimistic, maybe. You know, I don't even, I'm not really, so I'm I'm very, very new to PoE, so this might be like a brand new Andy take on this, but I don't even think it's working out badly for grinding gear games, because instead of getting these like, uh, again, these additional massive end game revamps, that is not where PoE is lacking, in my opinion, and it looks like they've been able to go back to some of their systems and improve a lot of the quality of life for the masses that people have been begging for for a very long time. So to me, it's it's almost kind of a win-win. They can allocate resources to PoE too because their end game is already so in depth, and we're getting the quality of life stuff that a lot of people are asking for. I'm not even mad about this situation at all, but maybe it's just because I'm very new to the whole thing. Oh yeah, no. Like uh, in terms of me being like, disappointed, they haven't done an end game rework. It's I'm at like a nine out of ten instead of ten out of ten. It's like <laughs> it's still like yeah. all right, yeah, everything looks awesome. I'm I'm not mad. Yeah, yeah I, I don't I, think it's really like that. The current end game is bad or anything like that. It's just more like you're kind of excited for like something new at some point, right? I guess it's mostly what it is. Like okay, like, we had Maven forever. We had you know the Elvish bosses forever, and you know. Like, what is like kind of the next big guy, you know, the next big boss, or maybe like some new type of item or whatever, right? That is kind of like what such an endgame revamp would entail. And yeah, I guess, you know, the game is over in a good state, but something fresh would be nice. But I guess that fresh thing will just be PoE 2 then, whenever it comes. I did, so 
I feel like we potentially did get some freshness to the in-game in POE 1, right? Didn't they actually add a couple new Uber bosses? Yeah, the uh, T-17 stuff league. looks cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we got literally a new tier map, and then we got a rework in the way that the Uber bosses work with fragments, etc., which I thought was a great change for the economy. Again, I'm new, so I'm figuring this stuff out, but it seemed like it was a problem at least I ran into. It's like, why would I run normal variants off of Uber-based pricing if I'm playing trade, for instance? So I liked, I kind of liked those reworks. I thought they were pretty fundamentally good changes, at least from what I could tell. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that. I'm actually very happy to see like that. It's like this, you know, um, like switch between Uber and normal bosses and also like loot, basically, right? I think that was like a huge mistake, I guess, that they made there. Like, personally, I wasn't really like a big boss farmer, but I was like, you know, I saw it immediately back when they made these Uber bosses and I was like, okay, everyone's going to find the Uber bosses now because it's just better. And this is exactly what turned out. And now they finally fixed that. So I'm glad to see that this was actually changed. Agreed. Yes. But yeah, I, you get, personally, I'm also excited for the T70 maps. It sounds like these maps themselves are already going to be quite a challenge. And then there's also like a boss attached to the to that map, right? It's going to be like some kind of like, I guess not exactly Uber boss, but probably pre pretty tough. So sounds like, you know, it's definitely something exciting to like dive into. Yeah, I agree. I'm looking forward to the challenge, though. I. It, I, it will make it a little bit harder, I feel like, right, to get to Uber bosses on solo cell phone. Now you got to do it through the tier 17s, but I guess that's part of it. It'll be kind of fun to see if it's possible for me, especially my starter got nerfed. I guess Bone Shatter is not exactly in the best in the best state right now. I don't know how overhyped that's going to be, but I heard that that got nerfed a little bit. You guys know your starters? Oh, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> well, what is it? Funny. Um, yeah, I was originally going to do a ball lightning mana stacking and, uh, everyone's like, I was planning that weeks ago and then, uh, the rework to Archmage actually made it potentially a really, really good starter. And because I just have the, the hipster in me, <laughs> it actually made me want to play it less weirdly enough. So I'm actually going back to my Frostblink Ignite build that I'm going to be making a max roll guide for it anyway. And I, I really like to play the same build that I made the max roll guide for, cause I can kind of play along with people that are following it and that's going to be uh that's just a really fun solid build just ignite elementalist as an archetype is really really strong you know the most popular one in like hardcore soul cell found would be detonate dead it's just a very powerful archetype for you know early game league start it's just uh just really really efficient sounds fun yeah i heard about ball lightning and archmage being potentially really strong so that sounds exciting i've never played ball lightning myself but personally i'm actually planning to do dd i've never played it and I want to go hardcore and try to do all the Ubers this time. Uh, I've done them on softcore a bunch of times, but never on hardcore. So I figured this would be like a good league to try it, uh, especially the tier 17 stuff. So I'm going for that. Nice. Yeah. So I'm very, very clueless and I'm getting pulled in every single direction. What, what I really wanted to do, one of the most fun builds that I've ever played in my very limited time is Bone Shattered Jug. That's what I wanted to play. I played it in the gauntlet. I loved it. I wanted to uh, play it a lot more this league. And then I watched Karn's video, and that made me very sad because yeah. Karn made it sound like the world is ending, and Karn's a smart guy. So now I'm crying. And uh, my chat's telling me, Bone Shatter's not even that good for bossing anyway. And then they say the best choice is Detonate Dead, but don't play Detonate Dead because everyone plays Detonate Dead. So <laughs> go play this build. And then a 300 chatter say that build's dog shit. Play this build. And then the other 300 say, no, that one's dog shit. And it's just like, um, I, I'm very confused. I have no idea what to do. I have no idea. What, was the nerf so huge to Bone Shatter? What, what happened exactly? I'm not it's pretty I'm rough. Right. Yeah, it's pretty so, rough. I mean, they. Go on, Rex. I think one of the problems is, is that the war cries used to be, if I'm understanding this correctly, the war cries used to be instant from the passive tree, and now you have to grab it from a gem, and there's also a mana cost reservation. So it's a mana issue, and it's a gem issue, and those are two things that Bone Shatter really has almost no ways to solve. Yeah, you okay, got socket pressure. You just run out of the sockets, really, unfortunately, at the moment. Yeah, the left mouse thing and all that automation stuff is they they said it. They said that uh is it was a miss. There there's solutions to it. It's like yesterday I did a I did a test run um just to act 5 and I I made sure I didn't put my steel skin on left click anymore and I was putting it on W and it was just you could feel it was just a mechanical downgrade 
to uh to playing it's like okay well i can wait until i can get cast one damage taken but normally steel skin you also want to use it to remove bleed and it was just so convenient to have it on left click and like yeah the automation supports there but like like rax was saying like the sack socket pressure mana cost it just it just feels worse it's just overall feeling worse um which yeah. is unfortunate because those those support gems are cool they enable some really cool things like brand recall looks insane uh, there's gonna be some really fun stuff on like uh saboteur with brand recall but yeah it just that was a real weird solution i get what they're trying to do because like w in what game do you just put a main a primary skill on your left click as like a and you know a mechanical workaround but I, I always viewed it as like a quirky thing about path of exile that was like kind of fun and interesting but i guess they didn't like it yeah i mean personally i'm kind of on board with the change but i think what i should have done is like make the gem actually good you know like it seems like it's just a nerf right like you have like the same like i think it even has like reduced cooldown recovery rate or something as well right it's, it's actually just a nerf using a gem compared to before where i didn't need a gem and you had the auto cast and you know if they had made the gem like an actual upgrade i guess it wouldn't be so bad you know if like your your cooldowns were faster instead or maybe some other perk right there could have been some stuff and now it's just kind of like, yeah, like everything just that you start just feels worse now, I guess. So that's kind of the main downside here. I guess it's mostly a tuning issue, if you ask me. I don't really have an issue with with the left click removal as much because I'm newer, so I haven't had leagues of me like getting so used to it that I feel the impact of it being removed. The one that hurts for me is the war cry because like I did bone shatter jug last time. I liked it a lot. It was the farthest I got, so I want to do bone shatter again. It's the instant notable that got removed for the war cry that's the one that like i'm i'm feeling a little bit more mm -hmm. than the than necessarily the left click change yeah the, in, the, the instant instant note is really nice i agree with that so i'm losing that as i said i, yeah. I agree <laughs> so just to kind of like reiterate here like the high level thinking when grinding gear game says hey, we want to remove this mechanic where you left-click and you cast skills because it's not intuitive. A new player would never pick up on this unless they essentially saw someone else doing that. I, I a thousand percent agree with removing these bizarre mechanics that probably shouldn't have never been there in the first place. It was so weird to learn about it when I came into PoE and I force move. And you can't rebind left click. So I'm using X mouse to map my left click to force move my side mouse button and then <laughs> binding the buff on left click in order to even play. You're, you feel like a velociraptor, you know, you're you're playing this, this super weird setup. I don't mind them fixing that. It's just sometimes, you know, if this happens to everybody is sometimes you win and sometimes you miss on the solutions. One thing that this is one of the scenarios where I don't have it in my mind. I think a lot of people think this, that content creators feel like they have all the answers all the time. They don't. And content being a content creator does not mean that you are a developer either. A lot of the content creators, like myself, for example, might be the worst game developers ever. But I have seen multiple times for other games where... A company is trying to fix a problem, like, and it's going to have a big impact to the community, and they'll run it by the content creators. And a lot of them, you know, after seeing this announcement, were instantly able to pick apart why it bricks so many things. So I think one thing that Grinding Gear Games could have done is maybe asked a few more content creators what kind of an impact would this have on all these different builds, and will this be fine to solve? Because it sounds like a lot of them picked up on it right away, me not being one of them, um, that it's going to break a lot of stuff yeah i think in, that's something that in general gg could probably do more of right i'm not sure exactly how how they like beta and alpha testing of leagues works but i know they have like some small testing program that's like secret but i think most of the content creators are not actually part of that right they probably have like some kind of like small player program or something but yeah it seems like sometimes these things kind of like get through the cracks and then it makes it into the game and everyone just hates that change right and <laughs> you could have avoided it i guess so uh, I, yeah. I think that's a good point that Rex is making. It's like, for example, something that um, I guess Blizzard probably does a bit better there, where at least from my personal experience, you know, being like, you know, Diablo, like, you know, having a Diablo They do good in Diablo and, 3, Diablo at least. Diablo and stuff. Yeah, Diablo, Diablo 3, 3 yeah. we always had these, these round tables, and there was like, you know, Rex and me and some other guys uh, chilling with, with the developers very often, and we would, we would talk about stuff. And, you know, very often there would actually be some actually good changes coming out of that to the game. So... Yeah, well, like at very least, it would prevent a catastrophe. <laughs> like, <laughs> that would happen. So, 
yeah, I guess there, there could be like, you know, some bit better like consultancy earlier, maybe with, with like content creators or players, or like, you know, high level players. It doesn't have to be content creators necessarily, right? I'm not sure how GG does that. Yeah, it's like the one counterpoint I would say there is because the Path of Exile game is such a large sandbox, and this is the way they view it, is they will purposely add items that they have no idea if they have any use in the game. And they will just toss them in there, and many times it'll be like three years later, there'll be one patch note, and then some <laughs> someone will remember that like, oh, this item was really bad before, but because of this one patch note, it actually, I can combine these items and get like a 0% cooldown and break the game. And that's like the way that they view the game as well, where it's a sandbox and they are willing to absolutely break things, try to, you know, try not to make things blow up the servers or anything, um, but they're willing to make those kind of changes. So for example, they've made changes in the past where uh, it will, like uh, one of the most common league stars, I mean, the most recent example to me is Impending Doom, uh, where they changed the way that Awakened Spell Cascade works and you can't get the same overlaps that you used to as easily. And it, it literally made it not a viable league starter. And we didn't know it was like one of the most common ones. It was getting hyped up and they just deleted the build from the game effectively. <laughs> and they actually like so many people had league started it that they, everyone cried after, you know, I guess verifiably or uh, justifiably. Everyone cried that league started for the first day. And then they're like, OK, we're going to undo that change for this league. But it's gone next. This build is gone next league. It is gone um, because we don't like the way that this interaction works. And they are willing to just say, hey, this is the direction we want to take the way that these things work. Uh, yeah, you played this one build for a while, but they don't view any build as sacrosanct. It is always like, hey, this was a cool thing. You were able to play it like Cold Dot. Cold Dot is one of the most core builds that has been around forever. It blew my mind that they just said, yeah, Vortex no longer good on left click. Like you can't do it. And that was like one of the core things that made it comfy to play um like they're just willing to make those really big changes like how much yeah. they like triple nerf tornado shot this league that that came out of like tornado shots <laughs> always been that good and that like the fact that they're willing to just nerf it like that and leave detonate dead like what the hell anyway um yeah i think they view the game differently and the the builds differently than other developers that might be like okay well we need a good fire build for the sork the sork needs a good fire build so we're gonna you know this is we have to make sure that every skill is viable ggg is gonna be like yeah no that that skill sucks deal with it like yeah don't use it <laughs> yeah, just, just don't don't try until, to force it. Yeah. Just wait until they delete righteous fire from the game, and then then we'll see what happens. I guess. <laughs> no, I mean that uh, that's what they did last league. That's exactly what they did. Wait, um, isn't that it, wait, really? Is is it not a thing right now? Or what? You know, it's in yeah. the game, but they they drastically reworked it in a way that it is not remotely as comfortable as a league starter. Like, oh, yeah, you look it up. Watch watch like the old videos from last league with Pox and Captain Lance like theory crafting okay, uh, how to still league start it. I like, wasn't actually aware um, of it. Yeah. Okay. And Didn't I mean, they nerf like Butterboy too, like the the Sentinel guy. <laughs> and Radiant, they did. They yeah. nerfed Radiance again, right? Yeah, yeah. SRS. Yeah, I mean, I would. I was the SRS Guardian guy, right? And they, uh, yeah, that that felt really bad. I put so much work into that that um, Max Roll guide, and that's the one we were reviewing it a couple of days ago in the meeting. That's the one build that we're like, everyone's like, this one's fine, this one's fine, this one's fine. We got to SRS, and I'm like, God damn it! All right, yep, archive it. It's uh, it got nerfed. <laughs> um, yeah, not not just the not just the Radiant Sentinel. But SRS is, as well lost 38% damage and like, oof, poison's still fine, but that's not as easy as a league starter. And another thing, again, to I would say to Grinding Gears credit, I have a lot of respect for a company that has a vision and has done enough work with, within their own game to have the confidence to say, this is what we're doing. You know, some of the other titles that, you know, are having different visions all the time those haven't ended up in as good of a spot. And I think Woody mentioned a comment that is also very, very critical. I actually had a conversation with some people from EHG on this recently. If you are going to seek community feedback, it does not need to be a content creator. It doesn't need to be someone who has a Twitch or a YouTube or anything like that. There are a lot of very, very godly theory crafters that might be on the forums or whatever or on the uh, on the discords that you could that might actually be better testers or analyzers of these in-depth patch notes than a lot of the content creators. So I thought that point was extremely important um, to consider everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially like in PoE where you have like, you know, races and 
uh, you know, like you actually have like, you know, these, these letters, like gauntlets, whatever, they can, can literally just like send a message to like the top 10 guys in the race or something and say, hey, you want to test the next patch for us or something? Like, I guess a lot of people would say yes, right? Like, I mean, they could just keep not... Ben on speed dial for GGG. <laughs> they could just call him up and he'll answer all the questions. That's fine. Yeah, I guess even, even Ben probably doesn't know like every single thing about every single thing. I, right? I wouldn't say that. I don't know. <laughs> I talked to him for a few minutes. Uh, he was in the car on the way home to LAX. And dude, the amount I learned just from sitting next to him was like infinitely more than Twitch chat over the last entire league. Oh, just Twitch chat. Wow, get wrecked, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get wrecked. Yeah. Yeah, no, oh, Ben Ben is very special. He's incredibly smart. smart guy. Yeah, I always love listening to him as well. Like, you know, and also like seeing him in the gondola races when he starts explaining some stuff here and there. It's, it's very, very amazing. I'm also a big fan of Ben, to be honest. <laughs> okay, do you have anything else you want to discuss about PoE 1 right now and the upcoming league? So we talked about I, the starters and... The, I, I want, I'm curious about whether or not you guys think, because I saw Ziz say it didn't look like an SSF league. My reaction, I'm sure Ziz knows more than me, but my reaction looking at it was like, oh, this looks like great for SSF. Now I can like try to make, you know, gear with the crafting league. So I wanted to ask you guys, what do you think about this league's crafting mechanics specifically for SSF? Well, I'm actually considering hardcore SSF instead of hardcore trade, but either way, I will craft a lot of my own gear and I think it looks great like you know if this new crafting mechanic actually turns out really effective it sounds really fun like you know you collect your stuff maybe for like you know a day or two or and then you do like you know three four crafts and you have like very high chances of getting something good it sounds fun and um you know much, be much better than like spamming chaos orbs and whatever and or like you know alteration spam and then crafting whatever so that could work out pretty well if if, if you can combine these different effects so I'm excited for it and also with the multiple Atlas skill trees, uh, it's going to be really cool to like, okay, I'm going to farm, you know, a bunch of like Essence and uh, Expedition now, and then I'm going to farm a bunch of like Legions and Breach here. And, you know, they can like swap it around all the time. I'm very excited for that as well. So personally, I'm high total SSF or nearly SSF. I guess my, my take on it is the way that I'm approaching the game being very, very new to PoE is I'm trying to learn as much as I can as fast as I can. I just want to get better at the game. Um, it was a lot of fun running around on my tornado shot guy, it, pentakilling every single map and getting, you know, 60 divine orbs here, two mage bloods over here. But at a certain point, I stopped learning because all I was doing was just repeatedly just deleting these jungle valleys. When the gauntlet came out and I had to actually play SSF and it was it was hardcore and it was under these super difficult parameters, I was actually forced to learn the campaign. I was forced to learn all the boss fights. And the second that I got to maps, I, I needed to figure out a way to get really good gear running low-level maps and doing all the different mechanics that I had previously skipped on my Atlas tree just to even progress. So I feel like going hardcore SSF will teach me more, but then it, every time I say that, my chat just says, no, 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 you can learn actually way more by going trade league, and that still doesn't make any sense to me. So um, I, <laughs> I appreciate the crafting, and I, I'll take all the help I can get, believe me, but I'm thinking go, to go hardcore SSF just because I think it's better to learn the game, question mark? I don't know. Well, you learn different things in, in, in those modes, right? Like in, in softcore, you just have the economy, the dying doesn't matter, you play different builds, you have a very different outlook on the game, I guess, and then have a hardcore where you actually have to learn like the game as in the mechanics, right? You look at the bosses, you look at the moves, you you figure out how to make your gear, like as you said. So it's like it's just a completely different game basically. So this is you know, this is one game and this is the other game, basically. <laughs> so that's my perspective I mean, on it. Yeah, chat, chat saying that you learn more in trade versus SSF is just wrong. <laughs> um, like, SSF absolutely forces you to reach out into different parts of the game, figure out, what, like, hey, how do I, I need a lightning coil. How do I get that? Like, oh, okay, look up. Okay, is this div card? I can farm cemetery. Cool, I can get that div card in cemetery and now I can get my lightning coil. And, like, and then force, like, oh, I need... I need to understand how to get the betrayal unveils and do all that type of stuff. Um, you know, hardcore versus softcore. I think hardcore will force you to learn, you know, defenses, of course, and it'll force you to learn um, patience and reading. <laughs> um, oh, I can't read. Yeah, Never I, mind. Softcore it is. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, but SSF, I think, particularly if you're curious, willing to put the time in, once you have a foundation of the game, I encourage everyone to try SSF, uh, like, occasionally. At the very least, it will always make you a better player. So, yeah, I think that's just a, a bad take on chat. Yeah, the SSF, I feel like, was teaching me a lot very quickly. Like, even things like recipes, like learning how to put physical percentage damage on an item right from the get-go using the vendor. That was something I would have, you know, if I'm trade, like, why would I ever need to know that? You yeah. know, I'm not trying to, like, craft an Uber item and then trade it. So, um, yeah, SSF for sure felt like it was teaching me more very quickly. I had to force myself to interact with mechanics I otherwise don't want to. Because in trade, I would just farm... Whatever makes me the most money, I'll just farm up and buy what I want. But now I'm like, ah, oh, goddamn it, I have to do harvest, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. I guess again, it depends on like, you know, what you're actually trying to get out of the game. Like most people are soft core trade enjoyers, and yeah, like you know, the knowledge that you find that you get in, in hardcore SSF is not a one to one applicable, I guess. So this is probably why chat has these takes, but I can also see that, you know, what's up said. Like you just learn more about the game in general and you, you figure out things and even if they are not really relevant in a trade league you know like you would never go and farm the lightning coil card necessarily or something in a trade league i guess right you just try to get the lightning coil from trade and that's it but it's good to have that knowledge anyway just you know in case and you can get a bit of better reference for like where is everything how do we get everything in case you want to go and farm it yeah i mean you can make the argument as well just to make a an excuse for a softcore trade that you know, interacting with the economy, understanding that type of stuff, that is that is part of the game, right? Like it's <laughs> you can't just say that that's not a skill in the game or anything. There are people that just I sit here and I alteration spam certain things and I make mirrors doing that, and that is a thing that is the game. Um, you know, the kind of the beauty the beauty of ARPGs is that you set your own goals and you can make your own choice in within that. And there are people that arguably win the game by never leave, leaving their hideout, accruing mirrors, and then <laughs> buying alt arts in standard. Like that, that is a way to play the game. Um, so yeah, it's all it's all valid if you're long as long as you're having fun. Yeah, well said, I guess. Okay, I think we can move on to um, the next topic though, unless someone else has any last comments about PoE one and the Necropolis League. So I want to talk about PoE two. And uh, well, we have at least two people here that actually got to play it lately in Los, uh, Los Angeles. Um, I'm not sure if they invited Rex. I guess they also invited you, but I know that he didn't go. And personally, I also didn't go. Uh, it was just like too far for me. And like I, I decided, like you know, 30 hour travel one way is <laughs> it's a bit rough for like chilling with the boys for an afternoon. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna play two months later in the beta anyway. Yeah, uh, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yep, get screwed. Yeah, yeah. Guess what? Eight months from now. You lose, you lose, Woody. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunate. <laughs> but yeah, um, maybe uh, especially the M and subject, we can like maybe talk about about um, your experiences. I also been watching like a lot of your uh, the videos that people put out. I think I watched the M. Uh, I'm not sure if I watched subject, but um, yeah, a bunch of people put out like their their playthroughs and talked about them, and it was really cool to see. But maybe you can give us some more like you know hands on experience that you gathered. Sure. You want to go first, subject, or should I? Ah, right, go ahead. Sure. Uh, so in the beginning, I didn't have, we didn't have a lot of time. So like I was actually in LA less than 24 hours. And the amount of time that we had of actual gameplay was about four and a half hours. And I want to preface like everything I say by the fact that we only were able to get part of the way through act two. I don't know if anyone actually made it to act three. Maybe somebody did, but for me, myself personally made it all the way through act one, part of the way through act two. And uh, because of that, I think our experience is like fairly limited we didn't we still don't really know much about in-game in poe 2 if like really anything at all at this point i don't know if maybe i missed something but i haven't seen the discussion much so most of our experience was only sort of early game um but overall i just to give you a general take on it i thought i was going to like poe 2 but was unsure but after playing it i left me like i'm really going to like this game like it is actually highly enjoyable just from a gameplay perspective i found me enjoying each individual fight more than i enjoy each individual fight in path of exile one for instance and i felt like they kind of focus on different things whereas the combat feels like you intentionally need to be knowing what you're doing in terms of like positioning and fighting like literally every fight to give you an example of this for instance surrounding is like a thing right so you can get surrounded and then die like it's d2 again so i found myself having to like <laughs> focus much more than I ever really had to in, in almost any other ARPG at the moment. So, I mean, my initial impression of it was like, it's hard and I like that, 
And easily the best thing in it is like the boss fights are fantastic. I mean, from the from the beginning, like all of the boss fights are really good, like surprisingly good. So I, I mean, I have nothing but pretty much good things. There's some complaints I have for sure, but mostly I'm gonna have positive things to say as we get into it. Yeah, what what class did you play again? Play warrior. Yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> uh. So I I hundred percent echo basically all of that with the uh unfortunate uh downside is that i played sork and the sork <laughs> is unfortunately it's just very undertuned so like it's a thing that they can fix um i think they will fix it the feel of the skills the look and feel of them is really cool uh like it's very combo and this is just it's so contentious for poe one people um but i, I so the game is very uh intentional like dark souls is a very fair comparison with this game where you actually like walk forward they start an attack you actually back up you can roll you can dodge roll actually through something like you actually like bloodborne skills actually translate where okay i actually want to roll into them under their arm and then hit them from behind and you actually have this real intentional gameplay that's very thoughtful but the uh coming from traditional arpgs like i, I think it's awesome that they're making such a big change but I don't know how that translates into a blasting game at the end. And like, it, can they keep that and keep that soul of that and make it fun for doing hundreds and hundreds of hours with that much intentional gameplay? Like, I I love Souls games and I've beaten most of them multiple times at this point. But I don't want to sit there and grind Dark Souls 1. I'm not Lobos Jr. Like, I'm not going to grind Dark Souls 1 for 12 hours a day every single day. And I think that's... <laughs> that's um. If if they keep that feel all the way into the end game, where because like the 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 actual like white mobs and the trash mobs were an experience, like that was a, a very different experience. Like I, my comparison was Undead Berg in Dark Souls One, where your first experience, you like you walk up the stairs, there's the bridge right there, and you're like, all right, I'm just gonna walk across the bridge, and there's two skeletons to your side that if you don't take them out or you don't know how to dodge roll their arrows that are coming in, you're just done. You're just dead right there. You get stun locked on the bridge. You're like, well, f this game, uninstall them out and but if you you know you stick through it and you push through you figure out how to take on the encounter um you know it's very satisfying and that's such a different mental shift for from how we usually play these arpgs where trash mobs are scary yeah just as dm said like you will get surrounded like i, I had a clip in my playthrough where uh, a couple guys were coming to, from my side i turned backwards i started walking backwards throwing my fireballs and then five werewolves jumped on my back and just instantly killed me and yeah, everything is always scary. At least in Act One, everything is always scary all the time. It's it's a different game. I had a lot of fun with it, but I I uh, they're taking a, you know a risk, and I think it's a cool risk. But they're taking mm -hmm. a risk by diverging so much from the traditional formula. I'd be curious. Yeah. To, sorry, go on, Woody. Oh, uh, I was just going to say like I I've watched like uh, I don't know like ten different content creators now or something like you know with this. Um, playthrough and also like some of the other clips that we had like with like some druid clip and hunter's clips from back then and stuff like that and it definitely looks like this like really slow really tough game that you have experienced in act one seems to like progress very quickly though like we saw this for example like i i watched like kaiser he go he went into act two he got leap slam and then he started leap slamming into packs he was like three times faster than before one shotting packs with leap slam which was my, maybe overtuned or something but like even if he didn't one-shot them, he would stun them and everything was suddenly much safer. And then this whole like, you know, this active like dodging and like, you know, this positional combat definitely kind of takes a step back at that moment, I think, like what Subtraction just explained. And I think it's kind of cool that they're starting with this kind of like, you know, very, very kind of like slow, really tough kind of combat, which, okay, might be too tough with what we saw right now. Uh, you know, I don't want to like, you know, make people quit right away, but you're going to feel the progression much more. There's a lot more room for progression, right? So even if, like, late game, it translates into, like, this blast mode, PoE 1 style, where, like, you know, maybe not blow up entire screens at once, but, you know, like, you're going to one-shot most trash, and you're going to go at a really fast pace, maybe, like, you know, two, three times as fast as at the start. Um, you know, you, you can have a lot of this, like, blast mode, like, gameplay later, and you're going to have like a real nice progression curve, right? Where you actually like, go step by step and, okay, now you unlock, unlock that skill and now you get your free link and now you get your four link. And, you know, like you have to see that most of these playthroughs were actually done on a one link, right? Like imagine you go into PoE 1, you have a one link skill and it's basically ruthless, right? Where you just like whack away at enemies and everything is super dangerous. Yeah. So I think if they don't make it too hard to survive, but, you know, kind of like, you know, have this like uh, intentional combat moves and dodging and you know there's a bit of back and forth and then later on it kind of takes a step back but 
you still do it like sometimes on the boss fights or sometimes then it's a big rare pack but not on every single trash monster i think that would probably feel really good actually because there's going to be like these moments where it's like okay now i have to pay attention but otherwise you're kind of like blasting and if you know if they find like the right frequency of that it's going to feel really cool i think yeah i think yeah there's... i mean was was felt yeah go ahead go ahead go ahead i was just gonna say was was he felt so good like actually feeling like i had direct control over my character and Agreed. like i just wish i had a controller like i actually think on a controller with twin stick feet up on the desk would have just been really really fun to lean back and play like just a normal action feeling game Agreed. i think uh i think there is a little bit of danger here i think this is something that poe2 should be looking at very very carefully especially for like the launch of their game so one of the one of the biggest problems with path of exile which i'm sure grinding gear games would like to solve at least in some form is just to reach a broader audience and you know there's a lot of different reasons why that people quit it's too hard the passive tree is too intimidated the game's too bloated or whatever there's not enough quality of life um i think there is and the devs said this the devs said this in their uh in their talk on the couch when they said that they saw a lot of variance, which is what Subtractum and DM are saying. They're talking about between classes, but they also said between skills. And when I made the last Epoch Beginner's Guide and when I made the Path of Exile Beginner's Guide, the, the way that I opened my Path of Exile Beginner's Guide videos, if it's your first time playing, you absolutely need a guide. If you don't have a guide, you're going to be doomed. Last Epoch, I said, it's not really true. You can pretty much pick any class, any skill, and just go for it, and it will kind of work. I think if a lot of people boot up Path of Exile 2, and it feels like Dark Souls 1, I think that's a huge problem. I'll be honest with you. Me, personally, speaking as Rax, I would love that. I would love it to be extremely difficult. I would like every moment to feel terrifying if I'm playing hardcore SSF and have to really grind my way forward. Um, the, the progression of your character that Woody brought up is extremely important. You need to feel way better about your character after you play through a few acts than you do in the beginning. But I think it's going to be a very, very big problem if people are struggling in Act 1, all of the casuals that are using PoE2 as their way to jump into the franchise. I would be very, very careful about how hard I make the very beginning of the game. Otherwise, I think we're going to run into similar problems that we did for PoE 1. So uh, to address a couple of the points, so one of the things I noticed, and I'm, I'm just going to speak for myself, because like I, I didn't play Sorcerer. I heard that that was a very different experience in Brew, though, to be honest with you. Uh, but as a warrior, one thing I noticed was it wasn't necessarily the DPS was lower in PoE 1 versus PoE 2. It was the animations are slower, but the DPS stayed the same. That's what I know. So like I'm killing mobs pretty much as fast as I feel like in PoE 1. If you make a new character on the beach right now with no twink gear or anything, you just start a new character, it's pretty damn slow. Unless you're really literally running past everything and you're racing, any new player is going to take forever to get even through Act 1. The other thing I noticed was by the time I get into Act 2 in PoE 2, my character was ramping faster than my character would in literally PoE 1. By the time I was in Act 2, I was one-shotting everything. One of the bosses, I literally killed in three hits. Like, I was just, I was going fast. And I didn't have, like, giga gear. I literally didn't have one ring, and I didn't have a belt. All my gear was blue. I had one, like, yellow glove that just had resistances. So I didn't have, like, crazy gear. I think where the issue may potentially arise is if in the late game you want to feel, like, strong, you're going to have the DPS. It's the animation casting time that makes it feel slow. But it feels to me like, okay, it takes me 2.32 seconds to cast Sunder, for instance. So while I'm casting that, the overall time for the DPS, it, I'm doing the same damage. It's like I'm literally one-shotting mobs. It's just that move takes so long to get out. That's the movement and the animations that are slower. So I'm not quite sure if it's like the base damage is higher for everybody. And then we're going to be focusing more on reducing like your casting animations. So that way you can kind of blast through. Or if you're going to have to really focus on like canceling animations, because you could, for instance, rolling slam, I could do a two-hit slam. I'd do one, I'd roll out of the second slam, that way I could continue the move, and it would cancel the slower second part of the animation, I was still one shot in anyway. So I don't know if like movement tech's gonna become a thing, but I definitely noticed that I felt like I was ramping, even by act two I was ramping, and I don't know if it's a warrior thing in particular, but I was like one shotting literally everything with like half of my gear equipped. So I wasn't so, I wasn't as worried about it as I saw the progression happen. 
Sounds like barbarian flashbacks all over again, man. <laughs> From D4. Like, it starts very slow, and then suddenly you have your four weapons, and, you know, kapow, bonk, and uh, that's it. <laughs> the part that yeah, felt I mean, bad in... was... Sorry, go on. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, in PoE, old school PoE 1, we used to have an archetype <laughs> um, that Alkaiser used to play a lot. Uh, but it's just out of the meta for a long time, which was just use a very slow, big two-handed weapon. Like we have this, there, there's a tag on certain uh, attacks that might, people might not know exists and it's called a slam attack. <laughs> they just, people don't really play them anymore. And you would use a really big, slow two-handed weapon. You do your war cry so you could exert that attack and you do one gigantic slam, you know, Sunder or Earthquake or something and just destroy the entire screen, light it on fire, tectonic slam, all that. And it's a really cool archetype. It's just very much out of the meta right now. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they're just really trying to bring that back in PoE 2 as well. Yeah, personally, I'm a big enjoyer of slams, actually. I've played some slam builds in the past as well. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, actually. What I saw from the Warrior, it looks really cool. And I think one thing that we have to keep in mind is also we only saw three classes now in this like latest preview that people got to play. And I mean, there is Duelist mm -hmm. that will have you know the steel skills and whatever melee attacks. And those will be faster than those warrior slams that we saw, right? And similar, we have like, you know, like a ranger that maybe has like, you know, a radar ascendancy that's also going to be melee themed. Or we have shadow that is, wasn't there that would also have like dagger attacks. And I guess you, they, they intentionally made those slams really slow, like DM explained. But later on, you're also going to have extra attack speed to make it feel faster. But you still want to have like a baseline difference in the feel between those different builds and those different skills. And I think this is probably like why it is that the way it is, right? And if they can actually bring back this like super hard hitting, like just kind of slow play style, that, that is an archetype that is really fun. Like for example, this stuff like what is this skill called? Perfect strike, I think. Where like you charge it up and you release it at the at the right time, oh, kind of like that a was snipe so skill. Terrible! I hate that man, move, dude. I was I was looking at that skill and I was like, man, I really want to play this right now. Like this this looks awesome, you know? Like I was like, you know, you charge it up, you release it at the right time. It's like. I don't know. It kind of reminds me, like, there's, like, these old Need for Speed games, right, where you have to, like, um, shift gears in the right moment to get, like, a speed boost or something. It was like, yeah, this is exactly like that, you know? Like, you have to hit the timing. <laughs> and I was so looking forward to that, actually. Yeah, but, Alk uh, was saying that Perfect Strike is, like, a like a frame-perfect one. Like, there's one frame in there that just does, like, a billion damage, so it's quite literally a perfect strike. My biggest problem with the animations aren't so much, like, the damage that I do by the end of it, I'm totally satisfied with. Could one-shot stuff. But the problem is you get interrupted so often. So you're trying to do, like, this literal two-second casting animation. Go make a sandwich while you're waiting on the thing. And then the bugs will walk up and, like, just tap. And it's like, oh, Gotta start over, I guess. And so you're rolling the way they did it. It was the it was the canceling of animations that felt terrible. So maybe you need you actually have to worry about a defensive layer of like stopping stuns or stagger or something in order to deal with that. Yeah, but the incoming stuns definitely seemed like a problem. I think this is something that a lot of people complain about. And even just watching it, it seemed frustrating already. Like personally, I like we had exactly that discussion in Diablo 4 a lot, right? When we went launched, a lot of people were complaining that monsters do so much crowd controls and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, it doesn't really seem that bad, but I guess people don't like getting CC'd, and then they nerfed it, and they nerfed it again, and they nerfed it again, and now we don't have CC's in the game, basically. But uh, in, in PoE 2, when, when I just watched that, I was like, okay, that definitely seems like too much. <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I guess, like especially you haven't played it. Like, I'm not sure how was that for the sword, maybe, to subtract them. Oh, it was god-awful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was. It's funny that you say that. I was actually thinking of Rax's video, uh, like the early Diablo 4 video, like the number one problem in Diablo 4, they need to fix crowd control. And that's actually exactly what I was thinking of when I was playing Sork, because they had to, uh, yeah, every, because I'm a Sork as well, I, I have a little bit lower HP and my, I'm supposed to be staying away at range. But I, I, was, used, I was like, okay, I'm going to use cold skills. I'm going to chill them. I'm going to freeze them. But I had like a literal two second cast time on some of my skills. Like the, one of the combos was throw a frostbolt and then you would cast an ice nova off the frostbolt to try to freeze the enemies. But by the time, like the chill was so ineffectual. By the time the frostbolt was in range to then start my ice nova cast time, there would be 10 bugs in my face. And I'd just be like, <laughs> stun, stun, stun. Uh, and then I just like roll backwards and like, okay, that just gives them an opportunity to get behind me. And now I'm just surrounded. It, uh, yeah, Sork felt really bad. I think. I think they could attune that. I was talking with my friend last night. Like, 
at what value what value does stun particularly in this context really add when you're already taking the damage where like if you're strategically already positioning yourself properly then or, or if you improper improperly your consequence can be taking damage and you, like you'll die because you took that damage but if you just get absolutely crowd controlled and you can't do anything about it besides you shouldn't have even walked on that screen in the first place where you didn't know there were 10 bugs coming in your face then it actually feels less strategic and just like super super punishing so yeah it could be like a cast speed thing could be a damage thing but the stuns in addition to that oh god it was it was rough yeah so the like to add on to that the entire idea of game development right is to create problems for the player to solve and solve them in cool and interesting ways when subtractive is in act one standing a football field away from the monsters and he's playing ice to frost nova them in place and upon doing that combo the result is 10 bugs in his face and then what is the solution you're constantly just constantly backpedaling in order to engage in a fight that's uh probably not what probably not what they're going for so i say all this understanding you know this is a very very early early test this is an alpha test they literally said in the dev like couch interview that there's a lot of things that they want to change they're actually delaying the beta because it's not at a point that they want it there but everything that i'm hearing if i was a member of grinding your games i would find very very concerning literally everything that dm said i would find concerning where okay i'm struggling in act one but in act two i can one shot everything with bad gear and by the way i have this attack where it's like a dual hit but i i roll cancel mid animation because i only need the first part of my hit with bad gear to one shot everything um it and then the infinite stuns and then i have a three second cast to do one thing it's like it's so great that all of you guys love slam builds but i don't think the vast majority of people want to log in on warrior on day one and do a three second cast how many months have we spent in diablo 4 of people saying i'm so sick of doing generator 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 upheaval and i guess in poe2 at least it's killing them but the upheaval brings them to 70 percent and then you go again generator generator gener like the whole i haven't played it i understand it's an alpha they said it's a problem they're going to fix it but the whole user experience that you just described is just nothing but red flags to me that they need to address really funny that you mentioned that because uh, the other issue that, that these are just my two main issues. I want to, I do want to say, I really think there's tons of potential. I think it's going to be a great game. But my other main issue was as Sork, the mana sustain was near zero. <laughs> I basically had to port back every other pack of oh, monsters God. to get my mana back. So you get a default little ding ding attack on your weapon. It's effectively a generator. And actually, some of the boss fights, I only spam that skill because the cast time on my active skills, my ones that cost mana were so high that I would actually just output more DPS using my generator. And yeah, it, it had that feel. I'm just seeing this little, tiny, little purple line at the enemy until it dies. Potions, bro. There's something wrong with the potions. Like for warriors, I was hearing the same thing. You gotta go back and get HP pots. And uh, what was it? Uh, Gazi's sitting the left of me playing sorcerer and he is like moaning every 10 seconds. I gotta go back to town again and get mana pots. And then I'm saying the same thing about HP pots. It's like, Bro, this is terrible. What I'm having to do is run from the little maggots during the worm fight to try to get the portal open so that I can go back to town to get potions instead of just killing the little guys and getting potions off of them. I'm literally kiting till I can get an opening to go back to town to interrupt the boss fight to get the potions to go back. The potions were like not correct. Now, maybe I was doing it wrong. Maybe I had to buy them, but it's like, it seemed like a unanimous feedback I got from everyone. It was like, there's something wrong with the, except rangers, because you could just generate potions, I guess, over time. But sorcerers and warriors were, were not enjoying the potion ability for sure. Yeah, listen, we heard your feedback. We're going to disable town portal in boss fights. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good situation. <laughs> no, but uh, to be real, uh, I, I guess that, that is a huge problem. Either it's like the mana pots or it's the health pots. I guess they can solve that with like maybe a bit more like, you know, tuning on the, the cost of spells, at least for the mana side, and maybe like some more tools to solve mana early on. Maybe they can like put mana region very early in the skill tree or like the passive tree, or there could be like a clarity aura. I'm not sure if that even exists in PoE2 right now. Like, I know there was like heralds, but I guess you get them in Act 2 or something, but I'm not sure about clarity, for example. 
But there are tools like that, at least in PoE one, where maybe you could have a more base region and yeah. yeah, it's just better tuning, I guess. It's mostly a tuning thing, I believe, that uh, they have to get right there. And I guess they're, they're very far away from from getting that right. So. Yeah, I think like we we actually know I did find one. I had a mana flask that had a suffix that generated a flash charge every three seconds or something. Basically, the ranger node, and I think it's just it's just the problem that Rax was saying earlier, where Act One, it just feels like Act One is tuned in such a weird way because everyone that got to Act Two, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to Act Two because there was a bug progressing past the executioner. I had to kill him oh, no. five times. Yeah. yeah, I had to kill him five times. I called over one of the devs, and he was like, yeah, you just got to keep trying. <laughs> um, so I got stuck at the end of Act 1. I didn't get into Act 2. Took me and three times. I had the same bug. You yeah, had three times, yeah. The didn't open, yeah. I ran out of time after five. Uh, it, it, just, it feels like Act 1 is tuned in a way that is... May, maybe that's just their ruthless vision, and they're like, okay, Act 2, welcome to the fun time. And maybe that's just... I don't know if they want to do that. They... I think one of the biggest problems with PoE one right now, just as Rack said, like the the row is in the mud flats. Like I, I think they're just they're laughing themselves to sleep every night. Like haha, look, everyone's getting stunned and die. Like they have an eighty percent death rate in the mud flats <laughs> until you learn to get good. I guess, but Roas, Roas like, are like you, the most deadly creature in Ray class. I guess it's crazy. You watch Tide like Tide Tide Killer. Well, Reese says he's like he'll he's the, the, one of the like top three speedrunners in the world, and he will die to Roas, and he's like, all right, go back to RuneScape. I'm out. Like <laughs> that's crazy. When one of the best people in the entire world dies so sick, and like you know, the brutal world of Ray class is unforgiving. And it's oh, like the thing is, it turns off people so bad. I've had friends that literally uninstall after Brutus. Like they get to Brutus and they're like, "I just that was just not fun." That like, <laughs> it, and you know, you can get good, and maybe that's the experience they want. But I think there's so many people that would love the game if they could just get to the end game and engage with a little bit. I'm actually using Last Epoch right now. I got a few friends that are playing Last Epoch right now, and I'm using that as kind of a, a launching pad to get them into PoE, <laughs> PoE. Like, all right, you like the crafting, you like some complexity, you got loot filters. Well, come on down. We got that times a billion. I like, <laughs> I like the the basic vision from grinding gear games, right? Like Diablo 2, I think a lot of people would consider the Di Diablo 2 the greatest ARPG ever. And one of the one of the reasons why Diablo 2 is so beautiful is it's difficult. It's very, very unforgiving. But the thing is, is it's, it's a fine thing to balance, right? You need to let people at least log into your game and play through, like, I don't know how many acts the campaign is going to be in, in Path of Exile 2. But you got to let them at least get through Act 1 without being met with a tremendous level of difficulty. They've got to be able to engage with some of your boss fights. They've got to be able to not know how to animation cancel, not know to port back to get extra potions in order to at least get rolling in the game. They don't need to make it face roll. There's no way you can lose. But uh, it sounds like currently it's very, very overtuned. And that, to me, it's it's a critical mistake that you can make because like, like Subtractum said, you can lose a lot of people very, very quickly. Like when it's like job interviewers that are reviewing your resume, like a common theory is that they look at it for like five seconds. You got five seconds to get something interesting on the page or they're going to move on. If the people play for 15 minutes and they've died three times and they're out of potions and they're out of mana and they're constantly swarmed and stunned, they can't kill anything. A lot of them will just uninstall the game and you, you never know, that could have been a lifelong player if they could just have gotten far enough to get the snowball rolling to have some fun. On the other hand, they do need to put some difficulty in the game because that's what makes a great ARPG. You gotta, again, developers have to give you problems that and give you interesting, fun ways to solve them. If you just win, they haven't created a problem for you to solve. It, it, it's tough to balance. I don't envy being a developer, but I do think this requires a lot of attention. You only get to you only get one chance to make a first impression. I think it was yep. in the preach interview, or it was in one of the interviews where they were talking about the difficulty of the games, and he asked about his philosophy on that. And what he said is he wants you to die twice to a boss, or and maybe, actually this might have been your interview. But I forget whose it was. It was someone's interview I was watching that said he wants you to die twice to a boss and then on the third time get it. And when it comes to the difficulty of it, 
I felt like the frustrating difficulty was from the normal mobs, but I never mm -hmm. actually felt frustratingly difficult from the bosses. In fact, I felt an achievement after having be the boss, even if I did die multiple times to the boss, because I learned the mechanics of the boss. But when you're getting cheese from the wall, from a guy who's the same color as the wall then falls on top of you in the equivalent of maggot lair, where you're walking in a linear path and you literally can't avoid it, that shit pissed me off. And I didn't feel like it was a skill gap. It's just, okay, fine, you guys cheese me in the same like a Kaizo block Mario level. But the beating the boss for me felt like, okay, it's difficult, but I enjoy a difficulty at the boss portion. So I'm wondering if maybe they tune it a little bit, either give you more potions or make the individual portion of the monsters a little bit more manageable, but the bosses to keep at the difficulty. Because I really thought the bosses felt, I don't know how you feel about the bosses subtracting, but all of the ones I did felt like this is good. Like the, the, the balance of the bosses felt very fair to me. Love the boss. Yeah, I have no notes on the bosses. They are the, the highlight, by far the highlight. And that's actually what has me the most excited about the game is that executioner boss specifically the intro with him just like cutting someone's head off jumping down the sound like swells and you get this big boom when he lands on the ground his gigantic sunder how well telegraphed absolutely everything was and then like i died a couple times on him but then when i got it it was basically a no hit run and i just learned the mechanics it felt so satisfying to kill him a little disappointing on the loot that i got but like really <laughs> really satisfying to like learn that mechanic kill it like i love that and i want like that's perfect but then like the fact that you have to engage every single pack of white mobs <laughs> with the same care and it it feels less fair like the white mobs just felt like like you know actually supposed, harder than the boss trash. sometimes like yeah. <laughs> the trash mobs literally felt harder than the boss in some occasions yeah i had more deaths to trash mobs i think than bosses in in the I'm whole sure. playthrough which is wrong that should be that's that's wrong and it's not for them yeah. because i want to go back to town for the like 69th time this hour to get another potion so i'm just like all right i'm just going to try anyway and then i die and reset some map and i have to do it all over again mm -hmm. yeah we heard you we're gonna make the well in town replenish twice an hour <laughs> yeah i don't like this woody joe guy we, I, I don't like yeah, get him we, off the balance team get him <laughs> what is this guy doing we heard you and we put well refreshes mana pots and health pots in the shop <laughs> oh <laughs> Oh, yeah. MTX all value. Those, yeah. all some dragon's them. dogma shit. Damn, eight hundred percent value there. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess what they could do is just like, I guess you want to have like a bit of a break from like these intense boss fights, and like, when you go to the next zone, right? You finish the boss, it's like at the end of the zone, you go to the next one, and kind of like you know, maybe. They could probably do a lot more of like density as well, where it's like, okay, you start small, there's like, you know, individual monsters and you kind of like learn their mechanics the first time and you see them. And, you know, then, then there's maybe like sometimes these pack of monsters where it's like 10 of them or so. And suddenly, you know, this is the moment where you have to be aware and not get surrounded and then do your slam in the right moment. But then you walk to the next guy and it's like a few like, you know, individual monsters and it's like not such a big deal. Then it comes like a rare pack, that comes a magic pack. And I think they need to like kind of just get the balance right between like, how often do you have these intense battles versus, you know, like constantly being in danger, right? Like, I feel like if you're like constantly sitting there and like, you know, super tense and like everything can insta kill you and stun lock you, I think that's, yeah. I mean, personally, I would, I would like such a, you know, difficult game. I kind of like it with Rax there, what he said earlier. But I also agree that it wouldn't probably make a good game for like, you know, most of the players that are trying to catch here. So. Yeah, I think they they have to do a lot of like fine tuning there, especially with like you know monster pack size, for example, or like you know the monster distribution in a zone or something like that. But one thing I want to ask you both of you, like that have played, so how how many of the optional zones have you done, and how many of the optional bosses? Because as far as I know, you're kind of supposed to do, I believe, all of them, because I think these bosses always drop these like permanent power ups, and uh, like maybe some of them don't, or maybe some of them didn't do it in this playthrough, but I heard about this like a long time ago that there is like these hundred bosses throughout the campaign, some of them optional, but we know we know how optional skill points are, for example, right? And in, in PoE, for example. So um how how did you progress actually? Did you just like rush to the objective or did you also do a side side quest? Because that might also be a pretty important factor in like how hard it is. I uh, skip side quests. Yeah, I mean I, no. I I just did main. There was people that were doing side quests and they got experienced bosses as I did not get experience. My goal was I wanted to see how far in the axe I could get. So I was trying to rush. And so I was definitely pushing 
like faster than intended. I think there is rewards for like exploring, etc. But even with that, like I was saying earlier, by the time I got to Act Two, like it was it was really not a problem. And the amount of like rare and magic mobs that were showing up, I was refilling my pots much more commonly, so I wasn't really going back to town as much as I was experiencing Act One. It's really kind of Act One where it felt a little clunky. Um, but yeah, no, I was skipping most of the the side quests. Although I heard there were some pretty good bosses I missed out on because of that. How about you, Sub? Yeah, uh, was the Devourer optional? Did you not do him? It was not optional. I had to do the oh, that one. Was not optional. Okay. Um, what about all the other graveyard bosses? Did you, were so those I skipped, optional? Those are the ones I skipped. Okay. I did Devourer, Executioner, uh, the Iron Manor, and then I did like the first Act Two boss. Okay, so you missed all the special bosses. Okay, I did. I um, saw one, but I didn't. I didn't engage with. Yeah. Them. So for me, unfortunately, because of Sork, uh, I I guess I did do all the optional bosses, and I didn't. <laughs> I got multiple p uh, gear items that had plus one level of all chaos spell skill gems. There is not a single chaos skill gem in the demo. So <laughs> that I uh, I got things. They looked cool. It potentially would have been really cool if I had chaos skills. But yeah, there weren't any any uh, power ups for me there. And unfortunately, also the passive tree which is very, very, very rough right now. Like, if you looked at the outside yeah. of the passive tree, it would say, like, critical one, critical two. It was just demo demo yeah. stats right now. Um, basically, after the first four or five passive nodes, everything, I had to, to go to anything else that had value for my character. It was, like, six six or seven travel nodes to get to something that had value. So I, I, I think I got a couple additional levels, but it did nothing but, you know, little int nodes, unfortunately. The fights yeah, are cool, I though. Yeah. I guess it's it really comes down to like you know maybe like we, we don't really know much about the game right like everyone who played this was basically a noob and it might also just be that people have not figured out how to actually play the game like at all right like people were kind of like learning combos between like I saw for example Ben doing like this uh, tech with like these lightning arrows in the ground and then they would like barrage lightning arrow through them and they would like you know shock everything ten times or something and that was kind of like a like a burst combo he was doing. And I, I guess similar for other classes, like, you know, as long as you don't even know, like, what is the combo that you have to do? And there might also be, like, a huge you know, difference in balance between how you play, like, in Act 1 versus Act 3 versus, you know, Act 6 versus in maps with, like, you know, how much you have to focus on these combos, right? So maybe it's, it's, it's a completely viable that you just go, like, mostly auto attack in Act 1, and this is how you play Act 1. And then it kind of, like, you know, you have, like, this, this progression again, right, that I talked about earlier, where, you know, you, now you start feeling the combo being actually useful, maybe in Act 2, and then you get Leap Slam, and then you like Leap in, and you do a combo, and everything dies. And then in Act 3, you get like the next thing, and then in Act 4, you get another thing, and suddenly it all comes co comes together. And maybe it's just also like a matter of not really understanding how the game in general works, and something that you know people can figure out over time. I'm right. sure that if you have exactly the same game as now, and let people play it for like a month, then this footage will look very different from what we saw from like people playing it for four hours in Los Angeles. So this is mostly the point I'm trying to make here. Right, and uh, th that's completely true. People are going to get what, much more knowledge about the game, even if they don't change it, and they're going to do it much better, and the playthroughs are going to get easier. But to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, um, um, again, like not to just keep reiterating the same point, but the first playthrough is going to ma be make or break for a lot of people. A lot of people are not going to give it a, a month, a month of time for people to figure out the meta so they can learn Ben's tutorial on how to do a Ben combo with the, you know, the, the lightning arrows and uh, all of these crazy things. The game needs to be viable without this experience. It needs to be viable without a YouTube video from Ben teaching us how to be a god. Um but yes, the, the landscape of the game, even if they don't change it, we'll, we'll get better at it and we'll figure it out. I kind of, uh, a, kind of a hilarious parallel here. I was trying to figure out, so in Last Epoch, a lot of people keep asking me to make some kind of Rune Master guide. And I have an endgame Rune Master and my Rune Master absolutely fries. But the whole path to getting up there was not that clear. It, it was kind of rough. And so I was like, well, I can't just make an end game rune master guide and say, all right, everybody, well, get to get, get to 80 and get all this gear and then you're going to destroy the game. So then I was looking for different ways to level up with nothing and trying to find a very clear cut way to 
to level up, and I know there's one really overpowered skill, Glacier. Glacier destroys, it obliterates everything, I know that. But people are like, oh, try Fireball, try Lightning Blast. No, 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 Rax, Fireball, but you have to take this unique. Well, what if I don't have the unique? Oh, well, then Fireball's not that good. Okay, it's like, so I have the knowledge to level up with Glacier to be able to play this Rune Master in the end game. But if that's how it is all the time in PoE2 at the launch, oh, yeah, the people who have figured out the one way to run through the game and skip the side quests and not having a combo, I don't think that's going to work, man. Yeah, I agree with that. I guess it should be like, you know, like forgiving enough so that, for example, your auto attack and maybe in Act 1 is, is still powerful enough to kind of get you through, right? And you don't have to do those crazy combos. And maybe you're going to figure them out later or something, right? And... um yeah, like kind of make it accessible, but maybe later on you kind of want to like include them more and more so that, you know, people kind of like have this learning curve. And yeah, I guess that was kind of like probably expected from the start from the developers that, you know, you do these combos as soon as you have them and this is how you play the game. But maybe it, sh it shouldn't be like that, right? So that's for you. And one of the things they did is the very first thing they announced when we all got there was that they're delaying the game um, yeah. because they <laughs> exactly. say it's not ready. So yeah. I, I obviously they agree that it's not in the state they want it to be. And some of the logic that they used when they were delaying the game was because they added WASD. It changed kind of the balance of everything in particular. You know, now that you can move while attacking was something that they wanted to add. And that actually influences everything from how fast they need to make the mobs work and the balance of everything. And like Sub was saying earlier, uh, obviously the skill tree isn't finished. So I don't think it's necessarily in the state that they want it to be or else probably the beta wouldn't be pushed back. So I am kind of curious to see on what changes they do implement after everyone has had some testing and some feedback on it. Um, I, the part that I keep coming back to and like the reason I would want to play the game, and I don't know if this is what they're designing the game for, this is, but for me, it's like if I got through PoE 2 and all the acts and I get to the acts and I killed all the bosses, I will have felt like I had a good time regardless almost of what the end game looks like because of the way that they made the bosses where each one of them feel like a unique individual fight. And because we have like, what, 100 plus of them, I think they said, that if, if all of them are at the level of the ones that I was able to experience, it's going to be an enjoyable time if even the time in what PoE2 is, is just go through the campaign, kill these bosses, defeat all 100 bosses, I'm still going to enjoy it for what that is. Maybe it's not the POE one in-game blasting everyone once. Maybe it's not the focus on making your character and the builds and all that that people are used to. But the actual part of like playing the game and fighting the bosses was really good. So I'm, I'm hoping that maybe the rest of the balance, et cetera, you know, gets figured out. And I, to be honest, I have faith in that aspect because GGG seems to deliver out of almost any company we've seen so far. Um, but it, I really hope they actually don't touch the bosses too much because I thought it was about near perfect in in my time playing it at least. Yeah, I agree. One thing, uh, not to go on like a tangent here, but one thing about about these games that I'm learning much more this year. And again, I, in no way am I trying to pick on Diablo Four, but I'm just going to use them as an example. I guess another example would have been Diablo Immortal. But one thing, and I'm interested to see if this impacts you guys as well. I, I wouldn't say I'm a very emotional person. I, the person who knows here, me uh, the most is probably Woody. I have normal mode and I have mad mode. That's pretty much it. <laughs> That's pretty much the only two. I like both, I, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But um, I'm not really a very emotional person. I kind of just sit here and play games and that's it. But one thing that I learned this year that I didn't learn in any of the other years streaming is how much it impacts how much I'm enjoying a game as a streamer with how much my audience is enjoying it. So for the example here, one of the most draining things that happened to me is when a lot of people in Diablo 4, not to pick on Diablo 4, but this is this the example that I have, we're just upset by various things. The generators, the crowd control, the lack of end game, you know, whatever the different things have been that they're trying to solve. At a certain point, when you log in day after day after day, it's like going to a, a job that you don't like and everyone, all your coworkers are complaining all the time. It, it really had a big impact on me personally. So what, what DM's saying, he's going through the POE game and he's feeling like the campaign is 
a, a big accomplishment and Woody is saying as we play it more, we're going to figure out the game. I'm 1000% sure that's going to happen for all of us. We will solve the game. We will beat all the bosses. That's a guarantee. The thing that really matters to me is I would really love everyone to love Path of Exile 2. So uh, really a lot of my mentality is how do I get people to download the game, play it, get something that they like and stick with it and enjoy their time. So if the bosses are perfect and the trash mobs are bad and the potions are bad, anything like that, that it's going to, I really don't think of it. I guess another way to say this is I don't really think about it from my perspective. I don't sit there and play and say, how am I feeling about this? I try to imagine how will everybody feel about this and um i don't know i guess that's the end of my point but the how the audience feels about it has a much greater impact on me than i ever imagined previously yeah, yeah there's yeah, some I, I agree with that there's Sorry. some barriers to entry for sure in path of exile too and i agree that if they uh, smooth out the barriers to entry and keep it where people aren't turned off so early in the campaign that would probably be a good thing uh, in overall. I think another part that's probably going to matter for PoE 2 is how they market it as we get closer to the release. So a lot of times a game can be determined whether or not it's successful by if it's marketed to the correct audience. You know, D4 was marketed to literally everybody, so you see the response that we had. And Dark Souls is typically marketed as another Elden Ring, Dark Souls type of game. So if the expectations are clear before you go into the game, we're going to see less of the people that enter it just thinking like, oh, this is cuphead or whatever like it's just you know a game that's extremely difficult if they market it to the correct people then i think that probably will have a better impact in terms of how people feel about it going into it and how they describe the game it seems like everything i've seen them say about their own game so far is difficulty like i haven't seen them be like this is a much more accessible version of poe i haven't really seen that they say that they want it to be more widespread but when they, when they talk about things like difficulty specifically I, I never really see them push back unless I'm missing something. I never see them pushing back about wanting the, the difficulty floor to be lower. It seems like they're, they're holding that line fairly high. And I'm hoping that they kind of remove some of the clunkiness out of the game, which is where I think the barriers to entry will, will turn people off is kind of the clunkiness of the game. Um, but I imagine they might keep the difficulty level like pretty high. At least that's the vibe I was getting. Maybe I have a bad take on this one, Sub. What do you think? Uh, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I have the same instinct and also thank you for using floor properly. It's so annoying when people, <laughs> so many people use it incorrectly. Um, yeah, I have, uh, I have the very same instinct where they have that developer, that, that drive, that old school D2 inspired drive to keep that difficulty floor a little bit higher. And I, I don't think it's awful, but it needs to have an intuitive feel that kind of smooths out through mastery and i i just didn't feel that in act one whatsoever i didn't feel in the the final zone in act one the the burning village that that compared to the zone at the beginning with all the werewolves it felt equally as annoying I, my character didn't feel <laughs> any more powerful at dealing with yeah. the the swarms of enemies or anything and i would have expected that my own personal skill or the character's power would have helped me overcome and make those trash mobs feel a little bit better like, I'm kind of okay with the werewolves being a little annoying in that first zone. But the fact that the all the little fire dudes like, jumping out of the fire and just like, okay, well, fire I gotcha. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the pigs. The, like, yeah. The, yeah, these fire pigs just like running and exploding on you. Like, it just didn't feel like I was getting better as a player or better. It's just like, oh, just Agreed. memorize. Like, it, yeah, yeah, it just didn't, Agreed. didn't feel to smooth. Rex's, yeah. To Rex's point, like, I, I think that would actually piss people off. There's some stuff they add that I kind of hope they tune that I think is, like, there to piss off the, the people that's kind of unnecessary. Like, the, the ones that I think about is in the maggot layer, basically, the dudes that come out of the walls. Yeah. Like, you yeah, can't yeah. see them. They're not, there's no warrant. Like, they, they're colored the exact same as the wall. So you're walking by and suddenly you just get stunned out of the wall. Like, it felt frustrating. I was just like, come on. Like, why? You know what I mean? And so I, some of those could be a turnoff for some people, for sure. They didn't really feel like a skill issue as much as just annoying. Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of like rough edges to smooth out still. And if they get it right and people have like a, a good time playing through Act 1 and then, you know, you start feeling the progression in Act 2 and Act 3 and you get stronger and get your links. And I guess it will kind of like naturally like smooth out, I guess, over time. And then after like 
find ways to still keep stuff challenging. Like if you like leave something into a pack and the pack just blows up, yeah, that's fun. But on the other hand, do you still have a game at that point? Yeah, like I mean, you know, that they have to kind of get that right as well, right? It can't just be only that as well. So I guess we'll see if how it will actually balance out in the end. But yeah, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of work to be done. Um, I wanted to move on to the next topic though. Um, and also want to ask you guys real quick. Uh, so we had like almost 90 minutes in. I originally scheduled this for like around two hours. Are you fine if going a bit longer? Um, I'm not sure like sure. if you have any plans. Okay. I got all the time in the world. I just got to tell uh, tell Alex at Maxwell that the the build guide might get delayed a little bit, and it's Woody's fault. <laughs> so as long okay, as you're so... willing to schedule Subtractum's funeral, then <laughs> we're, we're fine. Okay. Now I, I'll I have a call with Alex later anyway, so maybe I can save him. That's fine. Yeah, just tell him okay. it's your fault. All right, that's fine. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, I wanted to talk about um, D4 a little bit as well. So um, we have D4 and Last Epoch as well that I have here as my topics. So let's talk about D4 a bit, um, especially also like I guess in comparison to um, you know the recent news with uh, PoE, we had like you know two big announcements basically. We had the D D4 season four stuff, and then we had the PoE two stuff and the PoE one Necropolis League, and it was like a lot of news basically at once. And everyone here also has played um, a good bunch of D4. Uh, okay, I'm not hundred percent sure about Subtractum, but I think you said earlier you also have. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure about your experience exactly, but yeah, personally, I've blasted a lot. I know Rex has, I know DM has also. And uh, well, let's talk about season four, I guess, and what it means for the game. So what are your expectations? What are your hopes? And uh, do you think this is, for example, going to be enough for now to kind of like, you know, maybe stop this like default bad, you know, attitude that we see all the time? And, you know, how, how you're going to feel this is going to impact the, the game and the, the community? Yeah, I think I think there's there's one word that Blizzard needs to target uh, in season four in the next few months, and if they can target a single word, I think they'll be totally fine. And that word is fun. It's all about fun. So people don't it. You can analyze as much as you want super end game theory crafting about how deep the crafting system is. Da 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 da. The question is, is people don't have fun picking up 900 yellows, sifting through them, and they're barely an upgrade in the way that you acquire them. They're not having too much fun with the builds because Last Epoch is making uniques where your detonating arrows now do way more damage and they're a melee skill and the traps throw them and then the traps blow up the whole world. And a lot of the uniques in Diablo 4 are like, Fireball does 10% more damage. It's just not fun. And a big, gigantic question, probably the biggest looming question that won't be solved until people actually log into the PTR is, is the pit fun? Do we have fun playing through the different GRs? For me, the in-depth technical analysis of how the progression system should go, everyone can log into the, the PTR and give 10 pages of feedback. If people have fun with the new changes that Diablo 4 made, and if they continue to increase that, I think they're going to win. So that's going to be my main question is, how am I feeling playing the game? And what are people saying about playing the game? Are they entertained? That's the main question for me. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, some of the comments that I get when people are talking about why they don't like for instance, Diablo 4, is that it feels like a chore to play. People say, I don't want to level the 100, even though it's one of the fastest ones to level of all time. And it just feels like a job, like running a million vaults, et cetera, running a million AOCs. You know, it, it feels like a chore. So I think you're right on the money there with fun. For me, okay, so what is actually going to implement fun? Well, I think itemization changes are more or less the only like major thing. We have the pit, but it's kind of greater rifts, right? And we have the same bosses, but now level 200. So realistically, we're talking about itemization here for season four. And if item chase is enjoyable, and if the process of getting an item, leveling the item, and master working the item gives you the basically the dopamine of did I get a big dick item or not, if that process there hits the mark, then the game will be fun for as long as it needs to be. I actually don't think Diablo 4's target market is to be a game that you put 500 hours into a season is. I think all they have to do is to make most people enjoy the game for 
20 hours, a handful of hours. If again, most people do enjoy the game to around level 80, 85, maybe kill a in-game boss, maybe not. That's all they really got to do. It's the most casual out of all the ARPGs. And I think if they can hit that market, then they're going to get people to feel better about it in the current way the game sits until we get like ultra in-game, et cetera. So the itemization needs to be not a frustrating chore-like experience. I don't want when I log in to feel like leveling and masterworking my items, I don't want to do. It needs to feel easy enough and fun enough of actually creating the items for me to want to continue the process to chase the items. And then we're gonna have to deal with like in-game later. But I yeah, pretty much agree with the point there. Yeah, maybe some doctor has some points as well. Oh, I'll have the most around. unique perspective here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you get you guys are actually my D4 Sherpas. Um, the so I played in the preseason a lot, and I I had fun. Like I saw a lot of potential for the game in the preseason. Like I killed Uber Lilith. I felt I felt a sense of pride and accomplishment. I, I think I got a tier 100 Nightmare Dungeon, and I leveled yeah, level to 100 when it was hard. Um, oh god, that was actually not a fun grind. But yeah, like I, I felt like, okay, there's a really good foundation for this game. And then I saw, you know, everyone saw what season one was going to be. And I've basically been using, I haven't played since the preseason. I've been using you guys as my guide to tell me whether I should play again. And I have not played since the preseason. Uh, you know, I've been, I've actually <laughs> uh -oh. been following you guys and just seeing like, when is something that is added to the game that really wants me to, to lock you? I'm sorry, sorry to blame you guys for me not playing, but uh <laughs> Yeah, like I, I follow all your guys' stuff and, and I'm just really waiting for that one thing where, you know, Rax or DM or Woody is just like, this is the one. They, they solved it, they cracked the code, and they unlocked the fun of the potential of Diablo 4. Like, I still see there's still a nugget of potential in that game for me. And for, for me, like the soul of what I liked about D4, it is the best multiplayer ARPG. Like, Last Epoch, you can play with people. PoE, there's like group play. But d4 i actually had so much fun going to helltides.com putting that up on my side monitor the boys would log in and we would just be like riding around helltides and just like oh it's over here the special chest is over here and we're just gonna like we're doing stuff together and it was fun and like even cheesing some of the nightmare dungeons like oh dude, we're gonna cheese the xp in this one nightmare dungeon i found that really fun and then playing with my friends and even yeah even the world bosses and stuff uh that's what I wanted is a world where there's fun stuff to do with my friends. I think that's actually their unique uh, competitive advantage would be leaning into that and because that social connection is something that, uh, yeah, all the ARPGs, uh, the other ones almost actively discourage. And I just haven't like the stuff that they're adding doesn't feel like they're really leaning into that at all to like really encourage people to play together. And so, yeah, until like one of you guys says, hey, this is this is the mechanic that makes the game awesome and fun and i want and you should log in or get all your friends to log in it's awesome to group up they they just unlocked eight person parties in like uber nightmare dungeons let's go um you know until that happens i don't know when i'm gonna reinstall the game so i'm waiting though i, I do want to play the game again at some point yeah, it's actually interesting to hear what what is uh, described uh, about the group play i gotta say um i mean first of all in, in case you're not aware like season four is actually like a pretty huge break from the existing game and we're going to see on the PTR how it will actually play out. But, you know, with Loot 2.0, there is, and there's also, you know, new endgame systems now, the pinnacle bosses that I hope are going to feel like on a similar level as like the existing like Uber bosses in PoE. Um, if, if they hit the mark right there on the balancing, that can be really fun as like kind of like a, a benchmark and like a, a goal to have for a character, I think. But yeah, the group play is a really interesting point because I actually hear from a lot of people that Diablo 4 is like such an antisocial game as well because there's no group finder and, you know, you, you don't really have a good way to interact with people. But yeah, you need to have, like, if you have your group of friends and you play together and you log in together and you do a hell tides, yeah, that's kind of nice. But for like the more casual play where it's like, okay, you log in and you have no one, it's like exactly the opposite. At least that's what I hear all the time. And personally, I cannot really say that I have done much in groups with anyone. I've played a little bit of Ziz at some point, like in, in Season 0 or something. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, some other people. But realistically, uh, the only stuff I've done in groups is like farm some of the bosses because it's just four times more efficient. And I really hate that part of the game, to be honest. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's kind of like, 
yeah, it's, it's very interesting to hear you be so positive about the group play. But I do agree that compared to the other RPGs, like D4 makes it very easy to group up because there's no like, you know, crazy like support meta like in Diablo 3 or in PoE where you have like, you know, you need to have a certain build to actually like, you know, be effective as a team or something. You just like go in with your build and you blast and everyone just brings their, their own setup and, and it kind of works, right? So there is actually potential there to like make group play a lot bigger, but I feel like it's really untapped. And that's kind of like the, the one thing that is like a recurring problem with the Outlaw 4, right? So much untapped potential that uh, it's kind of like just going to waste, I feel. And uh, we see that in so many aspects. And well, slowly they're like trying to bring more stuff to the game now. And let's see how, how it will work out, I guess. So I think... I think Blizzard maybe doesn't get enough credit for what they did for multiplayer. They actually implemented the way to play with other people that I think is actually potentially the strongest of any of them. So with their initial idea for it to be a giant overworld game, they needed to solve something of, I'm I'm sure Woody and I at least have heard this a million times. A lot of people, when we were playing Diablo 3, were screaming, I'm a solo player in Diablo 3, and solo players in Diablo 3 just completely get screwed in every way imaginable. Like, group play is infinitely stronger than solo, and it has been the entire time. So all we heard over and over and over was, how can I play the game solo? And what Blizzard did with Diablo 4 is they made it so you don't have to have friends. Well, not quite. The Duriel thing is a huge problem. But... With the overworld, you don't have to have pr- friends because none of us Average have any RPG friends. Player, yeah. yeah, none of us <laughs> have any friends. And you don't have to party up. You just ride to the world boss. You just ride to the event. You can, as Subtractum said, get a group of people and blast Nightmare Dungeons and Helltide, and that's so fun. Or you can just go do Helltide, and there will just be people there. And I actually think that they solved a very significant problem by doing that. The singular thing that I think a lot of people are complaining about with um, Diablo multiplayer is the lack of a group finder is the ability to find specific friends to play with. That makes sense. If you want to find new friends to do Helltide with, find new friends to do the Dungeon Finder, nothing that they have done has solved that specific issue, which is a problem, and they could implement that, and that could be untapped potential, as Woody has talked about. But I actually think they solved one of the biggest problems of, I am so glad that I don't have to make a party to go to the world boss. Honestly, I don't need the party anyway. I'll just one-shot it myself. But let's say that they actually make the world bosses hard one day. Do you really want to have to make a party to go kill the multiplayer world boss? Or do you just want to ride up and fight it and whoever's there is whoever's there? I, I think they deserve some credit for that, personally. I didn't mean to discredit them. I, and I do really agree that these are really strong points of the Diablo 4, like this kind of like random encounters that you have with people that works really well. And then you have like, you know, this kind of like, you, know, you bring a group of friends that also works really well. But yeah, this one other part is really missing, right? Where it's like, you cannot find people like... You can't go and, and like you know make friends basically, right? It's like okay, you find random people on hell tides, but are you really gonna like invite into a party and then you know add into a friend list and then group up again the next time? Yeah, that's not happening, right? So this is kind of like the the piece that's missing. I feel like you know like you know like communities from the Apple Three, for example, is is like one of those things where it's like okay, you want to do bounties? Sure, join the bounty community and you know LFG there, right? And you're gonna find people to do a certain thing, and that is just like not there. It's also not there for trade as well. You find a really good item, how do you go trade? You go to a third-party site and you trade there. Same, same issue there that they could solve. I'd be curious to see how they're going to address trade now that both Legendaries and Uniques are going to be tradable going into Season 4. Some optimization there. I feel like it's the, uh, the, the average session time of someone who plays Diablo 4 in an in individual day is probably lower than some of the other categories, like maybe the ARPG... POE players on each day have more hours per day. So I feel like Diablo 4 would benefit greatly from a system that automates the ability, like you guys are saying, to find people. Because just from a streamlined process, like let's say the D4 average person plays like two hours a day, right? If you spend 30 minutes of that two hours to find somebody to play with, to get in a call or do all that, like you're you're limited on how much time you really have left. 
uh, with your session that day. So uh, the systems around it can be kind of nice. I do kind of agree with Rax's point about like, I, I do like the, the fact that I don't feel like I have to go necessarily into a party. Uh, I liked Lost Ark and I liked raids in it, but the having to find a party that one wants you, two isn't toxic, three is actually good enough to actually be able to do it. Like going through that part of it is frustrating. I feel like if you only have a limited amount of hours in any given day, uh, we saw this with WoW, right? I mean, how many times did you get on the raid and then someone's not there or something's messed up and okay, well, we'll try again next week. So I'm kind of glad we were not gate kept by that. Super good analogy. Yes. Yeah, if mandatory multiplayer would lose the soul of an ARPG, I think. Yeah, that's exactly the problem that we had in Diablo 3, where it's like, what Rax described, multiplayer was kind of like the way to play Diablo 3. And that was fun of its own, and it was like, you know, it was like unique, I guess, to Diablo 3, the way that multiplayer worked, with like support builds, and you know, like just like the whole like meta in general, like how it was always, you know, like the speedruns, you had the, the pushing and all that. It was like really truly unique for Diablo 3, but that was Diablo 3. And I think making a repeat of that would be a mistake as well. So I need to find like the, the right balance there. And so far they've done a really good job. But yeah. But I think Agreed. this is like all, yeah, like you know, I, I wanted to get back a bit more to the to the topic of like in season four in, in, in particular with like uh the, the items. Like, do you actually feel like this is kind of like enough to make items interesting outside of like the tuning and like you know how often you find them and all that stuff is that does it actually excite you of like you know the changes that are coming with the tempering and master working for example do you think there could be more or do we like to see more or whatever well i i view this topic maybe a little bit differently if diablo 4's history had gone a different path uh i think about it as as a relative thing it's all about trajectory for me uh so what we current ha currently have just doesn't work for me at all. There is really no crafting. Clicking upgrade five times at a blacksmith, it, we you've completely solved gems. Every build knows exactly what gem you're going to get. At this point, you're just going through the motions of walking to the thing, upgrading it, putting it in your items. A lot of the stats are damage on Tuesdays. I'm so sick at looking at yellows. A lot of the uniques don't really fundamentally change the build in an exciting way. A lot of it doesn't really work for me now. The changes that they're making, one of the most exciting things that for me about the entire patch is sitting at seeing Adam Jackson sitting there on the couch saying, we're going to go with a much more bold strategy with uniques. Frozen orbs at the end spawn a conjuration that throw frozen orbs. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for them to take a bunch of risks. I'm looking for them to trim the fat. I'm looking for them to give me a crafting system that actually matters. It's not just clicking upgrade five times. It's not just upgrading a gem that I already know by the time I'm level one what I'm going to get in the end game. It's I don't quite know what's going to drop. Picking it up is not going to be so bad. So it's not going to be so many items. It's going to be easy to read. And then let's see if I can get through this master working and not brick the item. Relatively, compared to what we have, the trajectory is so much better that I will be happy with that. I'm not looking for them to create the greatest crafting system ever, and I thought that the breadth of their announcement was bigger than I expected from them. So overall, I'm going into it fairly positively, even though Reddit just made a thread about me wanting and all of us wanting all games to fail. I don't know if you guys saw that one. Yeah, there's I nothing I love actually. more than a game being dead, so Twitch is dead, so that I make less ad revenue when I'm <laughs> streaming to viewers. I mean, but yeah, no. In terms of uh, in terms of the itemization changes, I have a very simple take. It's worth my time to log in to see if I like it. If I don't like it, I'm going to do exactly what I did in season three: not play it. But if I do like it, I'm going to play. I don't. I don't think it's much more complicated than that for me. If it feels good, I'm going to try it until it is boring, and then I will quit. And I'll do that every season with whatever mechanic they come out to. I'll try it until I get bored, and then I'll quit. That's it. Pretty much how it boils down to me. I don't, I'm not stressed about it anymore. I would say at the launch of the game, I was like, ah, shit. Like, I kind of, you know, I really hope they can recover quickly. I, I, don't, even, I don't really care anymore. It's like, I, I hope the game recovers because it is good for me. 
and I would love to have a third ARPG, PoE, Last Epoch, D4, Holy Trinity. Let me cycle between these. It's Let's go, baby. It's literally perfect for all of us. So hopefully it's good, and I hope I enjoy it, and I hope when I log in, I have fun. If it's not, then I won't. I guess just yeah. just to give one direct point to something that DM said, and maybe this is something that I need to work on personally as a human being, but I would say that I am stressed out about it. I am stressed out about how it's going to go. I am stressed out about Last Epoch, even though Last Epoch is doing well. I am stressed out about PoE2 and PoE1. And I don't know, I, I guess I don't have a good reason why, but I don't feel that way. I do feel stressed. It's not, it's not even a function of, oh, I need all of them to succeed. It, he's right. Like the Holy Trinity, I want to cycle through it. But I don't know. I, I am stressed out about it. I, I hope that it goes over well, to be honest. Like, what makes you stress exactly? Like, what do you feel? I mean, I think, I think part of it goes back to, like, I've never really dealt with this in my career, but logging in every day in, like, July, August, September with the def so many people were so upset. That actually really started to get to me. And part of it is, like, like a personal, like, nostalgia thing. I've been playing Diablo since I was, like, 12. I grew up on this game. How how many how many years of our lives did we dedicate to Diablo 3? Not just in playing the game, but also in going to all of those round tables, trying to analyze things, trying to make the game better. I, I feel like there is a lot more at stake here for me than just if Diablo 4 sucks, I'm just gonna log out and I just don't care. It I, I, I do care. Like maybe I shouldn't. And like I said, that doesn't make me a better a better person. Maybe Maybe I should try to shrug it off, and maybe in some ways I, I've been trying to. But I, I would be lying if I didn't say that I was stressed out about it. But maybe I'm the only one. I would be very, very sad if PoE, yeah. Like, the, the Lake of Calandra uh, was a notoriously poorly received league. And uh, yeah, that felt awful. It felt really, really bad. And if we didn't bounce back with Sentinel afterwards, I think it would have been... Um, yeah, it, it would have been a really lasting negative feeling for a lot of people. It it feels bad. Okay, I, I guess it's like, especially speaking from a content creator perspective, right? So it's like, okay, like you have like, you know, like vibing, you have a good time, you build your channel and your audience and, you know, you wait for the next league and the next, next league is like a super letdown. And then everyone is kind of like, okay, I'm going to play other stuff now. Your numbers go down. It's like, you know, it goes all the opposite trend. I guess this is mostly what you're referring to, right? So, yeah, I can kind of see that point from, from Rex. So, of course, like, if like, the game fails and, and we're all going to suffer from it, right? Uh, both as someone who would like to play that game and also as someone who likes to, you know, try to make money off that game as well. So there's yeah. this side, of course. And Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the, the nostalgia point that Rex said, uh, for me also, like, I grew up with a lot of these games. Like, it blows my mind that we're playing Diablo 4. Like, t was it 25 years ago, 28 years ago, I played Diablo 1, and now we have Diablo 4. It's just crazy that it's, this franchise is still around for so long and mm -hmm. like you know everything uh, i've said some pretty negative things about blizzard <laughs> in the past year um past couple of years I, I was a very very big warcraft 3 player and what they did with warcraft 3 reforged it it broke my like literally i watched a video of uh of grubby kind of yeah, like going I, I going over it as well and uh, i i teared up i straight up teared up as well like uh, seeing how much how heartbroken grubby was with Warcraft 3 Reforged and like my memories of that game as well and that whole that series like man it, it's it's just really unfortunate that these IPs that we these worlds these characters that we grew up you know really caring about that really mean something to us now being owned by corporate entities that don't respect it and they don't respect the stories and the characters and the worlds and just the experiences that we've had growing up and it's just it really you know now being on the other side of being around for so long it just it feels so bad just seeing that it's turned into nothing more than a, a monetary vehicle versus something that was clearly a work of passion and creativity you know 20 plus years ago and it's just not being respected anymore that's that's how i feel what what subtractivist articulated much a lot of that I i can understand that a lot because for instance runescape's like my favorite game ever and they're coming out with 
the original guy, Andrew Gower, is coming out with a game called Brighter Shores, which is like his, he's making a new game, you know, that looks somewhat similar. And I have high hopes for it. I hope it's going to be good because I'm a huge fan. So if that was disappointing, it'd be a bummer. It's like Metroid. If Metroid Dread was terrible, I'd be bummed out. That's one of my other favorite games of that all That game time. was godly, think, by the way. Yeah, yeah, so I hear. I had. I actually got a... I still have to play. I've been saving it for a special occasion. Holy shit, so I feel man, like, you gotta play it. I know, I'm really <laughs> looking forward to Super Metroid is like top <laughs> oh, three of my favorite games. No, Rax is saying play time. it right, come on. No, play it right now. Right, right now. just gotta go. <laughs> Podcast is over. <laughs> dude, Metroid Dread, dude, that game is godly, man. You gotta play that game. That game's a 10. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're, you're good. I, I really, I was just saying I can empathize because I feel like since I'm somewhat newer onto the ARPG scene, I don't have like as much nostalgia based around it or like I haven't been as into the scene forever. And it was what, six months ago, seven months ago, I was getting like 5,000 views of video streaming to five people. Like it, for me, it's the worst thing that happens. I go right back to what I was just used to, like in a memory time that I, I'm familiar. I feel like I, I, had like a lucky streak, you know what I mean? Where we all we all got a really good opportunity with D4. I'm thankful for what we did get out of it, to be quite honest with you. I think that's part of the reason where it's kind of like, I don't care because it's, I mean, it's, we had a good run, you know what I mean? It's not like we didn't have a good run. We had a good run. I love One the game. One solid year. Yeah. <laughs> but we had a good run, boys. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I feel okay with it. Oh, look at the puppers. Yeah, I gotta say... As someone who has been like very obsessed with Diablo 4, like, you know, for, for basically two years at this point or, or something like that, you know, I've been gobbling up all the information. I've been preparing for that world first race, you know, like basically a year in advance and, and all that kind of stuff. And now, you know, like all this, yeah, okay, I, I kind of expected it to go well and have a good time and stuff. But then, you know, like what Rax described of like people just being negative about the game all day long in your chat. And I guess I have probably the kind of like still the most kind of like let's say um, you know positive like loyal diablo 4 fan base i guess out of the four here and even in my chat i feel like there's so many people coming in and they're like yeah d4 bad and you know i hate this i hate that and yeah it, it kind of it kind of feels bad right when you know, like I'm, I'm just i'm just vibing i'm having a good time you know making another character and they're trying a new build and i kind of enjoy the game for what it is now waiting for the better times you know, it's not like, okay, I'm going to play one character and log out and do something else, like, for example, the M or something. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I know that the game could be a lot better, and I'm kind of, like, waiting for that time for it to finally happen. And I guess you're slowly entering that phase now with, you know, Season 4. Apparently, Season 5 is going to be, like, a big thing again. We have the expansion on the horizon as well, like, end of the year, they said. So I really hope that it's going to be, like, some big turnaround again where, you know, we all get to go back and, and just blast the game again, and it's finally going to be in the state where uh, also just the developers want it, I guess. Like, we talked about passion, for example, right? Where it's like, uh, like the developers, like, you know, there's like these, these corporate entities, like, okay, we know, like, Blizzard is a mon monolith, and, you know, now it's owned by Microsoft, and, you know, there's obviously, like, a lot of, like, you know, business uh, decisions involved and stuff like that, but I feel like by now, we're also kind of, like, slowly seeing, like, more of, like, the developers actually doing the thing that they wanted to do with the game, perhaps. With like you know actually making a more interesting animation system, actually adding more stuff to the game to do, which was kind of like probably just left out just to like rush out the game. I kind of feel like you know there was like you know more cooking needed basically, and they didn't have time to do it. And I feel like we're slowly getting to a point where we're actually seeing seeing the fruits of their labor, so to say. Where it's like okay, now they actually managed to think about it again and you know rework the system, and it's it's slowly moving in the direction where like the developers are actually like getting the vision for the game as well that they wanted at least that's a bit my impression with d4 like you know with how it's moving right now so i'm not sure how, how you feel about it i mean all that's true i mean i i know you very well woody i've worked with you on a million different things you you are definitely able to take the bad punches uh like like nothing happened and me and north war in the channel literally screaming at each other so i'm I, i'm not surprised uh but yeah i think it's a good attitude. It's a good, it's, it's in general, it's a good attitude to not dwell on the negativity and just to be happy with what you have and look, look toward the good times. That's, that's the way to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe I, 
I, I wanted to hear about subtracting, uh, subtractants, like uh, maybe opinion as well. Like, I'm not sure, like how much you are involved with, like you know, the updates coming to season four and stuff. You said you mostly watch it through us or so, but I guess you are aware a little bit of what's coming. So maybe you have like, a, a bit of a different perspective. Yeah, um, I mean, it's really interesting hearing what what you just said. Actually, where the devs, it feels like the devs are kind of getting their stride a little bit, and maybe it is a consequence of finally finally getting rid of Bobby Kotick. Um, you know, he he did he very specifically said right in his interviews that he would basically stranglehold anything that was like external IP, and you know, he 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 said go deep and not wide um, for basically just like zeroing down on on profits and stuff. Uh, I don't know, you know, but uh, yeah, I think there were likely so many issues in the development process. Also, for reference, for if you guys don't know, I was a game dev for 20 years. So I, I have I a, didn't know that. Yeah, I was a game dev for 20 years. So I have a, I have a little bit of a yeah. history in the industry. This guy's a um, god. <laughs> I want to hear uh, about that after you're done with your point, if you don't mind. Curious. I know a little bit about the process and how it can get interrupted. And the, the reason why I'm not a game dev right now is because I just I don't like the politics and all the all the stuff that can come up. You don't like all um, those content creators that want your games to fail. God damn! Why you just? Why do you hate my games? <laughs> um, Poor Rex, that Reddit thread really got to you, bro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it's really interesting seeing. Like, no one wants to work on something that sucks, right? And but but the, there's also the issue of morale. I, I firmly believe that morale is a big thing, and I, I feel like just Diablo was developed through the worst turbulent uh, storms that Blizzard possibly had ever gone through, you know, particularly through COVID and getting exposed for all the, all the controversies and everything a few years ago. And there was a big shakeup in the development and everything. And that's really hard. Like one of the biggest things about, you know, any software development, any process of anything, it doesn't matter if you're like, you know, I don't know, making a sandcastle or something with a couple of people. The longer that you work with a team, the more you get to know each other, those processes, getting better at it is very instrumental to creating any product that's good. And if there's a gigantic shakeup, like I think people don't realize how big a gigantic shakeup, like I think they lost a very large percentage of their dev team, um, like in the mid COVID years. And that like, I can only imagine if I lost like all of my senior programmers, my, you know, the half of my design game designers, half my artists, like that would shake up everything in such a destructive way. That is arguably a miracle that Diablo 4 even came out at all at this point. And, you know, is I think the best that we can expect is that season after season, they do improve. Um, and it sounds like they are. It's, it's, it, it's such a gigantic corporation. It will be slow. But, you know, as long as it doesn't get absolutely shelved, as long as people are listening to feedback and improving. And I think what Rack said about that, that one guy, uh, saying, yeah, I want something like a frost, a frozen orb that shoots frozen orbs. Like that missing in Diablo Four was like the number one thing I didn't like. Like the the uninspired uniques and the uninspired like build variety and all of that. That was my number one complaint. And if they are actually addressing that and starting to be creative, I think that's a good sign. And um, you know, I I think it is. It's funny to say D four bad, but also. It's at the end of the day, the best thing for the ARPG ecosystem and players in general is just more good games being supported and people loving them and good competition. Like we're already seeing this POE. Like I would not be surprised at all if much of the quality of life that we're getting in POE is because of Last Epoch's quality of life. And D4, if they you know start pushing some cool innovations and stuff, and that will just make every other game better as well. Like we should always be wanting games to be better and good for everybody. Yeah, Agreed. well said. Yeah, thanks for the insights, uh, Subtractum. Okay, um, does anyone have any other points about D4, or should we move on? Let me, uh, let me say one more thing about that final thing that Subtractum said. This is the one, I think, missing piece from Diablo 4 that I have not seen. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if Diablo 4 has got some big developers over there left with some big ideas. I would love to see them be bold and try some innovative stuff. I would like to see them try something new. A lot of people are kind of joking that Diablo 4 Season 4 is just a copy of Last Epoch. You know, they're exalted items or this or that and the crafting. I would love to see something new 
in in these ARPGs, whether it's Diablo 4 or anything. I'm really hoping the expansion brings something that's truly new to the table. The pit is just greater rifts. The gauntlet is just challenge rifts. The crafting system, we saw almost an, an identical thing in Last Epoch. Again, it's it's a trajectory thing, so I'm fine with it. The trajectory is going positively, but besides just the uniques being crazy frozen orbs, spawning conjurations that shoot frozen orbs, besides that, what other innovations do you have? You guys, I know Blizzard is not the same. It's not the Blizzard North that made the Diablo 2 that like jump-started the genre, but what do you have in the tank? Show me what you have. If Blizzard is very innovative with something, and even if they fail, I'll give them credit for it. For example, grinding gear games with the Necropolis. You're going to kill enemies. You're going to cart them away in a wheelbarrow. It's in, They're in the morgue. You're going to drag their ass. You're going to bury them. You're going to dig them back up. Like At least you tried something. Even if it sucks, I give you credit for the idea no matter what. That's the thing that I'm missing, particularly from Diablo 4. Kind of interesting, though, because yeah. you mentioned... like these you know okay like there's a the crazy league mechanics and stuff but look at like the open world in the four look at like hell tides and i think that they're, they're definitely like kind of like interesting things that don't really exist in other games at least not that i know in rpgs so there is definitely like some stuff but i do agree that i would like them to be all more bold with like some of their you know like new systems especially in seasonal content right they can they can do crazy stuff and if the seasonal mechanic doesn't really feel right okay then you know it, it's going to be gone after a few months and i mean poe has done some really crazy stuff right you know they've done blight and they've done the trial of the ancestors and you know like putting like basically every single genre that exists into poe uh, at some point uh, i guess you're only missing shooters but we're getting that in poe too and um, yeah, it's just um, yeah, more of that stuff couldn't hurt D four as well, right? And if if people don't really accept it, then it can always phase out, or it can always like maybe keep a part of it and you know toss out the, the stuff that didn't work. Yeah, just have a they side fixed comment. stashes yet? Oh, sorry. <laughs> That will be pseudo fixed in in season four because the legendaries oh, okay. go into your codex of power. The codex of power levels up now as you salvage them. Because you used to okay. fill up your whole stash with legendaries. But uh, Helltides were Terror Zones from Diablo 2. So we mm. saw that before too, right? A, a, a zone gets corrupted and the enemies come and you get more experience and whatever. They were just Terror Zones from Diablo 2. I, 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 maybe yeah. I'm in... Oh, sorry. Let me cut No, you no, go ahead. go ahead. No. I was going to say, maybe I'm in the minority here. I don't actually mind if concepts are brought back or even ripped off from other games. Honestly, all I feel about is is make a game that's fun. I'm going to come back to the topic all the time. That's why your points is for, is that make it for its fun where when I'm playing the game, I'm actually enjoying it. And if that means you have to take foraging potential, so be it. If you got to run back to D2 <laughs> and grab constant concepts from it, so be it. I just want to enjoy my time playing the game and I don't want to have to be the one to fix it. I'm not getting paid as a dev to fix the game. I don't want to have to think about it. I just want to think about, do I like it when I log in? That's about it. So hell tides for me are kind of like, mm. but for some reason I like the blood tides. I think it kind of boils down to density maybe, but I don't <laughs> like the hell tides, but I did like the, the blood tides. I found myself realizing. Well, good news. Uh, the hell tide is a blood tide now. So <laughs> true. True. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, another like basically the cook everything. Another big miss, uh, like uh, we we can move off the Diablo four topic. But one thing that I I just really don't understand. I don't understand it for Diablo 3's perspective or Diablo 4's perspective. You came up with one of the best systems ever in Rune Wards. I thought I thought runes and Rune Wards in Diablo two they were overpowered for sure. They need a little bit of tuning there. But I thought that was one of the greatest systems. It, how good do you feel when you're running around in Chaos Sanctuary and you drop a jaw rune? I mean, oh my god, it's just, it's just the greatest thing. You know, you get your own rune and you can finally make your called arms. First of all, they announced rune runes and rune words for Diablo Four, but then they said we're going to call it the same thing, but they're completely different. They're like prefixes and suffixes, and they were gigantically nerfed. And then the whole crowd just said, "This is dog shit." And then they got rid of it. I cannot believe that they haven't taken an extremely strong look at rune words, innovated on it, and put it into Diablo Four. For the love of God, why didn't they do that? I have no idea. 
I think there's a good chance we're going to see them at some point, you know, especially with like Unique's, Unique's getting more, more crazy and then, you know, maybe them in, eventually doing like some more crafting stuff that they can do with Unique's, then I guess Rune Woods would be kind of the time to be introduced as well. So that might be an expansion thing. It was an expansion thing back in D2 as well, right? Like it didn't exist in Classic, I believe. And who knows? Maybe it's coming in the first expansion in the second or something. Help us, kind Blizzard. Of, kind of cool. Please help us. <laughs> Yeah, rumors are definitely much beloved, but it might also just be because they're really OP, I guess. Is that is that why people love them so much? Or is it like actually a like a special feel about them? Yeah, I mean the thing is, the the reason why you play ARPGs is for the O penis. Everyone wants the O penis, right? And Everyone that's what we're that's what we're all about here. And mm -hmm. that power fantasy. Um and like I think that's one of the things that the best ones, like Diablo, Diablo 2 and uh, yeah, last epoch now too and PoE, they're not afraid to lean into the OPness, and it's uh, like the the thing. It, this has been my issue with uh, Blizzard's balance for a long time. Is since when was the first time that they did this? It was back in World of Warcraft. I was vanilla WoW back in the day. I was a mage. I had my talisman of ephemeral power and my Zandalarian hero charm. And I had my arcane power POM pyroblast, <laughs> and every three minutes I could say, you are dead. <laughs> and granted, yes, I understand that that was not the most fun thing in the world for everybody, but I actually, I mean, I, I'm very, very biased here, but the downs, you know, the downside of it is a very, very bad build outside of that one button every three minutes, right? I, I and remember those like kill compilations of these uh, POM mages, uh, like, pyro, you know, some rock yeah. music. <laughs> yeah, it was, was so fun. And like the, the vanilla, video. yeah, vanilla WoW had all that stuff. Like you, you, I'm I'm gonna be a priest, and I'm just gonna go to Thousand Needles. I'm just gonna sleep you off the top of Thousand Needles, and you're all just gonna fall off and die. Or a rogue, I'm just gonna sit here. Uh, I'm just gonna sit in the corner, and you're gonna right before you get to the quest guy, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sap you, and you're just gonna sit there, and I'm gonna keep you permanently stunned. And you can do these like crazy things that are unfun for the target, but basically every class had a thing. That was unfun for other people that you could do to them and it was like that's what i think for if you're looking for a game that has that power fantasy you want to be able to lean into that uh you know that ability to just feel like okay for this one instance i am overpowered and it's so awesome you get the value for you want to grind the opinus right right and that's or you yeah, can just be a hold a barb and then your O penis is massive, and you're just one shotting literally every single boss that ever existed in a one pump and done. <laughs> I just okay, had... guys. But perfect phrasing, honestly. I, I've never heard better phrasing in my life. I just had beautiful flashbacks to the female Torin shamans named Oprah Winfury, where Winfury could proc Winfury. You run around in your mm -hmm. 40 to 49 BGs with your Kang the Decapitator, and boom, you hit somebody nine times for like ten times their health. It's just beautiful. Yeah, and then you lose Alterac Valley anyway because you're Horde, and it's, old <laughs> it's imbalanced anyway for the Alliance. God damn, those stupid paladins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, before we drift too far off into uh, many different topics, uh, I guess we can move on to the last epoch here. So it's like the last like, you know, like a big game topic that I want to discuss before we go like a bit of crossover. But um, yeah, like last epoch. So we, we already had like a few points, like we talked about the crafting and, you know, how Diablo 4 has like, you know, exalted items now and whatever. But um, well, what was your experience of last epoch, first of all? You know, like now that it has been out for a month, everyone has been blasting it as far as I know. And um, most people had a really good time, but also like, where do you expect Mass Epoch will land between the other games, for example? Like, what are your feelings about it for the future, and like, what are you planning to do? Yeah, so I think I think the context here is important. Like Subtractum was saying, you know, as a game dev, if you would have lost your entire team, that's a miracle that Diablo Four even launched. I think if you consider, you know, the size of the studio and all the things that they've been able to accomplish. I find Last Epoch is a massive success. Also, like Subtractum said, I think that their success only means good things for the consumer. I think that it raises the bar for a lot of a lot of the other gaming companies. 
Um, I think they're going to take inspiration from it, and maybe PoE is implementing quality of life because of it. Maybe Diablo 4 is implementing certain crafting things because of it. We won't know the cause and effect there. Maybe it's there, maybe it isn't. But either way, I think it's just a great game. Um, I think that what they have shared on their dev streams is accurate. The way that they make the game, the way that they continue to expand is in the end game. They have the Pinnacle Boss system coming out next next league um it'll be very good hopefully and uh they're fixing a lot of the bug fixes one thing that i thought they did which was a kind of a brilliant pr move was they polled their community on how they're going to make their changes i mean now people feel almost empowered that hey i don't i trust the last epoch devs to listen and not sweep the rug out from under my feet whenever they're gonna make major changes to the game I think uh, they've done way more things right than wrong, and uh, it's looking very promising for me. I've had a great experience so far. I'm going to mirror very similar sentiments, which is that I think it's probably the best release of an ARPG in terms of like the core skeleton of a game that's ready on release that I've seen in a while, and it's kind of prepped for launch for when they start adding more things in. I like that immediately in 1.1, we're getting Pinnacle. And I'm going to double down and agree with Rax's point about interacting with the community. I think they probably have the best interactions with the community I've seen. They do a great job at uh, having a weekly stream, basically, that goes out there and constantly Q&A and answers things. And it kind of, it, it from what I've seen, it, it makes the community feel part of it instead of like an us against them mentality. It's like, let's make the game great together. And I think that's just, from a PR standpoint, a pretty smart way to do it. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. I think the, they probably have the best interaction. And what they did recently, where they actually changed their stance from like, okay, we don't nerf anything, even if it's bugged, unless it crashes the servers, to then polling the community, and the community clearly said, please fix that shit. Yeah, that was that was a really good move, I agree. And, you know, like, you expect bills to work a certain way, and then uh, for a certain thing just being 10 times stronger than intended, just breaks the entire game and everyone is supposed to play that if they want to be strong and right and it's like a lot of other implications and like you know raising the bar for a build and you know beyond what is actually the, the actual normal and these kind of things right so i think that was a really good move they did there i guess there still remain like a lot of bugs and unfixed problems that they have to take care of at some point not just like there's one or two crazy builds but there's more of these things like, like still hidden or you know, kind of like waiting in the shadows until next patch elevates them again or something. Yeah, there's there's stuff like that. But overall, personally, I had a really good time playing Last Epoch, I gotta say. It um it really came as a surprise to me by how much I enjoyed it going through the game. Because I've seen the game kind of develop over the years. Like the first time I played it was maybe three years ago or so. I mean, I made my first character. I made a rogue, of course. I played Blade Dancer. In fact, I actually just like last week went back to that character and finished it to level 100 <laughs> because I, I kept coming back to that build and it was so much fun. And um, yeah, like seeing the game kind of progress over time was was really cool. And then like the big hype on the release and everyone was playing it, everyone's eyes were on last epoch. So it was a really cool experience. And uh, I really hope that they're gonna kind of keep it up for the future with you know cool updates and stuff that you know, gets me excited to jump back in and gets a lot of other people excited to jump back in but at least my personal impression is that while they are really close to the community and they do a lot of things right i think they are somewhat slow at doing all that which also has to do with the size of the studio but i like personally i feel like I, okay it doesn't really do them justice but practically the game didn't feel all too different like two years ago than it did now and I feel like if you compare this to like PoE with like, you know, the large end game expansions, but even the individual leagues can do like a massive shake up. And if you compare this to like Diablo 4, like Diablo 4 nine months ago is a completely different game than what we're going to see in, in May, for example, uh, I feel. And I feel like in the last epoch, they, they are doing things really well and really like in tune with the community, but very slowly. So I'm not sure how, how your impression is with that. I'm so glad you said that because I didn't want to be the only guy that wasn't 100% glowing positive. <laughs> um, so I, I, I really liked the game. Uh, I played it a year and a half ago. So yeah, nearly two years ago. And I, I made a glowing video. I was like, wow, where, where did this game come from? This is so cool. Like their UI UX is beautiful. 
like it's it's there's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of flaws like i think the the filter interface needs the loot filter interface needs so much work um i'm just so spoiled from filter blade like just being able to reverse search like why did this item show on my loot filter and be able to find the exact rules and fix it i want that so bad in last epoch but like i love the ui ux the crafting is beautiful great foundational systems really intuitive builds and everything feels really good but i played it a year and a half ago and i was like yo this game's really cool really good foundation they got like two or three dungeons that you know when that gets built up that's great monoliths are really cool that's gonna be really great i can't wait to see what content they add and i didn't i didn't touch the game in the past year and a half until release i was like all right let's go i can't wait to see what they added and they added falconer and i was like all right that's cool all right and i guess the exiled mages that's cool uh unfortunately all the experimented items were not usable for me uh but besides that yeah i was i was uh I'm, my concern is just the speed at which they can move like i think beautiful foundation systems really really cool game um i, I love the quality of life like they clearly looked at poe and we're like, all right, how do we make this a game that's actually more accessible? Like, what, how do we make an accessible PoE 1? And I think they did a great job of that. A lot of my friends that bounced off of PoE are playing Last Epoch right now. Mm -hmm. And they're so excited about it. Like, some of them have rerolled multiple characters. And they're like, oh, I finally, I'm starting to understand the depth in PoE that you like and why this is working. And, like, they're so excited. Like, oh, my God, I got, I got this idol that has uh, both necrotic res and some penetration. Like, they, that's perfect for my build. That's so cool. And they like they're starting to get it, and I think it's a great. It, it's really really cool how accessible the uh, the systems and complexity still are in that game. But like for me, the the thing is uh, the 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 trouble is like it doesn't have a, a an identifying characteristic for me besides the fact that it's just a different game that draws me to it right now. It, it needs something to like identify it as a unique game. That is just, this is our core competency. This is what just makes the game awesome. And I think they can find it. Like, they, they are very, very smart. Their, their base systems are so good. But it hasn't found this thing. Like, PoE is just like, we're insane. Like, PoE's <laughs> core competency is, we are insane, and we'll just do insane things. Um, and Diablo 4 is like, we're super polished. We have an open world. And we, you know, and you can play multiplayer. That's, to me, is like the identifying characteristic. Last Epoch is... I don't have a single sentence that's like, this is why I want to play Last Epoch over other games, besides looking for a little bit of variety. So that, that, that to me is like the thing that they need to work on. I believe that they can, and we'll see where it goes. But exactly like you said, Woody, is just like in two years, 100%, there's probably so many engine improvements and like all that stuff. That's like the hard part that's invisible when you're doing game dev. Um, that's probably what they've been working on. But yeah, we have to just see now can they accelerate that engine and start adding content and, and make it, you know, make, make it find its soul that really identifies itself. Yeah, I think I think one piece of context there that's interesting that's different between uh, Woody and Subtractum and it's different from me and DM and DM can correct me if I'm wrong. I only played Last Epoch recently, so I haven't seen like that progression of, oh, I logged in two years ago. Oh, the game has barely changed. One thing sure. that I am I'm I'm hoping changes about the game, um, if that's true, is well, okay, they don't really add too many things for two years. They added two masteries and the exiled mages and the 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 factions is pretty cool. Their their take on trade and SSF. True, but true. it uh it it makes me feel like they will be able to do that because well, first of all, the launch was a success and they, you know, made posts like, all right, now we're going full steam ahead. But also one season after the first one comes out, they're coming out with a pinnacle boss system. Not a pinnacle boss, an entire system. So that seems like two major changes in two different patches. So not to just blindly defend last epoch here, but it's an interesting take because I didn't play it two years ago. So if you guys are saying it both you're saying it barely changed. I could definitely understand why that would be concerning. I can understand the point. I mean, for me, I think I, I moved on quicker than the average person. I hit level 85 like twice on two different characters. And after that, I was kind of like, okay, I can see what the end game is. It's pushing corruption and doing the endless arena until my hardcore character dies, et cetera. That seems fun, but I don't necessarily feel like I need to experience thousands of corruption for me to like get what I liked out of Last Epoch. And I'll check back in when it's, uh, you know, when it's got more polish out of it. I do feel positive about it, mostly because I feel like the release is, for the most part, 
decently complete in terms of a basic release that is then going to be pushed out um, you know, going into the future. So I can kind of get the points about like it hasn't progressed as much. But I also looked back and I'm curious if you think the graphical progression is is enough to make you feel better about what they did with the time. Because I looked back at the basic, it looked like way graphically different uh, than it does in its current iteration of release. So I'm, I'm assuming some of that progression time has been used on visuals and animations. I think they redid all the rigging for all their character animations, et cetera, as well. So I think they kind of made a core game and then polished the core game for the entirety of that time would be my guess until they had a core polished core and then they're going to add on to it from here on out. That'd be my guess. I don't know. Like I know. Yeah, there, there definitely has been pretty uh, massive improvements in the graphics, especially with the 1.0 patch that actually added like the weather effects and like lighting shadows. There, there was definitely a, a jump there. And they also mentioned somewhere in like an interview or something that the graphics is something they always want to keep working on like forever, basically. And it's also like one of the things that uh, I hear from my community a lot. Like this is like one of the weakest points that Last Epoch currently has, which is the graphics. You know, the game is basically fresh. You know, it just came came out, but it already looks dated, right? It's like it's like Diablo three from like twelve years ago or something, um, maybe on that level roughly, or maybe not even. So it's it already looks kind of like old, and this is definitely something where they have to keep working on. I think to kind of like you know please a certain part of the audience at least that really likes great graphics personally i don't really care too much about it you know it's nice if a game looks good but usually i just put everything on low graphics anyway so who cares but um yeah of course uh, they're, they're gonna lose a lot of people from not having like the same top-notch graphics like you know poe2 or d4 is gonna have is that something they should really like you know throw all the money on to solve i don't think so right because the people that play the game will enjoy it for other reasons and i think that's mostly where they should take take you know like the the biggest effort and the graphics is kind of yeah it's nice if they do some updates but it doesn't matter too much i believe i'm not sure if you have any other like opinions on that but <laughs> i was just thinking the the just talk about the graphics point for a second is um i didn't play it i didn't play it years ago i only you know similar to the racks here i started playing with a few months before it's launched at the most here and uh, the difference that they went from what the original ones I saw, when you see the sort of the progression video they put out of like where they started with the Kickstarter, et cetera, it looked pretty significantly different. I feel like Last Epoch's graphics are good enough for me to enjoy it. Like I don't feel like when I'm playing it that I'm looking at the graphics and thinking, this is bad. I feel like it, oh yeah, it's an ARPG, feels pretty good. I was impressed though to say a positive thing about PoE2's graphics in comparison. I don't know, subtract them if you felt this way. When I was playing Path of Exile 2, I felt like, like, okay, Path of Exile 2 has the best graphics, then it would probably be D4, and then maybe like LE, and then and then POE 1. I feel like LE's graphics at least were more enjoyable than Path of Exile 1's in, in the current iteration, is how I felt about it. Yeah, I mean, POE 2 is gorgeous. That game is... Uh... As really, really, and the the animations. I part of my playthrough, I actually zoomed in and I just like spun my character around and walked a little bit. Yeah. The the cloth, the cloth especially, looks so good. Um, yeah, the thing base Poe is rough looking. I will have to say that the the MTX, if you put on like the, <laughs> if you pay to win a little bit and look nice, yeah, it does. It can be pretty nice looking. Um, I think the thing for me with La with Last Epoch is uh, I make I've been making this comparison for many many years now. Is uh, back in the day, uh, the Quake Three and Unreal Tournament came out at a very similar like within a year of each other, and I loved both games. I actually probably played more Unreal Tournament than Quake Three, but there's this thing I describe in games that I just call like the crunchiness factor. And in uh, Unreal Tournament, if you hit someone with something, it it felt like you were throwing styrofoam at them. Like the flat gun, which was supposed to be basically like a shotgun, just felt like you were throwing styrofoam blocks. The um, the shock rifle, you do this big, you could do a combo explosion with it. And it's just like, just like this little oh, uh, transparent purple poof. But you hit someone in the face with the rail gun in Quake 3, it even makes a sound, like a, the, a correct sound <laughs> effect. It feels so good. You rocket jump around, like the, everything from the sound effects to the look and the feel, it has this like crunch to it. Oh, and God, the memories from the LAN parties, man. Oh. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and just like that, that feel, I, that's something that I always look for in my games. And it's, it's 100% just a psychological trick. 
because like the numbers can be exactly the same, but it's the way that the animations and the graphics and the, the sound actually feel. And actually in, in PoE, so for Last Epoch, Last Epoch to me is like Unreal Tournament kind of, where everything's like a little floaty. It doesn't have that real crunch with like a sound effect that just, mm, I feel like I, I hit someone with like a big nuke and they just exploded. But in PoE, there's actually, there was a, a controversy where the shatter sound effect from Herald of Ice, it just, it has this like, it's a literal crunch sound effect of me shattering the entire screen of enemies. And there was one patch where they said, oh, there were performance issues with that shatter sound effect. So they put in a different one and the community lost their minds. Like <laughs> it just, it doesn't feel as good. All they did was change the sound effect, no functional difference whatsoever. And everyone was like, no way. We want our old, like th there were like picket lines and polls and everything going out there um, just to bring back that crunchy factor. And I, I feel like that's something that you really get a little bit more in PoE than any of the other ARPGs for me, except for the one thing I will say, casting Deep Freeze and Diablo 4 might actually be the single most satisfying ability in any ARPG ever. Like if you just put on real good headphones, you zoom True. in, you got th that, that boom, 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 and then everything freezes and shatters. I want that. I want that feel more in video games. I think it's so important and like i find it very disappointing that so many games are not released with that level of detail to sound and gra like the feel of using, using your abilities is like the most important thing more than even just like the numbers and the tuning and i want i want more of that and that's for me that's one of the biggest weaknesses of last epoch is i had a i had a falcon i started falconer and i just go woo i'm shooting my bird and everything's dying i'm doing tons of damage dive bomb woo i'm flying around but i never felt like you know, particularly the way that they do the damage scaling on bosses. If you hit them really hard, it'll like, you know, scale down your damage. It, things felt very spongy. And I never felt like that real, I'm hitting critical strikes, I'm crunching them or anything. And I'd, I'd really like for them to, to look at that to, uh, yeah, to, to really uh, get the game. Uh, I don't know. I want to feel the old penis. I want to feel it real deep inside me. I think that's pretty fair feedback, to be honest. I, I know what you're saying because I was playing Hammer Paladin and it did feel somewhat similar. Where I don't really feel the impact of each of the, the hammers. Oh, penis. Oh my god, guys. <laughs> yeah, okay, but I, I totally agree with like the, the point about the sound. Like, the sound design is extremely important and that can really make or break like the immersion level of the game and like you know the feel of it. And I totally agree. Like, you know, when, when you play like I know Rogue. Like, I know Rogue is my main class in E4, and I, I love Shadow in View. And you know, you you pop a pack, it explodes. It's kind of like this Herald of Ice Shatter feeling. You have like the insane insane sound, and then the pack pops, and it just feels good, right? It's just like fun to use Shadow in View, and like you, you, the penetrating shot into the pack of Shadow in View, everything explodes, the entire screen, boom, and you have the sound. And yeah, I think this is definitely like a huge component mm -hmm. missing from like making last epoch feel good I, I i kind of agree with that so yeah the game is nice i like the skill trees i like the the, the, the you know diversity in the builds and the theory crafting you can do lots of really cool stuff with all the uniques like every five minutes there's another unique item dropping and i'm like man i really need to make a character around this unique and now i have like two thousand hours of build ideas stacked up that i will probably like never play half of them so <laughs> it's like yeah like whenever i come back to the game i have like you know the, 100 builds or something and i'm like yeah like that that is nice but yeah like, that's like these these little details that can make such a big difference so i really hope that they, they also like, are able to improve on that in the future as well yeah i mean i i think the details matter they definitely matter especially to like I think it honestly matters even more to the casual audience because the couch dads that just buy a game and pop it on the PlayStation on their TV after work, they're not watching YouTube guys. They're not watching Twitch. They're just, they're literally just blasting in front of their TV. So how everything sounds and feels is really important. Um, so I definitely recognize the importance of this. I usually just turn on games. I don't really care too much how they look. I grew up with a regular Nintendo. Everything looks like shit over there. Half the time I have the the sound completely muted. I'm listening to music. So that's not going to ever make or break it for me personally. It's much more about like the gameplay, but I do think it's, it is critical. It, it is important for a lot of the people who play the game. Yes. Now, um, okay, like one other topic that we kind of like, you know, drifted 
like uh, kind of like drift on the side was like also like the the progression of the the patches that we talked about. okay like dm and rax were not really playing it much before but um yeah we know that you know that they have some big plans for the upcoming patches and they are released in like in the next cycle we're going to get like this pinnacle ball system and then probably something else but what would you actually like to see as well in addition to that for last epoch that would make it like maybe stand out like what would be an idea or like something that you know you think would just make the game better Um, I yeah, mean, I mean, go ahead, Dan. From like I a love perspective, it. I mean, I I am a big fan of music that is very set in tone to what you're doing. So one of my favorite things about Poe One when you're fighting the Uber bosses is they all sort of have their theme music and they talk a lot of shit to you, and I love <laughs> that. So I kind of wish that like Last Epoch's voice lines were a little bit more like shit talking you. And that the music was more remember, like, like it's more memorable. I don't know what the word I'm looking for here is. Like, I don't really remember the music of Last Epoch that much, to be honest. And I don't re really remember the voice lines of them shit talking me as much as like irrelevant from The Shaper or something. Like, I remember those, but I don't necessarily have ones that come to mind instantly when I think of last epoch's bosses so i liked the design of the bosses i just didn't really feel like they had as much personality because i didn't have the music and the shit talking i mean personally I, I that's just the thing that i like for myself i'd love to have more of those yeah the the key for me in an arpg right all of us play all these different kinds of games but if we're talking about an arpg specifically here an ARPG for me is all about replayability. It's all about that progression of the carrot on a stick, you know, the OP-ness deep inside me as subtract and describes it. Um, how are you going to keep me entertained in your end game systems? It really always comes down to that for me for every single game. I don't, no matter how beautiful you make the campaign, I'm going to rip through it instantly. And then I'm going to be in the end game. If you can make that very rewarding for me, you're always going to win. And I think in all of their end game systems, they could all be improved. For example, one thing that I heard the last Epoch devs say themselves with a problem with the dungeons, for example. Well, the first couple of times you do the lightless arbor, you light the trees on fire, you shift through the different uh, the things of time or whatever. It's really cool. It's really fun. It's a great idea. But when you're running your 40th temporal sanctum to slam your 10th pair of daggers where you just can't get what you want, even the last Epoch devs mentioned that the replayability of it is not very fun. There's no way to really be overpowered in the dungeons other than just having more boss damage. Nothing helps you get through these dungeons any faster and there aren't more dungeons and things like that, just as one example. The monolith system can be very greatly expanded other than just building corruption. They're fixing that with uh, the pinnacle boss system. And I'll tell you one, one of their game modes that they have that I just don't enjoy is the arena. I just stand in the middle of an arena, the monsters run at me, and I kill them. And that's it. And I either die or I don't. Um, that to me is, and that's the thing with the leaderboard, but I haven't engaged with the leaderboards at all, and I'm normally a competitive player, but if I'm just going to stand in the middle of a gladiator arena and just th throw my minds to blow stuff up until I get one shotted, that's not very engaging. So what do I want to see from last epoch going forward? What's going to keep me engaged? Keep working on the end game, come out with new and innovative systems as I, we asked for from D4 and continue to improve on the existing ones that we have to engage with because the only one of them that has any replayability for me is Monoliths. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, exact same thing for me is, uh, I don't know what the right term to be, like horizontal, I guess you could call it horizontal content, but I mean, to make the PoE comparison, I, you know, when PoE had much less content, I found it much less engaging. Like I had bounced off the game initially and it was just after years of them adding lots and lots of potential things that you can do and like even within the mapping system itself you you have 10 years and you know, it's 10 years of content of you know four 
if four times a year on average, three to four times a year, they would add something and most of that went core. So it's like, am I going to find essences or strong boxes or legion or blight or breach? Like so many different things. And then not only that, I can engage in delve, I can engage in data. And it's for me, it's just like making the choice of what you can do that's like fun and engaging in the game that's unique. And I, every day I can choose to do something different. And like, I'm, I'm just not a, uh, a numbers go up only type of guy. I like, that's why the, it was encouraging when Rack said about D4, the guy saying the frost, the frost, frozen orb that shoots frozen orbs, something that changes the gameplay. Some like something that I aim for, that's not just number go up, but it's something that feels like a distinct, unique feel. And whether it's doing something in the end game or finding items that, holy shit, like I didn't even know that this was so creative that they tra drastically transformed the way that the skill works. And there's a good amount, of, there's more than, of that in Last Epoch for release game than I would expect. Like I think they did a decent job of that, but I would keep leaning into that and keep the horizontal growth of like variety of things to do because that's what's going to keep people, a wider variety of people engaged for longer as well. Because number go up is is fine. But I think, at least for me, I got to like just a couple hundred corruption. And I was just like, eh, like, do I really want to just run this one till I get the perfect blessing? Not really. It's not that engaging. But if I could craft the monolith, like do something crazy or like in the monolith, I don't know, sacrifice a really good like a three LP unique in this monolith to like supercharge it. And it turns like the whole thing turns dark and red and then it's summoning bosses or some crazy shit. Like, all right, let's <laughs> fucking go. Um, like, I think if they really lean into the system and build it out in weird, wacky ways, then that's that's where a lot of their long term sustain is going to come from. Yeah, I also agree that I think especially Monolo system is probably like the main income system that they have. And this is where I can put a lot of stuff in there, right? Like the echoes themselves are kind of like just kind of like void of really anything to do. It's like you rush to the objective in like 20 seconds sometimes and that's it, right? And there's there's no like a legion or a breach or an expedition or to kind of like keep you there. Uh, there's like nothing like that, right? So they can do stuff like that. And yeah, just like some more meta progression system as well, right? Like, you know, an Atlas passive tree kind of thing or like, you know, Atlas progression. I mean, there's a bit of this with like the corruption pushing and the blessings, I guess, but not really. But yeah, they could like add, add some like overarching progression goals as well that you kind of complete as you do the other grind and then the other grind will feel like not so hollow i guess right like if you have to farm that same boss 20 times to get your blessing eventually then at least you also get something else on in the meantime and i feel that's kind of a bit missing right now it's like mm. okay you want to get that thing and it just doesn't drop and you can farm it over and over and over and yeah i also felt like at least playing circle of fortune i was just like not progressing anymore at some point like, I decided on my first character, I played a Falconer, and I was, like, mega blasting, rushing to 100, and so on. And I was like, okay, let's just go as far as possible with this character and do everything and, you know, do the tier 4 dungeons and, you know, like, try to push the rank 1 in the arena and, you know, get to a 1,000 corruption and all that. And I did that. And, yeah, it was kind of like, okay, like, 30, 40 hours in, I was kind of at the point where my character just, like, completely stopped progression. I was just in a, in a dead end. And I didn't find a single upgrade for like 50 hours, even though I'm still like that far away from the actual potential of items I could get. And I felt like I just couldn't get any upgrades at all, even with like all the investment in the favor and, and the, the, the um, prophecies and everything. Like nothing happened until like 50 hours later, like a bell dropped that gave me like 5% more HP or something. So um, yeah, it, it kind of feels like there's like also like something like missing where I want to keep grinding. Because if I think about doing that thing again with another character, I'm just going to stop by the time I hit 100, if not before that, because I feel like there's like too much of a step up in like, you know, the RNG needed and the progression. And just kind of like, I've, I feel like I'm kind of stuck very early with my character. I just can't get uniques. I can't get, you know, 3 LP or 2 LP on that thing that I really want. And even if I get that, there's a high chance I'll, I'll miss the slam and I'm going to feel bad about it. And I have to go back to like grinding that unique again for 10 hours or something like that. So it's like, yeah, it's like some middle step missing, I feel. And then there could be also like some more tail end progression, I think, long term as well. Yeah, a big thing for me is the um, I don't love infinitely scaling content. Uh, I've, one of the cool things about Path of Exile is it does have delve if you do want to infinitely scale. But there's something satisfying about, and this is one of my problems with Diablo 4, was the monster scaling with me. 
Um, one of the things I love is feeling more powerful and being to go back and like find that level one rat and just smack it and, and feel more powerful. And uh, like if you get that big gear upgrade, you want to feel stronger. Like it for me in PoE, I'm motivated to get that double corrupted plus one power charge helmet because I will notice I will notice that boss dying, uh, you know, a couple seconds faster. It is very significantly noticeable. And that that boss is a static thing that you're testing your build against. Whereas if you just keep pushing corruption, you keep pushing arena difficulty. You're always pushing your character against the, the you know, as far as it can go. A movie. Yeah. Target. And that was my problem with Greater Risk in Diablo 3 is like I would push GRs and I was like, all right, well, I'm just sitting here spamming crowd control and I'm watching them slowly tick down. I want, you know, give me an Uber Diablo or something to test my build against and feel my power increase. And I, I think that's, I, I just don't love infinitely scaling content. I actually completely agree, dude. Like, one of the things that I like about the fact that the bosses are just static and PoE, and I only use it as an example because it's, you know, the other ones are scaling, right? Is that when I make new characters, I can feel the difference in my learning progression. So it's like, okay, my first character struggled against the boss, second one got easier, third one, it was a joke. And then as you go through it, you can actually see the progression of how much better you're getting with each of your builds as well, was something I quite like. But we've been doing a lot of criticisms too of Ellie. I want to throw out something that I thought was, in my opinion, a, a W that almost like no one else does, which is offline mode. I, I, yes. I know it doesn't yes. matter to us as much. We are streamers. We're going to sit online all day, every day. But the ability to offline that and put it on Steam Deck is something that I see the community asking for in basically every ARPG. Like, let me just play the game single player. I don't want to play a multiplayer. I want to have it on, you know, offline mode, whatever. And they actually did it, which is awesome. And it works good. So uh, that was like a surprising W. I kind of hope that that becomes more of a standard norm. So that, you know, in some of these games, like Dragon's Dogma, for instance, the the cloud save you literally can't even make a new character like you have one that just sinks <laughs> you in and that's it you make one character and you're stuck with your cloud save so it's it's i love you can buy another ability. one <laughs> yes I, I actually agree with that it's kind of like an overlooked point and personally i'm a big offline enjoyer in last epoch actually after the first character that i played for the world first race on hardcore i just completely played offline all the time like all my characters are offline and uh, there's not really a, a point for me to like, you know, subject myself to like the risk of lagging out and losing my character in hardcore or something. And yeah, I mean, why not, right? If I don't want to trade with people, then this is the way. And that's really cool to have, I think, in last epoch. It's not such a big deal, I guess, in like 2024 anymore to have an offline mode, but it's really cool that they made it. So I, I kind of give them credit for that as well. I, I play offline all the time. Yeah, I actually played offline for the first couple of days because of uh, you know the server issues, and that was so welcome. That's yeah. what I, was I guess say. it also helped a lot with like the launch, like you know being much better received. Like there were like people complaining about the server issues, but ultimately there was always offline, right? You could you could just make an offline character, and many people did. Sorry, Rex. No, I mean that, that I was going to say what Subtractum said. Uh, offline mode kind of saved the day for the first week. One thing that. Last Epoch did, which I think surprised everybody, is their retention numbers were insane. They had like, mm. whatever, 200K in the first week, and then they had 200K in the second week, and everyone was screaming about how bad the servers were. I just made an offline character. Um, and, uh, well, they didn't lose too many people, even though they didn't have the best start. So I think uh, that's obviously not why they made offline mode. They didn't make offline mode as a safety net for their launch, but a lot of people love it, so... It's a W. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to like shortcut the, the last few topics a little bit. So we also had planned to talk about, you know, like the, the overarching like uh, ARPG landscape, I guess, with like D4, PoE and LE and now and what else is maybe on the horizon. Um, is there like any other games that you know, guys are looking forward to, like especially in ARPG genre, but maybe something else as well that you know, would interest you that would also kind of like fit into discussion here. No rest yeah. for the wicked. Exactly what I was going to say. Oh, Completely nice. Agree. Yeah. No, no rest, rest for the wicked. I... Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go for it, man. Just I was going to say, in. I was going to machine gun. No rest for the wicked. Titan Quest 2. <laughs> Grim Gons getting an expansion. GTA 6. Uh, dare I say in 2028? this? 2028. Hold on. Let me look out my window. <laughs> let me make sure that no one's going to shoot me for this. Maybe the Diablo 4 expansion. 
PoE two, PoE two. Hmm? Maybe the Diablo yeah. four expansion will be good. I just lost a thousand <laughs> followers for saying that. <laughs> you can you can watch it go down as we speak. Yeah, yeah it's just <laughs> plummeting. Yeah. Yeah, no, Resident Evil definitely looks exciting. I didn't get to play it yet, but uh, I watched it with two people. That definitely looks like, I guess it's also like even more extreme than PoE 2, right? With like the Souls like feel and just like, you know, really slow combat, very methodical and like kind of like one to one fights even sometimes that actually last a long time, right? So this is what I got from, from that game as a vibe. It's like, you know, like really Souls like, but isometric. But uh, personally, that actually excites me as well. I'm kind of excited to, to like jump into that whenever I get the chance. Has it's a very good time yet? to be an ARPG fan. I haven't played it, no. Yeah, I, I played it. It's it's tough. Um, so like, I I walked up to the first zombie. I wasn't really I wasn't expecting the difficulty that was there, and the zombie just killed me easily. And I was like, oh. And then I sat there and I spent like. 10 minutes just dying to him over and over but just trying to practice mechanics there's like parry dodge it's like it's uh it's very very difficult so like when you're going through like a diablo map or a last epoch map or a poe map they have like i don't know 500 monsters on the screen i think in the one hour playable demo from you starting and navigating through to fighting the boss there were maybe like 20 total monsters you're fighting like one or two monsters at a time and you better be ready for it. Yeah, it didn't really feel much of an ARPG to me. Maybe itemization, sure. Uh, it definitely felt like Dark Souls with an isometric camera. That's what it felt like to me. Mm -hmm. It definitely did not feel like PoE, Last Epoch, Diablo. Nope. It, it, the difficulty was so high, and you're, just, you're essentially playing Street Fighter against a zombie. <laughs> um, yeah, you basically, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, for sure. It's going to be the good like tactic for PoE 2, I guess. It's like, okay, you have to dodge roll and you have to dodge the boss mechanics. So I guess, you know, once you master no rest for the vicar, then PoE 2 is going to be cake. So. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it's even more than that, though. It's even more than like um, dodge rolling, see a telegraphed attack. It's like all about timing. Like the zombie is punching right now. You need to parry right now and you get two auto attacks in and then he's going to do a follow up. You have to you almost have to like know what the zombies moves are. It's like a boss fight every single zombie. It's uh, the, the difficulty was higher than I expected it to be and I already thought it was going to be pretty high. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, have you guys played like Grim Dawn? Like nope. the previous before the expansion, like I hear people get excited about Grim Dawn, but yeah, like personally, I don't know the game too well. I've seen like a little bit of it, I've not really played it more than like five minutes. But uh, I was just curious if anyone has experience of it. People tell me to play it, I have yet to play it. I was waiting for some big expansion or something to check it out. I looked at it, it looks all right, but I didn't see anything about it. Like, you know, how uh, Subtractor was talking about Last Epoch, like it's hard to surmise, like, what's the selling point? Of it, I I don't hear one of those about Grim Dawn. Like, what is the reason to log in? I think it so, has a pretty interesting class system where you can like combine two classes or something. So, just if I remember correctly, I, I so think that's like a really cool thing. I think somebody who really likes Grim Dawn is Al Kaiser. He's like big Grim Dawn guy. I've never played it. Um, a lot of people say the classes, and they said I think Al Kaiser said it's either the end game or the progression system is the one that he likes the most. Um. But yeah, a lot of people say it's a great game. So I've heard some people call it Grim Yawn because they didn't really like it, but I hear much more people say that they enjoyed it. So I was going to do a playthrough of the original game before the expansion and then jump into the expansion and try it. But I don't know. The, the hype in the chats uh, that I've been hearing is seems like it's going to be a good one. I hear more good than bad. Same. Yeah, I'm quite, kind of excited. It's like coming sometime this year, right? And there's also Titan Quest too. So how about Titan Quest? Have you guys played that? Nope. <laughs> no, same thing. People... I played the Titan Quest 1 demo when I was a, a wee lad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and how did ago. that go? What was your review? <laughs> From however long uh, ago? I liked it until my mom made me go to dinner. <laughs> God damn it, mom. Yeah, it's like a really old game, right? Like, when did that come out? Grant, I was probably like 25 when that came out. Uh, when did <laughs> Titan Quest? It's kind of, kind of interesting to see that, you know, after so much time, suddenly there's going to be like another release or something, right? It's 
kind of crazy. Yeah, I was 24. So, oh man, <laughs> decades. <laughs> okay, that's that's kind of cool. So oh, speaking uh, of game, oh, yeah. sorry, go on, Woody. I was just going to ask. No, no, if you want to make a point, go ahead. I was just going to ask a quick question. We were talking in the topic of uh, you know other games that we we're excited for. I know Rex, you were excited by Final Fantasy because that was something that uh, you know it's a favorite year. So I was going to wonder, did you like it? Like, how was the playthrough of it? What's your quick surmise of how you enjoyed Final Fantasy? So my initial plan was to play it until like I was going to do like until I actually couldn't play anymore. I was going to do like a 48 hour stream, 100% the game. I ended up mm -hmm. playing the game for about six or seven hours. And then I actually just shut it off and I stopped streaming it. Um, I think that the, a lot of the mechanics that they put in final fantasy seven take away from the original, take away a lot of the magic of it. It felt like, again, how we talked about earlier about how Diablo four feels like a chore you run around in the overworld and you do all these extra things that were never in the game. And it just, the whole thing feels like a chore. One thing that I find very surprising about Final Fantasy's system, which is completely counter to like how Final Fantasies normally go, is again, you get new armor, you get new summons, you get new materia, and you feel stronger and you do better. I never changed my weapons. I never changed my armor. I never changed my materia. I never changed my summons and I'm almost done with the entire game. I played it offline. I'm in chapter 10, which is almost through the, uh, most of the game. And you can literally beat the entire game with like the buster sword that your starter sword with nothing. And it. it's just so weird. Like, so even after you do all of these things to unlock all of these abilities, you don't have to equip any of them to beat the game. It's just a bunch of pointless systems that don't actually tie into anything i'm still enjoying it just because i love final fantasy and i love final fantasy 7 so much that it will just overcome all of these grievous problems but i i would be lying to you if i wasn't massively disappointed in the game i think it's yeah uh, i don't know it's really soft was a mistake yeah it's just it's not the same man ff7 is in the conversation for greatest game ever nobody's going to be talking about Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth ever again. That's kind of disappointing uh, to hear. Yeah, it's kind of sad. I mean, I'm not, not really like in the Final Fantasy universe, but I know it's like a really big uh, franchise and it has a lot of fans. So yeah, if they actually make like a remaster, it's kind of like this reforged thing that we talked about earlier, right? It's like, you know, you're waiting and for, for that thing to come out and then it's actually worse than before kind of is like yeah like why did they even put in the effort like what's the point right it's like, it's money yeah like i mean i have a whole thing about like media in general revisiting it like two of my favorite movies are uh like robocop and total recall and like dear god you know just looking at these old ips these companies that still own them look at how they just get rehashed you know 20 years later over and over again for nostalgia bait and just like no respect for the source material it's we see it over and over again in in all different mediums and uh i don't know i just i really believe in kind of like maybe you can do like a director's cut thing maybe but sometimes that's even bad usually something was a masterpiece for a reason and you like can't improve it right uh it's just it's there it you can cherish it for what it was but just trying to revisit that and try to remake it and do something is generally just going to make it worse and, and take making, away from the uh, magic. You're making me think of the Halo TV show there, brother. Oh, oh, oh. Cheeks. I mean, I grew up with all the all the uh, straight to DVD or straight to VHS uh, remakes like we had. We had Tomb Raider. We have Doom. Have you ever seen Doom with the Rock? Oh, man, it's got first person shooter perspective. I Holy actually cow, like that one, bro. You liked uh, Doom? Oh I'm my god! Like, I know, I know. I know. That one was such a mindless. I'm like, fuck yeah, Doom. Let's go, Chainsaw. <laughs> I was, I was hoping the whole movie was gonna be in that first person mode where it's just he just gunning down. But you know, uh, I took what. Yeah, I, I mean, granted, Doom's not like a you know a, a story driven yeah. masterpiece or anything, but. <laughs> yeah, it's just like it's one of those things we're trying to adapt something. Yeah, or like how about the last airbender, the movie by M. Night Shy Shyamalan, right? No, yeah, no, that doesn't exist. Yeah, no, yeah, no, we're not talking about that one. <laughs> Don't talk about that like, one. Talk, talk about abusing the source material, or how about Witcher yeah. season two and three? I mean, we can we can just keep rattling them off, right? 
at, at a certain point, it's uh, yeah. If you don't respect the source material, you're just gonna get trash. Yeah, I mean, you're always gonna have like this this fan base that are gonna disappoint so much, right? If you like go too far and like straight too far, basically. And yeah, if if the game is not what what people remember what it used to be, like if they add new mechanics and those mechanics don't hit well, then yeah, that's that's it, right? So when I, yeah, when I think about um like a redo, and people always say there's there's different names for it. There's remaster and there's reimagined and re everything. Okay, what, whatever the fuck you want to call it, doesn't matter to me. The one that I think um, set the bar pretty high, which had a lot at stake, but delivered beautifully was vicarious visions uh version of diablo 2 thought diablo 2 resurrected what it felt mm. like diablo 2 it was just a beautiful version of diablo 2 and they they went through they went back they flew to the old blizzard hq they opened up the old cabinet files they flipped through not just the art you know in the game but they read the files of okay what did the developers what are the little charms that they wanted to put dangling from this doorway here was the concept art here's how it actually looks in diablo 2 but you know the graphics there were so bad what if i could make this actual charm you know dangle from this doorway and they had all these different um videos going through the different areas of the town of here's what here was their vision here's what they came out with so we tried to make what they um were going for i thought the game is beautiful um i was very ready to hate it because i love diablo 2 so much but i i thought it was be amazing and then the changes that they did make for example, like the weird like casting systems in Diablo 2 where you have to like press a skill and then it binds it to your mouse and then you have to right click it where they just made like the quick casts. I was totally fine with that. I thought it made it that was a, an appropriate way to modernize the game um, while preserving kind of the magic of it. So I wish yeah, they would do that for that's Final That's a really Fantasy. good example. Yeah. D2R is almost like a, a historical preservation. Where it's like you can play the best version, you know. It's just it's just a, a polished version of D two. It's like the finding the continuing down the vision of the original developers and really respecting that material. Callie, um, Callie, it's come just here. so rare. Callie, come here. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Like D two R from like all the remakes I've ever seen is probably the well the best the best made one probably. So they did they did a good job there, especially after the Warcraft three debacle. Um, that was like not even much before that, right? It was like not even a year, I think. And uh, I think people were uh, very pessimistic about what would happen to D2, but it turned out really well. So that was like a, you know, like the worst thing ever and then the best thing ever, kind of. <laughs> Turns out the best thing Blizzard can do is outsource their work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, didn't shit. They, didn't they envelop Vicarious Visions into Blizzard? I think they did. I think they did, but it, it sounds they, like they were uh, protected enough. Yeah, but a good point as I've talked also brings us to the last topic, which is um, what can the developers learn from each other? So that's like a question I wanted to pose and just like, you know, have an open discussion about it, um, especially talking about PoE and Last Epoch and, and D4, which were our big topics here today. So um, maybe it's like some things where, you know, like, okay, this thing GG does really well and this thing D4 does really well. And, you know, how would we like to see like maybe a bit more of like, okay, why don't they take this and, and that and just make the game a bit better in, in some, some sense, basically? So where would you guys see maybe some opportunities here? I think everybody Hi. should copy Diablo Immortal. Just a straight copy <laughs> everywhere. And that's, that's the answer. If you want to make money. Uh, sure. I, one that I actually have is the way that Last Epoch showed the percentages of the polls. I actually really like that they showed the data behind what the people actually voted on. So then when they made the decision, you knew whether or not the company was going with or against public opinion. I actually quite like that level of transparency. So I would love to see the data behind when they actually reach out and ask for feedback and then show that feedback to everyone so we can know what the public's going to say. Because it's one thing if I go out there and I make a poll in my chat right now that says D4 bad, yes or no. I already know what's going to be. Like everyone's going to say it. Everyone's independent polls and everyone's independent opinions, depending upon which creator you have, is going to be influenced by the community that they cultivate. We all know that. So I like it when the company comes out, gets the information, and then puts it out for everyone to see. I think that should be standard for sure. That's a good point. 
I think one of the biggest underlying things that make a game fun for me nowadays is customizing my experience. And so the way that some of these companies have been doing that is when I play Path of Exile and I reach the end game, I'm just running regular maps. I'm just trying to get some Atlas passive points. I'm just trying to get like any yellow item with movement speed and life on it so, so I can play the game. And then in the end, you're just juicing these things to the maximum, trying to hunt for the for the greatest items ever. And with the last season mechanic, when you get strong enough, you can inject that in there for even even more rewards. But the whole time, it was up to me how I played the game, so many choices in the Atlas Passive Tree of how I make my money. To me, that makes the game very fun. Last Epoch, they do that with the loot filter. They give me such a... Again, maybe the UI is bad, and some of the functionality of the loot filter needs to be completely different. But that actually completely changes my experience than if you hadn't given me that functionality. I need to be able to see the items that I care about and maybe at different stages of the game. And when I can choose what actually drops down and makes me feel excited, that makes the game a lot more fun for me. In these ARPGs, when you make a linear path that I have to go down with nothing in the game for me to alter the way that I experience the game, to me it's not an ARPG, it's like an RPG. It's like a role-playing game where I'm just going through the story that you have given me. So the more ways that you can give me to customize either literally the gameplay itself by editing the maps or by the way that I engage with things in the maps is going to be a win for me. So that this probably poses another question then, especially to the point you just made. Like when you compare, for example, the early game and like the progression of a character, let's say to max level, in like D4, where you have like this open world, it can it can go to domain tunnels, it can go to do whispers. Uh, soon it can do hell tides, even from level one. And then you have like you know these different end game systems that kind of like exist in like the higher world tiers. Like how do you compare that to like you know the forced campaign playthrough, and then kind of like you are in maps, and it's like the one thing to do, but you can customize the maps. So how how is how is that? I mean that that that's good. That's a actually a Beautiful question. Um, for me personally, I've never had a strong opinion on this while a lot of people from different communities do. I think this is uh, person to person. Some people just despise the idea of a forced campaign and they love that in Diablo 4, you can choose how you level up, especially if they would actually balance it, which they've done a better job of doing that. Before we used to reset strongholds, which certainly was never the intention. Um, I, I would guess that most people would like the option to not have to do the campaign. I think that's how most people would vote. For me personally, I don't, it doesn't really, it's never been a big point of contention for me one way or the other. One thing that I like about the campaign, about going through it that way, is you build some kind of mastery to it. You can learn every kind of trick in the book to accelerate your process. Maybe you make twink gear and you just you just detonate it. There is something beautiful about that. But there is also, a, again, another point to be made for leveling up however you want. It's hard for me to make a choice here. I don't know if you guys have other stronger, strong opinions about that, but I really never have. I'm pretty pro-campaign, actually. Uh, I, I, Chris Wilson uh, put it very like perfectly to me with, there's like no real reason. All people want is to have more fun leveling up their character. And their goal should be to just put more effort into like, if you have multiple options, people are just going to go to the thing that they find more fun. And so, and, and then they get stuck with something that is just kind of vestigial and just kind of sitting there. Maybe your first character, you have to go through, through the campaign and then you hate that. And they're like, all right, I can't wait till I love my second character. I can skip the campaign. And then you just have this one alternate path that you're always going to do on any subsequent character where instead you can just focus on trying to, and I don't, this is not really a thing that anyone's really doing right now, but this is what Chris said that they should do is just try to make the campaign more fun. Find a way to make it a, an interesting and engaging thing to do multiple times. And I mean, for me, I find it, I find it enjoyable. Like I, I actually really enjoy the, the contrast 
of all right i went through i have this character level 100 character blasting whatever and now i'm starting from scratch i get to go through that whole experience maybe i twink it maybe i don't and i get this level of mastery i can time it i can see you know i can do it deathless i can uh you know get memorize memorize certain locations and pass and, and get better at it and eventually right it at the end of the day like you can get it to a time like th they would be incentivized to make the time very very similar anyway so like if you could just do endless delve to level to, to 70 versus doing the campaign they would be incentivized as a developer regardless to still make it take five to ten hours and i get i as someone who's done endless delve races a few times i think most people would probably get sick of that <laughs> you get sick of that too and they're like okay well you gave me the campaign and endless delve where's endless breach all right, well, now I'm stuck at Endless Breach. How about Endless Blight? And it's, it becomes this cascading issue where really you could invest resources into just streamlining, streamlining the campaign, making it fun, engaging, you know, just maybe juice up the loot a, a little bit as you do it. You get a little bit more of those fun uh, experiences of, of upgrading your character. And that's actually something that they did this league, crazy enough. And the Necropolis uh, announcement, they said there will be hidden encounters in the campaign now and they showed off you can get like double corrupt temples during the campaign or you can get like accosted by a group of brutuses in like act seven and you know maybe they'll drop like guaranteed uniques or something and i think adding things like that to make it kind of engaging and unique for just like one focus path is generally going to be a better use of resources as a company than trying to maintain like three different things that everyone's equally bored of at the end of the day I think you put it really well, and I'm actually very excited to see the new campaign like on, on Friday when the league launches. And like, okay, like generally I'm kind of a campaign enjoyer. Like I don't really mind doing a campaign, and uh, I'm actually somewhat of a renowned enjoyer in Diablo 4 as well, on popular opinion. But I actually kind of like doing that. It's kind of like a one-time thing per season. But yeah, that is gone now. And yeah, I, I do appreciate that I can just like start a character and do a bunch of different things. But I also like that you have this kind of like you know, like kind of streamlined progression. Okay, you go for the campaign and kind of like how you said it, like, you know, you you have some, this, this sense of familiarity and this kind of sense of progression. And, you know, okay, now it's this boss, now it's this boss. And every time it's going to feel a bit different depending on the build, depending on the drops that you had. And I kind of like that, to be honest. And if they actually spice it up with some cool little, you know, text here and there, and there's like, you know, this encounter and you know, like suddenly there's like, they show like this omen and you get like solely there for five minutes, uh, you know, that that's going to be like this kind of like memorable, fun part of the campaign where you had this buff and then maybe there's later on you're going to get like some cool choice of a unique and, you know, can use that to like speed it up. That'll be kind of fun. So I'm really excited to see what they did there and maybe they're going to do more like that in the future. And this could also be like kind of like a model for PoE2, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think to play devil's advocate here, I'm not saying that I agree with this, but in having conversations about this over the years, people will say things like, well, I go through the campaign and I get to the end game system, all the beautiful systems that Path of Exile has. And we as content creators, we we like to game probably a lot more hours than most people do. And we we also can because it's our job. But the thought for a lot of casual people of if I want to make an alt, I have to go through another 10 plus hour campaign just so I can get to maps is just devastating to them. And another thing that is difficult for me to solve as a question about um, leveling a, a, up again through the campaign or multiple different things is at the end of the day, what I want to do is the progression system of a game usually has all the best stuff in the end game. So usually whenever I make a second character, my only thought without any, any concern for fun is how do I get to the end game as fast as possible just to get the really good stuff? So it seems like one way that Path of Exile is trying to solve that very, very difficult question to answer is by putting some very valuable things and some surprises in the campaign which is exciting and it will it will bring back some people and that that is working toward a solution but that overarching problem of what is better than just rocketing to the end game on your second and third characters just to farm the juiciest content and everything else is just sitting in your way i think that that you know makes it very difficult for a campaign to be very very enticing for people um like one like 
It's not like Diablo 4 does leveling very well, but at least one option in Diablo 4 is when I'm out of gold, while I'm leveling up, I can go do a Tree of Whispers, and then I'm going to have gold for the end game. Um, just to play devil's advocate of some some arguments that some people may make. I think that's totally fair. Um, and I think that's what I, I hope that they're trying to do with the the new stuff that they're adding in the campaign that might accelerate you getting to that end game and maybe be usable within the end game as well. Like if you could get a double corrupted helmet that has power charge and life or something on the implicits, that could actually be just a nice valuable item in a moment of joy that can happen. In the, I think that's the big thing is right now the campaign, there's no moments of joy. It's like very <laughs> streamlined and you're just, okay, I know I can do this in five hours. I've practiced it. I got my, you know, I got my POB on the other monitor. I following the skill points perfectly and you know, I'm just going to do it. And then, okay. And then I have my plan for unlocking the Atlas and then I'm going to start to blast. And you, you just have this set five to 10 hour period where you know it is a chore. There is nothing fun, objectively like fun and unique or interesting that's going to happen. I'm just going to get through that chore. And yeah, if something could happen, like a cool double corruption or a, you know, a semi-guaranteed, like a, any unique could drop and you could be bad, could be good, a chance for something fun and interesting to happen. Um, that will, I think that could make a very big difference. For me, yeah. it kind of depends upon... Uh the execution and focus of a campaign like the more that these campaigns have fetch quests escort quests like annoying things to do the less i want to do them is what i find myself like i'm sitting here thinking about it. i'm hearing these arguments i'm thinking you know there's some really good points on both sides but then i ask myself do i want to do that camel quest again in diablo 4 do i want to follow the snake through oh, the forest again and i find myself telling myself no i actually don't want to do that but whereas in, I'm thinking about POE 2, and we got to finish the campaign now and see what we think, but I'm thinking, okay, the bosses are enjoyable. So I could see myself enjoying replayability in the campaign. I think it depends upon the game's execution of the campaign itself and whether or not I find the campaign as enjoyable in a replayable fashion. Because to Rax's point, by the time I get onto alts in whatever given league or something like that, the willingness of me to run a campaign over and over again starts to diminish with the more characters I create. Uh, so as long as there isn't too many 100% like, you know, optional, but not really like escort quests and shit like that, I don't mind a campaign as much as long as it's killing some bosses, blasting through, and I don't feel horribly handicapped by doing it. Yeah, it's fair points for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think like making it replayable and like fun every time you do it is very important. And I think this is probably like one of those big things that really holds people back from enjoying it sometimes. Like even like the thought of like leveling one more character for the new league, like the first league starter already like puts people off so much, I feel sometimes. And I feel like, you know, doing like one or two campaign playthroughs in like, you know, three months or something is not a big deal. But I also understand I'm not like everyone. So... But yeah, is there like any other points that we, we could talk about in terms of like, okay, like, you know, what does this game do really well that maybe the other game developers should maybe like take a bit of notes from, for example? Do you like want to know? Of the campaign stuff? So one thing that we usually don't do is we don't say like negative things about Path of Exile, right? Path of Exile is usually winning in most categories and it's... Oh, probably... I'll hit you with negatives. Oh yeah, let's go. Yeah, well, I... <laughs> I got one that even grinding gear games hates, and I, I think this is, I would call it a requirement. I call it a, re a requirement going forward for ARPGs. The success of your character cannot be dependent upon a bunch of third-party tools. Like, when I'm playing Tornado, Tornado Shot, I, I can't even tell you how many different programs and discords and this or that like okay if we need if we have our build guide okay i even have to go out to adjust my loot filter um this is probably one of the things that i find most demoralizing about path of exile and if i find it demoralizing i am much more willing to do it to get the optimal answer than the average gamer the average gamer is not going to do jack shit about tabbing out to have all these resources open just so you can play the video game in front of you correctly. I think this is something, I think this is a requirement that must be abolished going forward in ARPG design where 
for example, last Epoch has the in-game guide in the game. Um, they put the trading thing in the game. They put the loot filter in the game. Um, that's something that I think I, I would love to see it just completely go away. Yeah, I don't think anyone loves yeah all the third party tools. It's uh, POB is um, so there a lot of them we can solve. So filter blade hundred uh, percent. That's just like crazy. That like to know what item th like think of, think of what this does to know whether the item that dropped on the ground is worth picking up. You have to go to a third party tool, possibly spend hours. I spend hours every league customizing the colors and the sound effects and everything just to tell me whether I should stop and pick up this item. And if I, God forbid, I ever press alt because there will be so many items that dropped on the ground, the game will crash. The loot filter <laughs> is literally mandatory to play the game. And anything that ships with the game, like that comes with a default loot filter, guarantees the game doesn't crash, but it does nothing more. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, and then the other, I think the other one that would be easily replaceable for them would be Awaken PoE Trade. That That's the one where like, Okay, you guys own the trade website. You you guys you have that. Like that that is hosted on your own website. That whole interface of, hey, let me price check this item. Let me check off what things I want to price check against. And then hey, whisper these people. I mean, oh, that's already so esoteric. We we shouldn't get into trades like something else. Um, but that whole thing, like the fact that you have to have a second browser, a browser open, and then a third party tool just to tell you what to type into the browser to find the item that you dropped on the ground and to find the price of that, like that's they they own the website that is all stuff that they could integrate and just getting rid of those two third party tools 100%. I think that would go such a long way. Um POB is a whole different beast though and that's that's kind of a consequence of the complexity of the game and I actually don't like that that's a that would be a a a different discussion I think. But yeah, we we could definitely simplify a lot. I'd be interested to see, to your point about price checking, et cetera, with trade, because of the way trade's going to work in PoE2, if they could actually implement something like that fairly easily, considering that we're getting, what, the auction house, et cetera? Oh, trade so track. it already exists? It already exists in the console version of PoE1. Like, they all they have to do is put it in the PC version. Like, the crazy thing, look up the Chinese version of PoE1. It's, it, like, it's got a lot of pay-to-win stuff. It's got, like, some awful stuff. But the Chinese version has crazy things all sorts of crazy things and interfaces and everything and the console version has like actually a pretty clean trade interface already they they are 100 percent capable of doing this and implementing it without too much effort like not an insane amount of effort but they're just like well hey it works like apparently they have that we call it the trade guy um one one league uh we we asked for some feature i forget what it was i think it was searching for crucible trees because yeah, your, your weapons yes. Yeah, yeah. And so Chris was like, well, uh, I don't know if that's going to be on league release yet. Let me ask. Let me see if the trade guy is going to have it ready. There's apparently just one guy that works on the entire <laughs> trade website, like the whole foundation of the economy. He's just Atlas holding this website on his back. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, twine and twine and sticks for sure. Yes, yeah, for sure. That there's like a lot of things they, they could learn there yeah, and uh, maybe improve. So yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with all the third party stuff. It's also kind of like made me go more and more like SSF in the in the past. Like I used to trade a lot more and I just kind of came to realize that I don't wanna do that anymore. I don't wanna care about the economy. I don't wanna go and whisper a thousand people for everything. And you know, I kind of like just went and I didn't like directly play SSF necessarily very much, but I kind of like just tried to interact with it as little as possible and that made me enjoy the game a lot more. Um, mostly due to the fact that it's such a, such a hassle. So, <laughs> yeah, I hope that that's going to improve. And I guess same same story for Diablo 4, right? I have barely traded in Diablo 4, and I guess it's like much less necessary, but I guess in the following patches that might become more of a thing, but it's like such a hassle to like try to find an item and then try to invite someone, you have to add them, and like, oh my god, man. Like, yeah, that's Epic definitely has like the by far the best implementation of that, I guess. Return of the real money auction house in Diablo 4 incoming. <laughs> I made some good money off that thing. That was a that was a great couple of weeks. If you <laughs> amazing, yeah. I mean if you if you just think about it in in the most basic fundamental sense without diving it at all, 
Imagine that in order to correctly play a video game, you need to tab out of that video game. Like, like that, even, even if you want to look at it from a bottom line perspective, from a purely financial mm-hmm. perspective, getting people to tab out of your game cannot be good for you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fair, fair point, I guess. Yeah, okay. it's one of those things where, yeah, if you look just if you look historically, they've been very they don't want this stuff in the game. That's the other thing is I, I don't I, I anticipate now that Mark is the game director of POE one instead of Chris, that we may start to see some of these more change, these bigger changes happening. Like we already see all this quality life stuff happening in this league. Um, traditionally, they were like trade. The only way you could trade was go to Lion Eyes Watch and, and talk in global chat and be like, hey, I have, a, I have a 40% res gold rim. Does anyone have 10 chaos? And that was the only way to trade. And then people were like, this sucks. And GGG was like, all right, well, we'll let you put item, list them on the forums. And so like the only way to trade was like, all right, I'm going to send the person a DM on the forums. And then maybe on the third blood moon next month, he'll come back and uh, we can log on at 6 p.m. and meet each other in Lion Eyes Watch. And it's just been the the balls kind of been rolling from that, where you know the, what the vision is and what they want is like really close to like early Diablo two trading, you know pre pre uh, Stones of Jordan even, and people are like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a thousand gold on the ground right here. You're gonna drop the plus one skill charm over there, and we're gonna walk. You know, gonna do like a high noon, and we're gonna walk past each other, <laughs> and we're gonna we're just gonna pick up our items on the other side, right? And you and make that's sure- like kind of the vision. And you make sure you're going outside because then you can teleport back inside and get both items. <laughs> Not that I've yep, ever done yep, that. That guy anything. with the Enigma chest. Yep, that Enigma. Oh, god damn, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, but, but, but that raises a philosophical question, though. So, this is going to be deep, so l- let's think about this. If Path of Exile does not implement trade in the game, but people trade in Path of Exile, via third party apps is trade in path of exile it's like schrodinger's trade what <laughs> it, it is it in the game or isn't it in the game well if i can right click on somebody and click trade it's probably in the game that, that that's that's exactly what i was going to say if you don't want trade in the game get rid of the trade button yeah why is there a trade button if you want to get rid of it there is trade in the game right because you can go on third party and trade. So, I mean, we've reached an inflection point here. Take away the trade button or help us, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm pro quality of life for sure. That it's uh, the fact that like, Awaken PUG, I still, every league, I get dozens of people being like, what's that thing that you use in a price check? And I'm like, how the hell are you playing the game? You don't have Awaken PUG trade? What the hell? Yeah, the it, game's it like unplayable like, without it. Yeah. Every time I price check something, I get exactly that. Like, it, it, like even me, like you know, when I casually stream like some PoE here and there or something, that's like, I hey, man, what is that? Like, I've been playing PoE for so long, I, I haven't seen this, and like, whoa, <laughs> like, yeah, it's kind of crazy to think about, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I totally agree. I think that GG has earned a lot of like, um, like you know, pluses, I guess, from this league and from like, the past few leagues where they just implemented some more like quality of life stuff. Like all this, like you know, shift, control, click, a stack of currency, and you know, like these kind of things. I think they just make the game better with no downside whatsoever, right? Like, you know, this is how the game works. People do trade, and you know, it just sucks that you have to click on, and, like you know, your chaos like two hundred times to fill up your inventory and then put it all in the trade window, and yeah, just these little things, but they have such an impact, right? And it's kind of crazy to think that. The game has worked for a decade in a certain way, and now they're finally changing it. <laughs> like these, these little things that actually have such a huge impact. Like it's it's kind of wild. Well, also like these other changes they made over time. Like you know, for example, dropping like stacks of small currency instead of just individual like ten scrolls and ten transmutes everywhere. And like these little things, right? But they're so important, I feel, and they don't take anything away from the game. They can only make it better. So yeah, kind of crazy how how long it took for some of them. And I guess how many more opportunities there are still in, in PoE, right? <laughs> to, to implement the stuff like that. It's really interesting. Yeah, old school sensibilities kind of carrying things through all this and that, that push and pull and like the, 
the way that it works like so when you guys were talking about last epoch and like i have the i'll have the very opposite take here it's not a very strongly held take just uh the hold on but the whole like <laughs> pulling the community and listening to them fuck it no like i actually don't do that um i actually firmly believe in now as a large corporation whatever sure you know do the thing for them but as like for me if I want to make a game, I want to make my game and, you know, I'll listen to your criticism, but maybe I, maybe I take it, maybe I don't. And like, I, the, I shouldn't care beyond whether I think it makes my game better, not whether you think it makes my game better. And the, it's like, I, I, at the end of the day, like, I think it's, I view it more as like, I'm making a movie or I'm making a book or something like that. I'm not making it for you. I'm making it to satisfy my creativity. And I want to make something that I'm proud of. I want to make it the best that I can. I definitely want to have like editors and pre-readers and people playing it and like get ideas. Like you, you can only make things better through collaboration, but there is there should be a hard line where the actual creative vision should hold steady. And like that, that is actually a thing I respect a lot about GGG. Is we're like, yeah, you all are going to hate this. We don't care. Uh, this this is our vision for what we think is an awesome game, and we're going to make this as as our game. And I. It doesn't matter who the developer is, like as, as long as it's a strongly held creative vision that is someone's, you know, that is their passion project. That's what they want to make. I will respect that even if I hate the product in the end way more than some corporate committee designed um, just, you know, corporate product that's just there to make money. So, yeah, I, yeah, I just don't really care what the users think um, Look, beyond, get... you know, ideas. Okay. Can I, can I ask you a question on that? Subtract them real quick. Yeah. Okay, so do you think that last e what last epoch did is maybe maybe does not interfere with what you said? So you said gaming company has their vision, they make it for themselves. What I what I envisioned that this poll that last epoch did was is they told the community what they were going to do. We are going to fix the bugs in our game and we are going to fix the overpowered builds whether it's by a bug or not. That is going to happen. The only thing that they let the community choose is the cadence in which how it happens. They only asked. Oh yeah, that's are you totally fine. Yeah, you're good with that. Okay, because that I'm totally good with that. Yeah, I just there's is is Blizzard the, who's the most guilty of doing this? There there have just been examples of games in the past. I don't have an example in my head right now, but I know there are times in the past where just the community uproar and people complaining, and then the company kind of uh, or the designers kind of just following what they did, making the game worse. And like the actual vision for, and like the soul of the game kind of got lost over time. Um, kind of just making this corporate product in the, at the end of the day. And it's just, I, I just don't want to see that happen. But yeah, I, I mean, so just saying, hey, should we, yeah. I can see what you're saying about products that are like unique new products. And I'm sure that if you were meaning like, Halo, for instance, <laughs> you know, you have to respect the original IP. So it's, it's, the take is a good one. I think when you're making something that is like a unique, fresh vision, and then maybe when it comes to like stuff that's based upon other things, this is why we see the community like get more angry when, you know, oh, but my nostalgia, like um, you're influencing something that, you know, like D4 is compared to D2, right? Would you say that in scenarios like that one, would you listen more to community feedback when it's based upon something that's not an original concept, but is a follow-up on something previous? Because I think this is an interesting train of thought. Yeah, so, I mean, I would, I would just step all the way back and say, if the thing sucks, then you're probably incompetent and probably shouldn't be in charge of the product project. <laughs> Yeah. Right, like how, how many people, how, many, how much community feedback do they need for D2 Resurrected? Pro like I don't think they were just running polls and asking the community like, oh, what exactly do you want? Maybe they did. I could be wrong. The only thing that but they... I feel like, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Well, I was going to tell you the only thing that I can remember from Diablo Two Resurrected that they asked the community is they asked they asked questions where they were considering deviating from the original game. Let me give you an example. One thing that the Diablo Two community begged for them to change from the original one is when you open the cow level, if you kill the cow king, you can't open the cow level anymore. And people love to kill cows all day. And so Vicarious Vision asks, we can remove 
that if you kill the cow king, you can kill the cows as much as you want. Do you want us to? And like 90% of people said, for the love of God, let us keep cowing. Because you'd brick your entire character. You can't mm-hmm. do cows anymore. But I don't think they, they did it. You're right. They didn't do any polls about fundamental changes to the game unless they were deviating from the original title. Yeah, yeah. I think like using like this polling in like, you know, very like in imprecise topics and like, you know, very, very like, you know, something that maybe the developers themselves are unsure about. Like it doesn't really take away from the vision of the game when they make a poll in last epoch and say, hey, we're planning to nerf the stuff. Like, is this like what we should be doing or not? Like, you know, this is a kind of like a unique new situation, I guess they find themselves in. Like they have these overpower builds, people are complaining that, you know, only those two builds are the, the thing to play and everything else is kind of left in the dust. And yeah, they didn't foresee this. I guess they were never, never in that situation. They probably also didn't really, you know, have like a, an emergency plan for that necessarily, right? And then I think it's fine to like ask the community, like, what do you guys think? Yeah, but, you know, yeah. Obviously, like for, for like the PoE standpoint, like, okay, you know, PoE, like we talked about GG taking risks and making crazy new league mechanics. And, you know, sometimes it's hit, sometimes it's miss. And uh, this is just how they develop the game. And I guess if if they would go out of their way to like ask the community, okay, what kind of stuff would you like to see? And everyone says, we want more Legion and Breach because that was awesome or something. Then you get, get a lot more mechanics that are just kind of like bland, okay, mow down a bunch of enemies that spawn out of something. And that's kind of it. And instead of, you know, stuff like Blight or stuff like Necropolis or stuff like, um, I don't know, what like Expedition or something, right? And... Um, yeah, they would probably never see these things if they like take like care too much about what the people think. Because maybe also like the, the game developers have like a lot more crazy ideas that they could implement, and they also know what the possibilities are compared to just some some PoE enjoyer, right? Yeah, I just, I have very um a lot of my background is in fighting games and old school RTS games, and there was there's just something very special about a certain vision of, of a game kind of being released and, and being um, and not being constantly polished down and everything changing. Like, I, I think Overwatch is actually a pretty good example. Uh, but if we start with, like, look at Brood War, right? If we're just going to talk about Blizzard games. Brood War is so cool in that it's been out, like, so there was, a, I think, I forget the exact, uh, Day 9 has a really good video on it. I forget the exact everything that was talked about, but it's basically, I think it was like PV, I think, no, ZVT maybe? It was basically ZVT was impossible for Zerg for like 10 years. And, uh, you know, this was a thing where if it was a live service game, they'd be like, oh, ZVT is trash. We're going to, um, Mutas get plus one damage. Maybe, you know, maybe Marines get minus one damage. And they're just going to keep polishing it until the way that people are playing it, you know, this getting a 50% win rate. But what happened was like one day or like one guy, like one Zerg player just studied, like he went really hard. He just, he went in the lab and he figured out that you could do like a bounding box. You could do a bounding box and like M click all of your mutas. And instead of them grouping up as so like AOE damage would kill them, they would keep formation and then they would stay spread out. So the AOE damage from the anti-air wouldn't kill the mutas. And then it totally shifted the matchup. It was literally a like 10 years later, someone got good and it changed the entire conception of the way that it worked. Um, and then on the flip side, you look at Overwatch, <laughs> where Overwatch, uh, you know, it, it has some broken stuff, I think, in season one, maybe season two. Season three had this real, really beautiful balance. I think it was three or four, had this really beautiful setup of balance with a lot of like decent rock, paper, scissors, but it wasn't like hard, hard counters. You could outplay people. It was really, really fun. It was like the heyday of Overwatch. And then because it was a live service game, and they were like, they had they had this constant community outrage about certain things that are quote unquote balanced. The game got polished and and narrowed down into this like amorphous blob of a game for years and years, where like goats was the meta forever. Everyone hated it. Like there were no DPS people playing, and the game really stagnated because it just it had this like the the creative vision was lost after a certain point. And I'm always gonna push a, you know, I'm always gonna push up against like that being lost just for the sake of a couple people kind of being unhappy. Yeah, you know, I'd rather see people take risks and be like, yeah, this thing has, you know, you get a power fantasy, you get to have fun, and you know, we always go back to the, uh, you know, the openness. 
Yeah, so I I I agree with like a, a point that you made a little bit earlier where I again just kind of zooming out at the entire topic. I think if a gaming company doesn't have a clear vision for what they want to do with their game, I think it's going to destruct on its own. Um, you mentioned, you know, you were really surprised that, you know, Diablo 4 went through the turbulent times that it had and it still survived. I, I agree with that take, and it looks like now they're starting to get an idea of the direction that they want to take it forward. But I think this is the number one reason why Diablo 4 has had so much trouble. Um, and to your point, I think there is certainly a there are certainly things that you can take inspiration from and ask the community to influence your game. And there's certain areas where you should, you should do it yourself. Um, I think it's on a case by case basis. And uh, yeah, I mean, the companies that you, know, one of the risks that you run for a path of exile who, and I don't know, I don't know how they operate things. They don't invite me to test it and they shouldn't invite me to test it. Cause I don't know jack shit about the game right now. At least POE one. But you sometimes you miss critical things like you know the video that Karn made. So for me personally, it, there's no like right or wrong answer. And to your point, if they don't have a clear vision, I think the game's gonna die anyway. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm with you. I think uh, community contact is good. Communicating with them you know learning learning from them figuring out where you messed up like you know the left mouse button thing that they did recently and you know like the call to arms miss that was for huge misses and i you know just to give continue to give them credit you know mark was on was you know interviewed just a couple days ago and he was like yeah we messed up and we're going to keep working on it and we're going to try to that was a thing that we missed we took your feedback and we didn't realize the consequences were that bad and yeah there are things you know developers are not perfect but you know, to to my point, he also said, at the end of the day, we still believe in the reason why we did this, and that we're keeping our like the core change, but we're gonna try to address the fix to what got lost there, and still make it so in the end it will be a better better for the game in the long run to just rip this bandaid off. But then we're gonna try to we're gonna try to make up for some of the wounds that we inflicted as well. Yeah, for sure. Like, it's, it's definitely good to see that you know the developers can also like agree that that something was maybe a miss and a mistake, and then you know come back from that maybe the next patch or something. And I think it also just makes them get accepted a lot more of their decisions, and you know makes the community also just like feel more positive about you know maybe stuff they will try to do in the future to you know solve problems or come up with like cool innovative leagues or something, right? And it kind of gives you like a positive feel about the future when they say, okay, like this, this didn't work out. We're going to try something else next patch or something. So I think that's that's very, very good attitude to have for the developers as well. Instead of just saying, okay, we're going to stick to this no matter what. And, you know, we don't care. So if, if, like, if it's like clearly such a downside to the game and everyone really hates that change, then vision or not, I guess you should definitely reevaluate and maybe provide another solution at some point. Okay, uh, do you have any other like last points to make here about you know the, the general like you know ARPG space or like the development or something? Because otherwise, I would wrap it up here. Uh, we had actually a very long discussion. <laughs> it was, like, yeah, it was hours. Real, yeah, real good, good talk. It yes. was a good chat, boys. Thanks yeah, I had, I had a very good time. Yes, and um, yeah, thanks for joining. So DM, Rax, and Subtractum. All really big um, ARPG blasters in you know in multiple games, and I mean everyone knows these names, I guess, or <laughs> probably most of them at least. You can also give everyone a shout out here if they have mods in chat. But uh, I appreciate very much for you guys to take the time to join us. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the Necropolis League myself. So I guess everyone here is going to be blasting that, and well, let's see what will happen with, with like the, the other games. The other patch is coming soon. We talked a lot about D4, about the LE, and PoE2 on Horizon. So I think we have good times ahead. And this was kind of like the main reason for me to make this podcast. It's kind of like, you know, this uplifting, uplifting moment right now that I feel is like in a community with like, you know, lots of really good stuff is coming. And it was great to talk about all of it with you. 
So thanks, guys. Yeah, we have it is a good time for ARPGs. Last Epoch launch into PoE New League into the PTR for D4. It's going to be a good month, boys. Appreciate you guys. Keep blasting. Thanks Heck yeah, month. let's do it again. Yeah. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a good one, later. guys. Yeah. Bye. Adios. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. That was quite a podcast. <laughs> what did you uh what did you guys think of it? <laughs> How long was that? <laughs> How long was that conversation? Uh the O penis. One of my friends got hacked on Discord. Everybody, make sure you got 2FA on your Discord. One of my... One of my friends got hacked. Um, let me give a shout out. I'm I'm assuming is this a is this a safe assumption? You guys all know. Um, I'm assuming you guys all know DM and Woody. Do you guys? But maybe you guys don't know Subtractum. So let me uh, and give a shout out to all of them. But let me. Explicitly, let me give a shout out to Subtractum. He, uh, Subtractum is a writer for Maxroll on uh, PoE. He's a very smart guy. He'll also be on PoE too. Shout out Subtractum. So there's that one. I guess I can just shout them all out. Hmm. <clears throat> Asmund Gold is farming me for content. What do you mean? He's watching one of my videos or something? Or was he watching the podcast? Here's a question. Here's a question. Um, how did you guys feel about the tone of the podcast? Did you feel we were positive? Did you feel we were negative? Did you feel we were neutral? Neutral, balance, fair, positive, neutral. Okay, no one's saying negative. Okay. Because the first thing that I keep... The thing I'm self-conscious about right now is... Everyone's saying how negative I am all the time. That's just your face. I have just got a negative face. The last Epoch discussion was negative except for from me. The other th three were neutral and I was negative. Yeah, well... We used to do a lot of podcasts in the past on Danctuary, and we actually got feedback all the time that they hated the episodes where everyone just agrees with everybody on everything. Someone makes a point. I agree. I agree. I agree. 
Next point. I agree. I agree. I agree. Next point. I agree. I agree. People are like, guys, if you're going to have a podcast, discuss something for the love of God. So ever since I heard people say that to me on Danctuary, I'm, I'm paying attention. I'm listening to people's answers. And if I can think of like a counter argument, I bring it up. So we actually talk about something. I disagree. That means he wasn't paying attention before. Uh, I don't think so. I think I was paying attention the whole time. I'm not, I'm not exhausting. I'm not exhausted from talking. I am exhausted from paying attention because I was, When I was in speech and debate in high school, we had a, an absolutely godly teacher. They said, one of the strongest ways that you can improve your communication when you are in a discussion with someone or multiple people is if you are able to quote them throughout the discussion. Subtractum said this, I agree or disagree. Woody had this sentiment, I agree I agree or disagree or whatever. So I'm paying attention and I'm listening to them. And I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember what they said. Subtract him looks like he's 25 years old. How is he 42? That's like impossible. Did that guy find like the fountain of youth or something? How is that even possible? Um, a lot of people subbed in the last four hours. Let me just say thank you to everybody. I appreciate that very, very much. He could be a vampire. Subtract him is doing something right, man. That's for damn sure. Subtract him is subtracting the age process. That's right. Uh, I, I enjoyed that, though. I hope you guys did. Obviously, people called me and Woody Batman and Robin because we played D3 for 20 million years. I can't even explain to you how much I've worked with Woody over the years on in-game, out of the game, in discords or whatever, on Max Roll. So I know Woody very well, but uh, getting to know DM and subtract him this year has been great. What are we playing today? We're playing uh, the I'm probably done with the stream and I'm going to go get a bunch of tacos game. We played uh, last epoch in the morning. I'll probably hang it up here, guys. I'm I'm going to I'm I'm honestly just going to go get tacos. I'm going to go get tacos. I love tacos. I need tacos. Week. Yeah, I could blast all night long easily, but then we're not going to be ready for the POE blast on Friday. Um, but, uh, yeah, tomorrow's Monday, we will play Last Epoch, Tuesday, we will play Last Epoch, and then Wednesday, I think I'm going to go POE. I got to start practicing, because I suck, so I got to start practicing here. Um, who can I ra why don't I raid Woody? Is Woody going to keep playing? I'll raid Woody. I think it he's the only one still on, I think. Thanks for being here, guys. I really appreciate it. Tomorrow we'll do another big blast. Sorry that I wasn't reading the chat there. I was trying to pay attention as much as I could. Before you leave, should you equip a mountain chest with zero P or a good rolled exalted? Um, if you can survive with the mountain chest, I'd go with the mountain chest. It's pretty nice. Woody rated Ben. Cancel. Thank you. Well, shit, why don't I raid Ben, too? Woody raided Ben? We're raiding Ben. Imagine, two raids.
the asthma to react to my video was amazing. Which video was it? The content creators hate, uh, content creators want games to fail. Which one was it? Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll have to, we'll have to see what, what he thought about it. <laughs> uh, have a great night, guys. Say hi to Ben, and I'll see you tomorrow. Ben's the goat of PoE. Appreciate you guys. Thank you.